welcome to the finale of this mini-series on exporting the French Revolution. Today we are going to have a discussion on the grand strategy of the Napoleonic Empire, Napoleon's transformation of the continent, and all the various military engagements, battles, and grand strategies which enabled the creation of the Napoleonic Empire to reach its zenith in 1812. I am very lucky to be joined by Columba. Hello. Hello. Glad to be back. Marcus Fierce Pertinex. Bonjour. Charlemagne. Hello, a pleasure to be on your esteemed stream. Well, thank you very much. And Panama Hat. Good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here as always. Fantastic. So in terms of a structure for this evening, um, I thought we would start off just by looking at um, a couple of things revolving around the myth-making of Napoleon, the creation of a Napoleonic empire versus the uh, Gallican borders or the natural borders of France once the Republic had essentially been preserved after a series of wars in the 1790s. And then I thought it would be fun to talk about some set piece battles. So I have here for this evening, Marengo, Austerlitz, Jena and Oerstedt, um, Ilau and Friedland, and uh, finishing off with uh, Asper and Essling and Wagram, taking us up to the uh, strategic reasons for Napoleon's uh, campaign in 1812. I can already see that uh, someone has cited Borodino um, in the chat. We're not going to get to the 1812 campaign uh, because the the fall of the Napoleonic Empire and the series of undoing the French Revolution is going to be saved for the next episode. But um, this uh, beautiful image here, which I thought was uh, perfect of the uh, uh, strumpy Napoleon compared to his uh, gloriously attired marshals, um, is of course a romantic rendition of Napoleon and his marshals at the Battle of Borodino. So it's slightly after the period we're discussing. Nevertheless, I thought that was the adequate thumbnail in terms of discussing the grand Napoleonic strategy. Now, just to start off with, I want to um, rehash a small segment which I took from a lecture a few days ago on the creation of the Napoleonic state to talk about this transition of the Napoleonic Empire from a French state into a fundamentally European state, or what I called a Carolingian facsimile. And this is taken from the Michael Burroughs article, which I linked to in the, which I linked to in the description. The Napoleonic course, if anyone wants to uh, to interject, please do so. The Napoleonic adventure is one of the most paradoxical ep episodes in the history of modern Europe, and the recent shift in scholarly interest towards the political and social impact of imperial rule has actually deepened the paradox. The Vendée, for example, remained inexplicably, um, inexplicably uh, opposed to Napoleon and the revolution, and indeed France, well into the 19th century. A country, a people so strangely blind and so strangely bewildered, as Mich uh, Michelet famously put it. Indeed, when the thesis of Francois Fouré is remembered that it took France almost a century to come to terms with his own revolution, then the paradox not only deepens but widens, for even the impact of the regime on France itself cannot be taken for granted. Although in his insistence that Napoleon stabilised the revolution for the French, Fouré perhaps missed the heart of the dilemma, his own theory has done much to heighten the one great given of an early historiography, that the Napoleonic Empire was the pure and simple extension of France, a la grande nation shared by conservatives and Marxists alike, is now open to question. Pabon saw the whole regime in terms of paradox and pointed directly to it. When he said Napoleon's claims to the crowns of both Caesar and Charlemagne were incompatible, it must now be asked which territories were best assimilated into the Napoleonic Empire and why. Napoleon made much of this Carolingian analogy, yet when he chose to compare himself to Charlemagne directly, it was with accurate, specified reference to political geography. Until me, he told Girard, France still resented Caesar, the supremacy of the Pope, the Empire of Germany, the King of the Romans, and all of them were destroyed by me. Charlemagne gave up the lot. Perhaps the most concrete um, comparison to be made by Napoleon and Charlemagne is in the geography of the empires they ruled. Almost eerily, however, Edward Gibbon's account of the reign and character of Charlemagne in Book 5 uh, of his chapter of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, written only 15 years before the coup of Brumaire, had already in truth left Napoleon, or indeed future commentators, little to invent in the way of Carolingian paradigms. The essential for Gibbon and Charlemagne was very close to the essence of the imperial achievement of Napoleon, himself prized, moving the centre of the empire beyond the France of Caesar. 
Gibbon's vision of the parameters of the Carolingian hegemony offers a remarkably precise insight into the nature of this grand empire, uh, grand empire and the nuances and degrees of control Napoleon exercises within it. To ponder some of Gibbon's more precise observations on the limits of the Carolingian Empire is also to trace the borders in Napoleonic Europe, as both embraced France, Spain, Italy and Germany. Gibbon is telling in the details of imperial power, however. Gaul had been transformed into the, ne into the name and monarchy of France. Charlemagne pursued and confer confined the Bretons, um, the Britons on the shores of the ocean, and that ferocious tribe whose origin and language are so different from the French was chastised by the imposition of tribute, hostages, and peace. After a long evasive conquest, the reunion of Aquitaine to France enlarged um, its present boundaries with the addition of the Netherlands and Spain as far as the Rhine. He instituted the Spanish march, which extended from the Pyrenees to the River Ebro. Barcelona was presided over by a uh, was presided over by a French governor. As king of the Lombards and patrician of Rome, he reigned over the greatest part of Italy, a tract of a thousand miles from the Alps to the borders of Calabria. Charlemagne, who was the first who united Germany under the same scepter, the Alemanni, so formidable to the Romans, were the faithful vassals and confederates of the Franks. If we retrace the outlines of this geographical picture, it will be seen that the empire of the Franks extended between east and west, from the Ebro to the Elbe, all the Vistula, between north and south, from the Duchy of Beneventum to the River Ada. And again, this is the revival of Napoleon's um, impossible domain, that creation of Lotharingia, and all of these territories that had been part of the Carolingian Empire. And as I've detailed in my lectures, I've tried to emphasize that Napoleonic power was in a sense strongest in areas such as Belgium, in southern Germany, where he found willing clients and subordinates in Bavaria, in northern Italy, where Eugene de Beauharnais was placed in power, mm -hmm. and of course, his eventual assimilation of Tuscany and Rome itself into the empire. So what we see is the mass, this is why the series is called the exporting of the French Revolution. Napoleon is constantly growing the state. He's annexing territories left and right. He goes from annexing Belgium to the left bank of the Rhine to the Netherlands, Oldenburg, Piedmont, Tuscany, Rome, Illyria. All of this it sort of creates its own logic in terms of his constant and repeated defeats of his enemies. So, for example, Austria is defeated four times by Napoleon's and four coalition wars and keeps coming back and fighting and ultimately defeats Napoleon as part of a coalition in 1813 and 1814. So here we're going to try and tease out what was Napoleon's ultimate end goal and what did all of his military battles serve in terms of creating this empire? And why did Napoleon want to create this empire? What was the ultimate strategic utility mm. of doing so? It's interesting you're getting sort of um it's a very biographical question isn't it because i think um i read uh oh what's his name it's it's not um who, who bonville bonville wrote histoire de france didn't he and he wrote a biography of napoleon um i was reading a little bit of a little bit of that the other day and he points out this quote from napoleon i think quite early before the uh the coup um, and I think he's actually quoting from Bourrienne, who supposedly was quite uh, on quite intimate terms with Napoleon. And there's this idea of um, Napoleon saying to Bourrienne, I just sort of see how events go. You know, I have no um, sort of grand plan 10, 20 years in the future. I, I, I take events as they come and, um, and you know, do, as, do the best I can. And I think um, that's probably a, quite a sensible way to look at um, Napoleon's overall goals i mean obviously once he's actually in power he begins to develop these um grand economic ideas in terms of the blockade and what have you but i think in terms of his own sort of personal destiny he didn't have any um exact idea of where he was going he was a an opportunist or at least uh that would be my opinion what do you think I think in terms of, I think you're, that, that sort of leads into this idea in terms of Napoleon's star or Napoleon's destiny and whether Napoleon did believe he had a certain destiny or he was essentially a force of nature acting as some sort of vehicle of providence or as, again, the revolution on horseback. The I world spirit, yeah. I, I am a new uh, Gladius Mundi. The fact that, you know, there is also this comparison one can bring between uh, Charles VIII invading uh, Italy in the uh, the 1490s and Napoleon doing so exactly 300 years later. Um, Marcus, is there anything you want to bring up regarding uh, the myth-making of, of Napoleon and Napoleon becoming a legend to such an extent where the people of France actually embrace his um, military dictatorship from 1799 onwards? 
it's worth mentioning uh just in the least small de detail his origin point that you know he's obviously the um the son of uh, the Cor corsican patriots who leave corsica uh when it's the next by france um which, who, who invade corsica the year of napoleon's birth actually and then he's actually raised and educated in france he attends a military academy as a relatively young young man or a boy even um and is raised in that manner where he did find it difficult to um become accustomed to to french society and in fact was something of a misfit you know he, he sort of spoke this um ill-fitting dialect and he was uh, chastised by the french boys who were obviously from well-esteemed families whereas napoleon was not and um there was a resentment of um of france in napoleon as as a young man but obviously the living in the times of leading up to the revolution and the storming of the bastille etc um ultimately transforms his his career and his life and uh and we see this with his early actions um at toulon for instance where the in his first well, can um, i just can i just bring up um, an interesting sure. tidbit on napoleon's past sure. during the 1750s and 60s there was a corsican war of independence first against the genoese and then against the french mm -hmm. And mm. it was led by one uh, Pascali Paoli. And who was the original personal secretary of Pascali Paoli? One Carlo Bonaparte. His father, when, yeah. Yes. When um, the French came over and annexed the island in 1770, uh, Carlo Bonaparte changed his name to Charles Bonaparte and was one of the leading advocates, if not the leading advocate, among the uh, the rough and tumble sort of newly admitted aristocracy of Corsica into the French system. And he became the Corsican representative to the court of Versailles and enrolled uh, Napoleon in the Ecole Militaire. It's interesting, however, that upon the declaration of a republic, Napoleon doesn't stay in Paris. He goes back to Corsica and he's immediately enamored with the ideas of a new Corsican revolution and Corsican independence. And this plan is frustrated because Pascali Paoli is still alive. He comes back, he joins in um, with the revolutionary fervor to lead this independence struggle, but he hasn't forgiven his grudge, um, for, uh, forgiven the grudge he had on Carlo Bonaparte for betraying him and siding with the French. So the first thing that happens is when Napoleon lands in Corsica, um, the, com the property of the Bonaparte is confiscated and Napoleon is exiled. <laughs> so it's interesting to think that had Pascali Paoli had a more forgiving temperament, whether Napoleon's entire life would have been radically altered as a result. Mm. Absolutely. And of course, there's this distinction too between um, Carlo Bonaparte and and his mother, who's actually, um, uh, it, it, his father's sort of religious orientation is, to my understanding, not clear. But his mother's, it's very clear that his mother's very devout and his mother's very, you know, deeply, resoundingly Catholic. And Napoleon has these sort of two influences from his mother and his and his father, who are quite, which are quite juxtaposed to each other. Was he not but, um, actually, um, when he was very young and his father was with um, uh, Pascali, were they not um, actually up in the mountains? I remember reading that, um, that Napoleon as a boy was actually mm. um, taken up in the mountains during the, the sort of fighting. It was sort well, of guerrilla well, affair. Well, Napoleon, well, the fighting was more or less over by the time Napoleon was born. But yes, there was, I believe Napoleon was born in 1769. So it would have been literally as the embers, the final embers towards the resistance mm. of the French occupation mm. were being put out. All, um, yeah, so yes, right. very likely. There's, there's also uh, this issue of him being... Uh, Corsican or somehow kind of foreign uh, is something that seemingly crops up a lot in his own lifetime and afterwards as well. Um, often, often used as a kind of slur by his opponents. I, 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 I seem to remember like it. Um, and there's, you know, they they slander him as this 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 Corsican sort of monster. This sort of like you know, or, or an upstart. Yeah, yeah, this upstart. He was. He isn't really from here. And and uh, I, I believe that there's some uh political weight to how you spell his name isn't there um because there are i i believe that the bonaparte is the um is the kind of uh frankish yes if you put a u in it yeah. if you put a u in it it suddenly becomes italian yeah. in the same yeah. way that uh if you add an e to the yes. end of napoleon it becomes napoleone mm -hmm. Yeah, and I yeah. think a lot of the um a lot of the British um papers and sources spelt it in the Italian manner or the Corsican mm -hmm. manner, did they not? And if you look at the you know if you look at the etymology as well, um 
buona parte, if you break into two words, the first half of it is buona, which means good in Italian. And hence mm. bono as well in Latin, same thing. What's what's the parte? I wonder what the full etymology is. There's probably uh, been all sorts of nebulous conversations I, I, about I, that. I have a feeling it's actually just like part, as in is it in, in English, like part good, but I don't know. I have to double check on that. <laughs> Napoleon probably says, no, no, it, it, it translates as eternal hero or something. Do we, you know, do, we, do we know much about the name Napoleon itself? I believe um, one of the offered etymologies was the Lion of Naples. I remember okay. that. Um, I doubt it. Leon. But, you know, yeah. Hmm. Sorry, it's funny when when you said uh, the line of um, Naples, I could only for some reason think. Do you remember the film um, The Great Dictator with Charlie Chapman? Chapman. Yes, of course. It was a favorite uh, line uh, do, you, do you remember uh, Napoloni? Yes, the <laughs> some... uh, the uh, sort of Italian American Mussolini. <laughs> the Italian American Mussolini Napoleon. Sorry, <laughs> we're gonna have tanks that go up in the air and the planes go under the sea. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It, I, I, that 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 film is uh, from our perspective, I think, fairly paused, but it's still an excellent film um, yeah. just to watch. It, it's very entertaining. So, Marcus, that is the Napoleon we could have possibly had. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, if, it the, weren't, if it weren't for this peculiar eats, uh, destiny of the bop, The bop, boppity yeah. boop Napoleon, great. Eats, <laughs> eats peanuts while, while, whilst, whilst watching the military parades and things like that. <laughs> yes. Nevertheless, um, it seems rather, seems rather fitting that after too long and after his, uh, his crushing of the revolt of the 13th of Fondamary and uh, in 1795, that he is appointed the commander of the army in Italy. And it's here where, again, Napoleon does have an obvious affinity with Italy. And again, he's closer genetically to Italy and his parents are basically Genoese in orientation. And that's where his name comes from. So it seems rather appropriate that Napoleon is, if anything, split between France and Italy and is both emperor of the French and king of, and will ultimately become king of Italy. Um, but this is really where the Napoleonic myth, he goes from essentially being the political protege of one of the directors of the new government, Paul Barras. Uh, Paul Barras was also sleeping with Josephine before he uh, essentially gifted her uh, to the young Bonaparte as part of this uh, new political arrangement. He was essentially the sword behind Barras. And upon arriving in Italy, he is able to take an untenable situation and transform it radically to make Italy not only the principal front in the war, but the decisive front in terms of ending the war of the First Coalition to everyone's amazement. And there's one um, dispatch I want to sort of start us off with in terms of the construction of a legend, which is Napoleon's own description of this. Soldiers, you are naked, unfed. The government owes you much, but has given you nothing. The patience and courage that you have shown among these rocks are admirable, but it brings you no glory, not a glimmer falls upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains of the world. Rich provinces, great cities will be in your power, and there you will find honor, glory, and riches. Soldiers of Italy, do you lack for courage or endurance? Um, Marcus, is there anything you want to talk about in terms of, upon arriving in Italy, how Napoleon is able to transform himself into a hero of the French army? Well, delving into the details could almost be stream unto itself, but what is remarkable is that given that the command of Italy was seen, or, you know, of the army d'Italie was arguably the worst command or the worst mainline command given to a French uh, officer. Um, Especially because... at that point. I mean, they were poorly supplied. They'd been sitting around doing nothing. Mm. Morale was extremely oh. poor. The French Italian army was in a terrible state. I mean, it's even sort of summarized in what Mr. Majesty just uh, quoted. And you can read in whatever source you might read about Napoleon's early campaigns in Italy, the state in which the army is, is, is deplorable, as in to the extent where even men are lacking in shoes. Men are using um, outdated muskets. There's, there aren't enough pack animals. There's actually not even enough pack animals to um, to bring supplies up from whenever, wherever the supplies are stored. They have to be actually brought up to the various units, you know, man for man. They, they don't even have the mules for this purpose. They have no none of the logistic capability with, um, you know, with... with essentially being able to engage in any offensive action into Piedmont, into Liguria, into the north of Italy. And um, another thing they're desperately short on is, is horses and and, uh, and uh, proper mounts for 
any kind of cavalry units that they might wish to marshal, which brings about sort of two parts of this at one. Napoleon has this amazing sort of capability, this amazing knack of, because he's unlike some of the more, shall I say, perhaps aristocratically oriented generals, he's willing to eat the soldiers' biscuits. You know, he's willing to sleep rough on the on the you know the rough blanket with the soldiers he does endear himself to his men which if you sort of look back in history who does this remind you of it reminds you a little bit of say caesar and augustus who um did much the same thing and uh and by doing that the the troops at, at the very beginning tr at least place their trust in him and then due to his well, obviously, his background is is as an artillerist. He's not actually uh, an infantry officer or a cavalry officer who have different kinds of perspective. Napoleon, um, uh, following Toulon and, and the, his uh, conflagration there with the British Navy, he becomes, shall I say, firepower obsessed. And he, sort of throughout his career, you see Napoleon devising of different ways being able to maximise the application of firepower. But it's not only this. Because obviously artillery is a supremely slow moving thing, the other the other quality Napoleon starts to develop is the 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 maximization of movement and speed and rapidity and being able to deploy faster than his opposition, being able to um, out march and outflank his opposition. And uh, there's a I can't, I can't actually remember who said it, but there's a a um, a quote or, or there's a there's a statement from. An opposing, I can't remember if it's Colli or, or, or one of the Piedmontese generals, but someone basically says uh, they sort of imply that Napoleon al almost fights in an unfair fashion. He's not gentlemanly. He doesn't array his troops in neat lines, and <laughs> we engage, you know, in a. Yes, I think I know what you're talking I think, about. Um, yeah. I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think this no, also sure. ties into something important about Napoleon in a strategic sense. Is that I think there's a kind of, um, I want to say it's an unwritten rule, but I think enough people have, have come to, to talk about it at this point, is that even if you're at a massive disadvantage in every other way, if you're able to get the strategic momentum on your side, then you still stand a very good chance of, 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 of being able to do something to your favor. The initiative um, factor, right? Yeah, the, it's the initiative, isn't it? I mean... It's it's something that Napoleon. Um, I also would would perhaps use another example as uh, as uh, Robert E. Lee in the um, American mm. Civil War. This 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 whole this whole idea that um, you know you might be worse off, but if you can get the battlefield moving to your tune, then yeah. you can you can use it to your advantage. It, it's I mean, rather, is, it's, um... it's, it's rather like uh, mm. playing a game of uh, chess, isn't it? If yeah. if you're mm. on the on the attack. You're, you're on the advantage, even if the attack's not going that well. Well, yeah, of course, famously, that was um, that was Lee's sort of big, that was the big departure in Lee's sort of prosecution of the war was that um, the, the the strategy so far was a sort of a totally defensive war, right? But Lee actually took the fight to the north yeah. and extended it far longer than But even, but even before Oscar. that, um, when does sort of Lee sort of come into his own? It's annihilating the army it well, not necessarily annihilating but pushing out the union forces under george mcclellan who had been pursuing a very sort of cautious orientated strategy of simply very cautious and uh surrounding it and all of a sudden lee comes along he simply keeps attacking the union army to the point that they sort of again collapse and retreat and i think you can describe the montanotte campaign which is his first campaign in italy napoleon's as very similar he comes yeah. across the piedmontese and the austrian armies even though he's outnumbered he simply keeps attacking and all of a sudden the piedmontese armies and the austrian armies are separated and the piedmontese after being defeated are forced into a separate peace which allows napoleon to push forward all the way across the po river and uh come to the battle of lodi um marcus is there anything about Lodi in particular, you think, which is significant about uh, Napoleon's myth making? Well, I won't. Um, I won't harp on on Lodi because it's, it's not really that decisive. But I, I guess oh, less, when... less as a battle, more as um, part of the Napoleonic star, so to speak. In, in, indeed, indeed. And the point I was going to the point I will make is that as a as a sort of a an initial marker or or, or as this sort of first phase of the Napoleonic mythos being created. In, well, not just my belief, in the belief of a great many, Lodi is the starting point of, you know, le petit corporal, the little corporal, as his as his soldiers would quite affectionately call him 
um and uh, just for the context of people listening it, it was um i can't it was in the um in the aftermath these sort of series of, of of little battles that Napoleon was winning. Um, they cross a bridge at a at a city or at a town called Lodi, which is in in modern day Lombardy. Oh, no, actually, no, these are Piedmont. I might be on the border. I can't quite. No, remember. it's Lombardy. It's just south. It, 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 Milan. Yeah, it is. It is Lombardy. It is Milan. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the the Austrians as you would normally do when trying to extricate an army which has suffered defeat and is is attempting to lose a pursuing force the austrians deploy a um essentially like a blocking force at at lodi which i do have um i did have some notes on me if you just bear with me for a second yeah so um, roughly the rear guard is is a force of about nine and a half thousand men and 14 uh, artillery pieces on the on the fre- on the um Habsburg side Napoleon by this point he, he's sort of because obviously his his uh, stre- strength is concentrating at Lodi but at the height of the battle there's about fifteen and a half thousand French 2,000 cavalry um the the Austrians are described as having two battalions of Grenz infantry, Grenz being sort of the equivalent of um, like skirmishers or what we'd understand probably as Jaegers, you know, like hunter sharpshooters. Right. And um, yes, riflemen and two squadrons of Ulans. So the, the force put, put up with, by the Austrians was modest, but, and we sort of discussed this bit in the, in the chat before we started is that a river crossing over a bridge is one of the most hazardous and suicidal suicidal and lethal military actions that you can do even in the modern day it is desperately desperately dangerous and um and what actually happens is that at the very initial start of the or the first french to capture the bridge they're of course thrown back or at least the the initial sort of skirmish is 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 stopped by the austrians and and the um and both sides are tied but probably the austrians even more so because they've been sort of like trying to bring the baggage train with them etc and um and then once napoleon arrives on the scene he actually starts directing the uh, he brings up extra artillery guns bring them brings them more or less he, up to he the front. sights them perfectly doesn't he, he yeah he sights them perfectly and they're basically sort of shooting over open sites like they're it's 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 very close range use of artillery to the point where french artillery is almost coming out under sharpshooter fire and he uses them almost a point blank range and he unleashes an, an, an astonishing cannonade on the austrians that demoralizes them causes them to lose cohesion and when the second sort of like the, essentially the main attack occurs the french don't quite make it across but what's um what is really st- astonishing here is that not only napoleon himself but these and these names obviously will crop up a time and again in the battles of napoleon because they sort of many of them or some of them become his marshals but you know andre massena um uh, daleman uh, these other generals, actual who were op- junior officers at the time, actually joined Napoleon in leading these French grenadiers across the bridge, and the French attack doesn't waver. The column makes it across the bridge, and being led to victory by this little corporal who, you know, moments ago was directing artillery over open sites on the on the close side of the bridge, has then led units with his officers across the bridge, routed yeah. the Austrians. And it, it really is this auspicious beginning to to Napoleon's career. It's actually really quite not, an amazing feat. And he's really not afraid to get his hands stuck in it. I mean, I think at one point he actually takes the um you know, the sort of the ramrod and the fuse for one of the uh one of the cannons and starts operating it himself mm. when the um because the um the what's the word? I don't know, the operator, the man on the gun, the artilleryman, uh, gets mm. shot right beside him, you know. Mm. Um I can't remember um, because I could have swore that he also, um, yeah, and, and you have it up here. I mean, he, cro- he crossed the bridge at the Battle of Arcola as well, but didn't he sort of narrowly avoid getting shot at one of these engagements? Like he sort of um, was thrown to the site, um, um, the site of the bridge before uh, a volley went off. I remember reading that, or am I misremembering? Well, no, I think it's important to note that Napoleon was constantly putting himself very close in, in harm's yeah. way. I mean, again, this is he wasn't scared it, of bullets. 
In terms of the deliberate illusions, of course, you can say that this is very similar to Alexander the Great in the terms that he would deliberately lead his char um, the charge of companions um, towards gaps in the Persian line, again and again, personally leading from the front. And it's important to understand that even though these weren't, you know, great strategic masterpieces, I think Rivoli is perhaps his most decisive victory. But of course, um, we remember Arclay, we remember Lodi for his uh, personal acts of bravery, even though the Austrian army was able to successfully retreat after Lodi and continue campaigning. And, and, and Castiglione is also quite an important victory as well. Yes. Um, I just want to bring up this segment I have from the genesis of Napoleonic propaganda. Would it be, um, would it, would it, would it be right if just to say one last thing on the Napoleonic um, sort of leading from the front thing um, just before we go on? That's right. um, if anything, this is probably going to augment and it, ah, augment right, no it, it talks about the deliberate illusions okay. um on occasion napoleon would augment the achievements of his army in his dispatches this is not to say that he falsified his reports to have done so would have jeopardized the effectiveness of his propaganda campaign for propaganda to be effective as the law reminded us it must always be based on some ba um, based on some element of fact napoleon however always seemed to present the facts underlying his reports in the most positive way imaginable such is the case with the introductory paragraph of Bonaparte's dispatches announcing his victory at the Battle of Lodi. I think that the passage of the Po will be the most audacious operation of the campaign, as with the Battle of Milisemo. The action was most lively, but I must give you an account of the Battle of Lodi. What follows in his lengthy letter is a matter-of-fact description of the Austrian General Beaulieu's stubborn defence of the bridge over the Arda, ending with his statement that, although since the opening of the campaign we had been in very hot actions, in which it has been necessary for the army of the Republic to display boldness. None, however, approaches the terrible passage of the Bridge of Lodi. The excitement and variety of such dispatches, according to the historian Ferrero, made it impossible for the Directory to suspect that Montenotte, Devo, um, Dago, Seva, Mondovi, and Sir Chasso were not brilliant victories, and of course these were the um, campaigns against the Piedmontese, and Italy was, um, was already effectively conquered. Rather than risk leaving it to the Directory or to the public to assess the importance of the battle, Napoleon, through his dispatches, consciously helped to create the myth of Bonaparte and the invincibility of his army. According to Ferre, he, Bonaparte, left no one else the task of publicizing him. His dispatches, his proclamations, his correspondence with the Directory all reveal an extraordinary talent for getting himself noticed. At 26, this man possessed military genius combined with taste and initiative understanding of public opinion. Before the end of 1796, the French public was calling Napoleon the immortal Bonaparte, the great man, the new Hannibal, the young Republican hero, and the conqueror of Italy, the invincible, and the fortunate Bonaparte. In addition to comparing him with the heroes of classical past, emphasis on the fortunate Bonaparte, I think I want to bring this up with Marenko. Frequently, Bonaparte was even seen as superior to the heroes of antiquity. The author of the first empire propaganda book, Bonapartiana, for example, stated, that people have compared Bonaparte to Caesar. However, striking this comparison may be at first class glance, it nevertheless suffers from several important exceptions. The vanquisher of Italy has over the conqueror of Gaul an austerity of manners and love of public welfare that characterizes true heroism. Caesar worked for his own aggrandizement. Bonaparte works for the posterity of the French people. <laughs> I, I, was about to, I was about to ask your opinion of this. <laughs> oh, it really doesn't need answered. <laughs> <laughs> it, goal. It, 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 it does offer no, no, it gets, a, a hearty it, chuckle, doesn't it? Oh, that's worse. fantastic. The goal of the former, what was what, what was what was useful for himself, the goal of Bonaparte is what is useful for us all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I was gonna, I was going to bring up Caesar because it is interesting. Caesar is basically doing the exact same thing, but with opposite geography, right? I mean, he's conquering France and sending back reports to Italy, and Napoleon is yeah. doing the opposite. I mean, there's even some um, um, theories. You know, I have, a, I have a great book on Caesar's writings, and it's a very uh, commonly held theory of Caesar's commentaries that they weren't released um, as one, but they were, and, and that's why they're unfinished. They were released episodically you know caesar would complete one book and then send it back to rome and why did he do this well it's to um build up build up his fame build up his his legend and also um in the same way that napoleon wants to um um i guess hold off the directory um caesar is trying to hold off the senators and keep control of the narrative and of course one of the most important ways of doing that is 
going over their heads and making it exciting, right? You have to make it a story that people can buy into. And that's where the exaggeration and the little the little asides and the little romantic moments come in. And I I, I would say it's un it's undoubtable that Napoleon was influenced mm. by Caesar in his in in the strategy of his bulletins. Um and I think uh yeah I think that's something that's very worthwhile uh, noting. Colombo, I think uh, one thing which might be said is that trying to strike a, a middle ground between uh, plausibility and exhilaration of of the success, and uh, and exactly. the public being sort of having their imagination ignited by sort of both aspects of that in both men, strangely yeah. enough. And of course, they're both also building up a a power base independent of the the central mm. government with people yes. they can draw on and soldiers they can trust um so yes it's it's uh, it's absurd to say that they are they're opposites in this regard it's patently absurd they're they're mm. doing the exact same thing so yeah still another author compared the triumphs of bonaparte to those of both hannibal and the romans neither proud hannibal nor the romans themselves cause such a fracas as the indefatigable bonaparte this phrase of Bonaparte's propaganda campaign was working. His celebrity was growing, dispatch by dispatch, day by day. Already one can see the germ of the Napoleonic legend. Even in England, Bonaparte proved to be one of the most popular figures of the day, having captured the imagination of the age. And I think this then sort of ex is extended to the Egyptian campaign. And there are probably several elements of the Egyptian campaign which we can note for in terms of grand strategy. It's one of the few campaigns which Napoleon launches, which is almost entirely directed towards the English, despite being a land campaign, and all of the associated naval campaigns being an utter disaster. Indeed, this land campaign ultimately ended up being a disaster. But with the Battle of the Pyramids and the early battles after the fall of Alexandria, um, I think it's almost essential to understand Egypt in terms of the making of the myth of Napoleon, because of course, the actual sort of tangible results of the Egyptian campaign collapse very soon after he evacuates um, and leaves his army stranded to hold on against the Ottomans and the Mamluks for around three years before all of them end up, end up surrendering. But as um, someone in the chat has already mentioned, again, we're talking about the conscious association with Caesar. Again, the connection between Caesar and Cleopatra and Caesar in Egypt is made tangible. The idea that we are faced with 40 years of history when arriving in Egypt and again, tangibly drawing in all of these <laughs> More than a, figures. F 40 centuries, I think. <laughs> well, yes, that's Napoleon's quotation, but even more than 40 centuries, absolutely. I mean, Egyptology was only so far, but again, that's going to be one of Napoleon's great claims to fame is his commencing of Egyptology as a study um, mm -hmm. because of his uh, membership of the Académie Française and uh, sending over his uh, 135 army of scientists to oh, yes. um, study, Rosetta, study. Rosetta Stone and all that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Also, as you, um, as, as, as you sort of touched on that, um, Napoleon, I think, was probably one of the best educated commanders that we know of in, in history, um, by his own admission as well. Um, not only, I, I, th I think he was fortunate to have the education he did, which continued through the military academy. Um, and I believe there's a quote by him, which is that in order to become a great commander, the first thing to do is just read over and over and over again the campaigns of great men, essentially, you know, Caesar yeah. and Hannibal and... Um, and, then also, and, and, all this kind of thing, you know. and also an assiduous study of uh, mathematics as well, he thought necessary. And I believe well, course, he was on um, top he was of his class. Man. Yeah, Brienne. <laughs> there's, yeah. A, there's a quote, I, I, I want to say this was, I want to say it was Carlyle talking about some military thing, but at the same time, I, I don't know if it was, so I'll have to check, check on this. But essentially the quote is something like, um, in, in, in relation to a Napoleonic army, they were saying that um, infantry uh commanders tend to have this obsession with organization and integrity cavalry commanders tend to be obsessed with the kind of dash and the kind of um flair of of, of of war but the artillerymen are the ones that are obsessed with the hard facts and the logic and the mathematics of a campaign um and i think this certainly bears out in napoleon's um style of waging war and his his kind of single-handed ability to not only be a master of the tactics and the strategy he was employing, but also have a grasp of politics and logistics and all the other things that go into to to maintaining an army and ensuring it can fight effectively um, yeah. in every sense. Which, which is one point I just want to quickly 
uh, buttress Panama here because this it's it's not even so much you know people talk about comparisons to season whether he saw himself in season's legacy whatever one of the most telling factors is actually in the way he fights and, and from a very from a very early standpoint Napoleon emphasizes aggression he emphasizes speed he emphasizes marching divided and fighting concentrated he he makes a point of billeting soldiers where he needs to he besieges you know and, and this is very prominent in the Italian campaign you know, that he he will build not he himself, but he'll have his troops build uh, elaborate and, and and high quality defensive earthworks to you know whether he does it around Mantua, whether he does it around Crema or Alessandria or these other places, and then he summons as much strength as possible to put into the field so that he can still delve defeats. And even though he's outnumbered, he's he's persistently on the offensive. Um, to sort of borrow a term from German, it's actually some in some ways like pre motorization um implementation of Bewegungskrieg, movement war and and, and you look at um you look at the way sort of caesar crisscross gaul and you know cross into into britain and cross into germany and was never passive napoleon certainly in his early career certainly sort of pre austerlitz pre sort of 1805 when he's arguably at his peak as a as a younger man he fights in this way and that for me is the most astute observation of where he has a resemblance to someone like caesar i am um, i i also this is part of the point i was going to make earlier but i think it's much better than made it now is that napoleon i think um on the whole had this rather fortuitous unique position of being almost completely unfettered when he came to power and when he began to command war um if you think about it he's especially at the beginning he's kind of his the only thing he has to worry about is how to win He's, he's not as tied down, I think, as many of the commanders he will face mm. who are coming who are coming with all this kind of um, the the baggage of the empires they they represent. They're coming with the baggage of their superiors, of their monarchs, of political considerations, of the considerations of their allies. And also the, um, the, the other French. And just, the, just, just, just the important point here is that Napoleon, when he then came to power politically, is coming to power off the back of a of an enormously transformative revolution that he is now the master of. And he can, he has this, he has this unique ability among, among others of his time, at least to completely control all the resources and all the power and all the, all the channels of, of, of a powerful nation in exactly how he wants so that, so that he, he can ensure that whatever sort of political choices he makes in Paris will affect the common foot soldier fighting thousands and thousands of miles away in spain or in poland or, or wherever you know he, he 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 can he can have that level of, of control which paired with his with his great ability to to do such things i think i think goes some way to explain his his incredible kind of rise to power and and, and kind of blitz across across the continent can i add two things to that because you brought up two interesting points but i want to sort of go back to your first point which is regarding the carlisle quote about the cavalry man and of course the artillery man and of course military logistics um it's interesting that that quote very very sort of uh, aptly sum <laughs> very aptly summarizes uh nay and uh, Murat, two of the most mm -hmm. famous cavalry men of the Napoleonic era. But there's one figure I want to bring up, because we may not bring him up again, which is Alexander Berthier, um, who becomes Minister of War upon the uh, Napoleonic seizure of, a seizure of power. And he doesn't remain as Minister of War, but he always remains as Napoleon's Chief of Staff. And he was a brilliant man, a very hard-worked man as yes, well. Yes, and I, I just want to um, understand what was Berthier's role, because he starts off with Napoleon in 1796, and continues to follow him all the way up until 1814 and doesn't join him in the Hundred Days campaign, which often Napoleon lamented in his exile in St. Helena. So does anyone have anything they would like to say about Berthier? I mean, Berthier was the man who essentially organized all of the um, the paperwork and kept track of it. I believe um, um, as early as the Austerlitz campaign, they had a whole um, system set up of essentially a, a, a whole carriage um, a whole wagon which was devoted to papers which held the um the yes. the dispositions of the uh of the troops the battle plans um ammunition and also of course um napoleon was um famed for his sort of ability to 
uh, multitask. You know, I mean, you know, while he's preparing for a battle, he's sending off instructions for the institution of a school for, for I don't know, um, you know, the daughters of fallen soldiers or something like this. And uh, it was Berthier. He was the one who um, had the, you know, unfortunate task of, again, keeping track of all of this. He was a, a secretary extraordinaire. Um, and I think he was absolutely essential to uh, to Napoleon's um, to Napoleon's success. He kept everything organized. Yes, Berthier was one of the most important marshals Napoleon had, not in his role as a military commander, but as a logistics man and secretary. Uh, certainly, Napoleon's speed could not have been achieved without a way to actually transmit his orders to all of his corps in the field uh, in the appropriate time to allow them to reconverge. Uh, and conduct, you know, far off campaigns uh, in places where Napoleon wasn't even present. Yeah, uh, such I as believe Spain. That, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I believe that they even um, devised together a sort of um, um, this sort of strange filing system for tracking the um, the 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 movements and dispositions of enemy uh, enemy forces nearby, where they would use, I think, a deck of playing cards or something. And depending on the arrangement of the cards, um, they could tell the numbers and the dispositions. And I think the idea was, um, if um, this uh, baggage train was captured or if it was cut off and um, it got into enemy hands, then the enemies wouldn't be able to make sense of um, um, what what information the, the French had about them. And so they, you know, they were constantly devising all of these sort of um, ingenious systems. And when you consider that at times um, Napoleon would be sending off something in the in the region of about, you know, I think it's sometimes he sent off about thirty five letters a day to all sorts of different places. Um, he needed someone there to to help organize this for all his brilliance. Um, and Berthier fulfilled that role. So yes, I would say uh, one of the most uh, essential marshals to his success, definitely. And Panama, I would like to focus on your second point, which is the Napoleonic system of government, because after the destruction of the French Navy at the Battle of the Nile, this is where Napoleon decides to uh, quit Egypt and Syria and flee home after things had already st um, reached a stalemate in yeah. Accra and Jaffa. There is another point where you need to emphasize, which is which we need to emphasize rather than just the uh, momentum of the revolution, which had been able to allow, for example, the creation of the levy en masse, where France was able to raise men in numbers which were essentially un completely unfeasible before, and also military technologies, which, as we're talking about with Betty and logistics, was able to allow Napoleon to deploy an army and use the army more effectively, more efficiently, and was able to mobilize at a faster pace than anything that was previously sort of imagined before. But there's another point to mention, which is that the Republic was imperiled when Napoleon came back in September of 1799. In 1793 and 1794, the whole notion that the Republic was imminently going to collapse was an essential point to understand in the Jacobins' control of power and the reign of terror. When we have the Battle of Fleurus in 1794, all of a sudden it seems that the Republic is secure. We have actually gaining territory. We're now on the offensive. So we don't need this military dictatorship. By 1799, these, this uh, situation seems to have re-emerged for the French Republic. We have a paralytic political situation. We have a directory which is riven by monarchists who have been forced out of office, uh, pseudo-monarchists, constitutional republicans, former Jacobins. Dreadful situation in Central Europe. And in terms of the situation in Central Europe, uh, we have the arrival of Alexander Suvorov into mm. Italy, uh, yeah. driving out the French garrisons, defeating the French again and again and again, albeit he's checked but not defeated in Switzerland, which the French had also tried to augment at this time. By 1799, um, the French had been chased out of all of their conquests on the eastern bank of the Rhine. And the entire Italian settlement had completely collapsed. The All of the various republics, the Cisalpine Republic, the Roman Republic, the uh, Parthenopean Republic in Naples had all been evicted. The Austrians were in Venice, they were back in Milan. And it seemed as if the Republic itself was going to be invaded on all fronts. So Napoleon comes back, there is a willing body of people prepared to support a change in the government, supported by people who were actually part of the government. So, for example, Sierra's uh, Auger Ducot 
Joseph Bonaparte and Lucien Bonaparte are all part of this government serving in various functions. Um, and of course, building off the Bonaparte name, Bonaparte already has his loyalists in the army. And after a somewhat botched coup, um, the, coup <laughs> yes. the coup of Brumaire, uh, in, which Lucien, one, isn't it? Yes, in which Lucien, rather than Napoleon, has actually got the decisive factor. Um, the deputies of the Council of uh, the Eight, the Council of the Ancients, and the Council of the Five Hundred are chased away. There is a rump which creates a new constitution, and Napoleon, after having lost his cool in the original coup, is able to pull off a coup within a coup, rather than being essentially seen as the military man under Sears. I am the coup. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in a three, in a three in a three man government, the consulate, Napoleon basically establishes personal rule as first consul with people who are far more docile than either Sears or Roger de Coup, uh, namely uh, Cambaceres, who later goes on to uh, author the Code Civil de Napoleonic Code. So by winter of 1799, Napoleon has crafted a constitution which has given himself all the powers which the Committee of Public Safety had um, back in um, 1793, mm. 1794. Didn't it give him, one... um, what, what powers did it give him? Did it give him like veto power or the power to call, um, to, you know, what, what did it give him exactly? Essentially, you know? with the with the creation of the Council of Ministers, not only did Napoleon have complete control of the government, the delegation of ministries, the ability to declare war, mm. but he now had the ability to initiate legislation. And the yeah. legislature was essentially... Yeah, because that the... was meant to be reserved to the other house originally. Yes, right? and the legislature that was created, it was the tribunate, it was the uh, the Senate Conservateur, etc. Um, all of these institute and uh, the core legislative uh, these institutions couldn't actually debate proposed legislation and vote on it collectively. All of these things were parceled off. So <laughs> all of these um, authorities were stripped away and basically the preserve of the consul, who could, of course, appoint members to the Senate, which was the most powerful of this uh, tricameral body. And so note the note the classical upholstery of all these uh, revolutionary um, in, in, in institutions, the oh, yeah. Senate and consul. The tribunate. Yeah, I mean, tribunate. they were all they were all actually wearing togas. I mean, yeah. subtlety <laughs> was not their strong suit. I mean, <laughs> Bit of a laugh, isn't it? But um, oh, but oh, oh, also as well, we should note this is this this was quite closely predicted by one uh, one one Mr. Burke, the uh, the, mm. the right honourable Edmund Burke, who said that following all this, the the what 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 will happen is that a powerful uh, figure in the military will emerge and take power. Um, so, and, and and I believe he he wasn't the only one to basically look look, look at the situation that was unfolding and say that that is what's going to happen. Yeah, um, I, I love reading Burke's reflections. I think Burke was one of the most eloquent men who's who have ever lived. I, I love reading him. But I think Shane, there's something that, bloody wig. There's yeah, something, there's something, <laughs> however, more to more than that. It's not just I, I've already sort of. Uh, almost flippantly said that um, Napoleon established a military dictatorship, but that's not exactly true. He established a personal dictatorship, not a military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And building on this idea that uh, ostensibly the Committee of Public Safety had its power from the National Convention, which is supposed to embody the Rousseauian general will of the public. Um, what, what Napoleon did was bypass any such in intermediary institution and put his reforms directly to the people in the form of these fraudulent plebiscites in which he would constantly up the turn out up the numbers and ensure that 99.97 percent of people always voted for his various reforms you know giving him power giving him power for life and making yeah. him emperor of the french um so in this way he was able to claim direct supposed popular legitimacy in a way that a simple military dictator could not his power yeah. wasn't simply rested and on the power of the you... army it was rested on this genuine tide of religious fervor i mean napoleon would have won regardless but he <laughs> wasn't content and with 80 you... percent or 90% it yeah. had to be 100% victory how, how do you feel about this this kind of um welding of monarchism with kind of republican populism with this whole this whole idea of being emperor of the french because because this is something that rings through for the rest of the 1800s all all over the world this 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 I, this when 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 a kind of monarchical type is caught in a revolutionary bind they they like to default to this sort of rather than being you know the emperor of france they are the emperor of the french or the emperor well of i think i, I think Mexico. it goes i think it goes exactly to what you what you guys have just have just said there i mean there's this classic idea that if you don't like the answer that you're getting from the established government or the established institutions you go to the people i mean the example that comes to mind for me is the the gracchi brothers again in yeah. ancient rome where they can't pass the legislation that they want and so they um 
with dubious legality go to the people and hold a direct plebiscite. And so it's this idea of um, in declaring yourself emperor of the French as opposed to emperor of France, you are again cutting through that and going to the from from a liberal perspective an enlightenment perspective the, I, hate, the, um, the origin, I hate to interrupt you know? this but uh could we hold off specifically on the acquisition of imperial power just for a bit because oh, yeah. in the meantime before we arrive at napoleon's uh, assumption of imperial power we might want to talk about one of the major battles <laughs> yes <laughs> might be a good uh, idea. napoleon about. napoleon has to legitimate legitimate himself simply as first consul before he can go on to be emperor of the French. Because again, we're talking about, you know, we, we can ap appeal to all of these ideas, but Napoleon was brought in and given power for one specific aim, which was he was a military strongman. He was able to turn around the situation in Italy. Now we are going to rely on a military strongman to reverse this precarious um, military situation that we have found ourselves in. I think it's actually one of the remarkable sort of missed opportunities in history that we never saw Napoleon uh, face off against Alexander Suvorov. Um, Alexander Suvorov was pulled out of the War of the Second Coalition after Emperor Paul essentially changed his mind. And instead, we are left with his Austrian deputy, um, General Melas. Essentially, General Melas had, along with Suvorov, just pushed the French almost entirely out of Italy, with the exception of Genoa, which would fall immediately after um, Napoleon crosses the Alps. And um, then, of course, we have uh, Jean Lannes' uh, victory at Montbello, which presses Napoleon into engaging uh, Melas at um, uh, at Marengo. But never, there's just a couple of things on terms of the Napoleonic myth. Of course, we all associate Napoleon's crossing with the Alps with Hannibal, and we are meant to. And of course, we see that ridiculous portrait of Napoleon marked with his masterful cape sort of wrapped around him on his magnificent steed up crossing the, the Alps um, by David. And I bring up this painting here um by uh Delaroche which is much later painting 50 years after um the crossing of the Alps which is a far more faithful interpretation of the events which is uh Napoleon's crossing over the Alps on the mule in terms of the historical illusion and the fantasy versus the actual reality of Napoleon's campaign even though of course he wasn't imitating Hannibal so much as he was imitating Suvorov who had already accomplished the feat only a year before so here we are Napoleon Napoleon is I, in um, it. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, could, could I ask you a question? Because when I was doing my reading about this, I saw that Napoleon had said somewhere um, after crossing the Alps that we've accomplished a deed um, that was only last achieved by Charlemagne. Did, did Charlemagne cross the Alps with an army? And if so, so what were the circumstances? Well, yes, he would have crossed an army into Lombardy. Um, to destroy the last remnants of the Lombard kingdom before his coronation as mm -hmm. the emperor of the Romans. Um, yeah. Which is what enticed the papal states to crown him over okay. the eastern emperors. Yes, it's, I mean, it's, just, it's just something I've not read about. But there I we also, um, I, I, in, in that, the, the, the art that you mentioned, AM, the kind of quite r romantic depiction of Napoleon in the Alps, you know, re 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 rearing up on the horse, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. Down um, in the bottom left of the of the picture, which and I know this because in my mid teens I I bought a copy of it <laughs> because I had a rather ill conceived admiration for Napoleon I think, but um, down down in the in the bottom left there's a kind of stone which is meant to be just one of the stones on the ground but it has this image of being a kind of gravestone, and it mentions not only Charlemagne and Hannibal but Gustavus uh, Adolphus as well and I wondered. Because Columba asked about Charlemagne, did did is that another famous Alp crosser? Um, no, no? <laughs> I would be very surprised to hear if Gustavus Adolphus crossed the Alps. He um, crossed the uh, Baltic, but he didn't cross the Alps. Yes, I think no, that's uh, just what um, struck me as quite odd. Yeah. I think that's just David being a bit shameless. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? We've already Why made not? everything else up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't get much worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, does anyone want to assess uh, Napoleon at Marengo? Before, before we, we oh sorry, <laughs> oh sorry, <laughs> before I, be, be, before I begin, pat on my hat by the way. Well, this is a completely irrelevant point, but, but I, I, I I have to bring it up, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this this one. Uh, if you're curious, is that uh, if you haven't had it, you need to get out there and have chicken marengo, which is one of my absolute favorite mm, foods. Which I believe nice. is there's there, there there is some argument between culinary historians and such as to as to why exactly it's called that. But the overarching opinion is that it was named after this victory. Um, it's one. It's absolutely delicious. It's basically chicken 
which is sauteed in tomato with garlic. It's proper good old French peasant food. Um, yeah. mm. Garlic, eggs, crayfish, I believe. Uh, well, it's it's, it's it's sort of it's sort of Occitanian, which, if you think of it, is sort of like pseudo half French, half Italian cuisine. You know, it's mm-hmm. very med- Mediterranean in that sense. But yes, I agree. It is wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, that, that, I, I, I had to say it because my stomach was <laughs> insisting on it. <laughs> no, no, and and I for one, I'm glad you did. You know me, I'm I'm always one for a good culinary uh, tangent. So he got, I he got that no. Chesterton in him. Yeah. But 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 um, I I just want to. Just to bookend the quote that you uh, made of Napoleon AM, I just wanted to, uh, before we touch on Marengo, I just wanted to basically touch on the disposition which he left Italy, or rather the the culmination of his campaigns prior to him going to Egypt, because Asprey has a very good extract here that I would like to just quickly read out, if that's okay. Sure. Soldiers, in 15 days you have won six victories, taken 21 standards, 55 cannon, several fortresses. You have conquered the richest part of Piedmont. You have taken 15,000 prisoners, killed or wounded more than 10,000 men. Deprived of everything, you have made up for everything. You have won battles without cannon, crossed rivers without bridges, made forced marches without shoes, bivouacked without brandy and without bread. The greatest obstacles are without doubt surmounted. But you still have battles ahead, cities to take, rivers to cross. Is the courage of any of you weakening? Would any of you prefer to return to the mountains and suffer the abuses of military slavery? No, not for the conquerors of Montenotte, Milesimo, Dego and Mondovi. Every single one of you wants to extend the glory of the French race, to humiliate those arrogant kings who dare think of putting us in irons, to dictate a glorious peace which will indemnify the country for its immense sacrifices. Everybody wants, upon returning to their villages, to be able to say with pride, I served with that army that conquered Italy. So considering the state in which Napoleon found his army, it's a very um, different position in which he left the army in Italy. Um, I think that contrast is uh, is well worth it. And it it's probably good that it brings us to Marengo now because it, it is, even though this uh, this French army in Italy has suffered setbacks at the hands of the Austrians and uh, Suvorov, who for a time is obviously northern Italy, um, Napoleon is obviously comes back, he returns to France from his Egyptian expedition and is reunited with the with the likes of uh, uh, Kellerman and Lon and Messena and these men who had he had forged this Italian army with um, at the beginning. And now we've got this sort of set piece showdown um, between the Austrians and, uh, and the French. Um, did you want to say anything AM before we continue? Uh, I would like to jump in if we were talking about the sort of the preparations before the battle itself. Um, I think it's, um, there's, there's a lot of sort of anecdotes and apocryphal stories, but there's one, um, you know, it's supposedly, a couple of months before the battle, when I think it was Napoleon and Berthier, but it was Napoleon and one of his marshals. They're supposedly um crawling around on giant maps of um northern Italy and the Alps, um supposedly bumping heads occasionally because they were so focused on what was going on. Um, and Napoleon supposedly predicted the exact location of the Battle of Marengo um, based on a uh, was it was it Melas I think or Mela, yeah I think it was Mela. Um, and sure enough, um, that was exactly where the battle was. But yeah, the plan was essentially to, because I think I was a uh, who was being besieged in Genoa. Was it Massena who was in Genoa? Yeah, being, Andre yeah. Massena. Yeah, yeah. And the situation was very, very dire. I think they had no food. Eventually, they were sort of down to eating rats, and uh, the British were blockading the port. Um, and so Napoleon's plan was to, I think, cross over with the majority of his force in the. Uh, great St. Bernard Pass in the sort of uh, western side of the Alps. And then he sent uh, another force um, further east through the, uh, I think, the San Gotthard Pass or Gothard Pass. And essentially, um, once uh, Mela had found out about this, he decided to, um, I think he ended up letting um, 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 the soldiers trapped in Genoa go and marched his army to uh, uh, try and, I think, link up with Oat, who was to the north of him. Um, um, but Napoleon again, who was quite short of supplies after this 11 day trek through the 
through the Alps, um, Napoleon surprises his expectations and takes Milan instead. And uh, taking Milan, of course, good for morale, but it also allows uh, the men to resupply and fill up on, um, on ammunition. Another point that I think should be noted, um, we're talking about skill versus luck with Marengo, is Napoleon did get very lucky indeed because there was very, very grim weather before he entered the St. Bernard Pass. And then for 11 yeah. days, he got pretty much clear weather. And the day after he left, it began to snow again. Winter so hadn't technically lifted by the time he started the campaign. Um, yes. It's an important thing to note. Uh, Napoleon's so, strategy here lucky. also uh, ties into something we were saying earlier about always being on the attack and taking the initiative. So instead of, uh, you know, going directly to uh, Lan in order to relieve him, he uh, essentially went on the offensive against the uh, Austrian supply lines. Uh, yes, he cuts off the, the supply initiative. lines, of course. Yeah, so now now the Austrians, um, although they were an advantage before in an advantageous position, are now um, playing on his terms. And then, um, but I mean, I mean, it's not, it's, it's by no means a, a sort of flawless battle. I mean, Napoleon sends, no. um, uh, Desai, um, quite far, quite far ahead, a couple hours of, a, hours ahead, because he doesn't think that, um, um, Mela is going to give battle. But of course, um, in the early morning. Can I ever give a bit of context to that? Um, after Jean Lan, again, Lan is going to be an important figure who's going mm -hmm. to keep cropping up again and again. Jean Lan. Who has, who has his own arc, by the way. Yes, yeah. wins the first major battle of the campaign at Montbello. And after the Austrians had been decisively defeated there, Napoleon was under the false impression that Malas was re retreating in yeah. bad mm -hmm. order, that the army was disorganized and in no position to give battle. So he essentially believed that he was going to be able to win a quick, decisive victory against a disheveled army, which definitely wasn't the case. It's, yeah. it's interesting because all of the accounts I've read, even the ones that are more kind of from more pro- Napoleonic historians, like when you're actually reading about the lead up to the battle and the battle itself, it, it doesn't read like a like a victory, even, even though for, for, for Napoleon, it, it was a sort of it was it ended up being a, a, one of his best. It was it was kind of they they all seem to treat it as a, something of an aberration. Or yes, kind of, it's a very a strange kind of, result, yeah. a, a, a kind of battle that by all by all accounts, he should have lost. You know, yeah. but but manages to win and, and do very well off the back of it. Again, he get he does get very lucky, doesn't he? But um, so, sorry, I don't want to um, cut anyone yeah, off. Sorry, to derail you. No, no, I was just going to say that I, I think it's what what's worth saying here as well is that it's one of these battles that say, unlike Wagram, unlike Austerlitz, unlike um, Alstedt and, and Jena, which we'll get to later, Marengo isn't set piece it isn't particularly clean because of the uh, i believe there's an, also the impact of a, or the misinformation of a double agent as well so bonaparte is actually as, as much as he's actually cut melas's army sort of in two you can sort of see here there's french dispositions um from uh castel Cheriolo down to san giuliano vecchio which is on the right hand side of this map here where napoleon's massed um sort of melas is on almost sort of countercut him because he uh Melas is massed through Casino Grossa uh, through to Spinetta and then through to Marengo town itself and then north uh, Ott has massed around um that Castel Cer Ceriola which he actually captured uh, prior to the French getting there so it's like these two armies have kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like sort of bumped into each other. They've kind of massed in front of one another with, whilst both are, are somewhat blind as to each other's actual disposition and deployment. It's kind of a clumsy start to the battle, or clumsy initiation of battle, if if that's worth describing that way. Yeah, and it's very it's very messy. So much so that um on the night of the 13th, in the morning of the 14th, when the Austrians begin to cross the is it the Bormida River, I think. Um, yeah, they sort of, they make a bridgehead. I, I don't think Napoleon realizes that it's a, a full assault until I think an hour an hour after that, and um, it's it's quite a dire situation at first. They're sort of steadily pushed back. I think the Austrians um, open up with the artillery. Um, they begin to imperil um, the the left flank of Napoleon's army and um, try and um, envelop him on the left, and they I retreat. Think and they retreat for um sorry sorry yeah, yeah. 
So, so I think um, you, well, again, we're, we're talking about the retreat, but I think, in again, deference to Napoleon, uh, Napoleon was able to ensure the morale of the army through the retreat to ensure it didn't break and the retreat didn't turn into a rout. And yeah. at this moment, um, there was a, a remarkably sort of a funny anecdote from uh, Malas, the Austrian commander. As the French were retreating, Malas basically assumed that he had already won the battle, leaves <laughs> yeah, and yeah. has lunch during the battle while the <laughs> French are retreating. Yeah, and leaves his, leaves his second in command in charge. But I mean, that's a very good point, which must be noted um, in terms of the discipline of the army, because um, the whole way that they are being retreated, they are under um, intensive artillery fire and they're taking um, um, their, you know constant attacks and charges on the left flank. And so the fact that they could um, retreat in good order is a is a testament to their their discipline yeah, I, and their cool yeah that, that's uh mainly what i wanted to say on this battle is that uh, napoleon's big achievement here is actually um the being able to retreat in good order which is of course what allows the battle to ultimately be won once the reinforcements arrive because it yes. could have easily turned into a, a route and maybe would have under a different commander so you know yes. it sounds yeah. weird to praise this retreat but obviously that's no, actually this is really important this, part of these battles. This is an extremely important thing in military history um, as, as a whole. People don't quite grasp the importance of orderly retreats. Um, this is something that, that that occurs over and over. If, that, if, if, you can, if you can mastermind a totally orderly retreat in which you get all your men and supplies and guns out in good order, then in, in my opinion, that is essentially takes the same amount of skill and kind of luck and and arguably more as as, as 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 a victory on the field i mean it's mm. it's quite incredible there's a there's a certain there's a certain someone in the deep lore not to get too far off track who um who i was talking to about the schleswig war um between prussia and the danes and i mentioned the general uh julius de Meza. And uh, he said, well, I don't know why you like him so much. All, all he managed to do was get the Danish army out in one piece. And I said, well, exactly. <laughs> That's what he managed to yeah. do, was get the Danish army out. No, yeah, very... The goal of the battles in this era is mainly just to destroy the opposing force more than yes. actually take any particular territory per se, right? So mm. keeping your force intact is really the most important thing. And there are battles that we'll get to later where um, Napoleon's opponents... Uh, pull their forces out in order to preserve them rather than actually risk losing them. And this and serves as, so, sorry, Columbus, this serves as a rather fantastic juxtaposition because whilst the Napoleonic army is able to survive due to the retreat in good order, when we, during the retreat, the Austrians not only failed to pursue the French, they are suddenly set upon by the army of Desai, which has rushed in the finally Napoleonic reinforcements have come. In contrast to Napoleon's ordered retreat, the Austrian army almost immediately begins to collapse under the threat of Desai. Yeah. And in this chaotic retreat compared to the organized retreat of Napoleon, Desai and Maman are able to effectively break the Austrians and of course combine that with Kellerman's cavalry charge. Yeah, the Austrians the are yeah. sent into complete disarray, so much so Des uh, Desai charges at the Austrians so aggressively is actually killed in the process. So again, you can say that the battle was actually won depending on the superior retreat of the French compared to the Austrians. Yes, the hubris mm. of the Austrians. I would note one more thing, um, because of course, as soon as Napoleon realized that it was going to be a full assault from the Austrians, he sent a rider um, um, whipping his horse, we can assume, to Desai, um, telling him to come back. And in terms of, again, luck, Napoleon had luck with the weather in the Alps. Um, he was also lucky in that there had been quite a lot of rain on the um, the, the road that Desai was taking. And so, I mean, you know, assuming that you had had nice conditions and dry ground, Desai would have been far, um, far away, too far away um, um, to be able to return in time to um, reinforce Napoleon. But the rough conditions on the road meant that he was only, um, I think, something like three, four hours away. And so he managed to get there in the afternoon and um, and save the day. So again, um, there is luck there, a lot of luck. In, in essence, Colombia, you're sort of saying that Desai was trudging away from Marengo and therefore he was able to trudge back in a relatively, yes, <laughs> a relatively yes. short space of time. Trudged indeed. Sometimes yeah. bad yes. weather has its advantage. It, 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 
It does. Um, what one thing worth mentioning too about battles like this, and we'll sort of see this more as we go on, is that, and sometimes you know, obviously on this channel we've talked a lot about you know, got, you can pick any number of battles. You know, we've we've talked about um, you know, we've we've talked about like the Persian Wars and Gorgamella and Issus and whatever and Caesar and Elys Elysium, whatever. Once we hit the Napoleonic period in this sort of this military scale of, of a post uh, Livion Musk sort of system, these armies become so large that they're sort of fighting at, at you know, a, a multi-regimental level at the core level. And and because these armies are so large and widely dispersed, Marengo is an example of this, where it's not just, oh, they're fighting at a bridge at Lodi or, you know, they're, they're besieging Mantua as a single city. But you can see here that this army is sort of deployed across the breadth of multiple towns sort of on the periphery and the environs of Alessandria and that you know what there actually is there is an attack an initial Austrian attack from Casino Grosso you know there is um the the French actually initially possess Marengo and then are thrown out of Marengo um from from the from the direction of Spinetto um Otz enters the battlefield from the direction of Pavia I mean, these are multi-directional, sort of multi-faceted uh, battles occurring either at unison or in, um, you know, a, within a, cl a close sort of schedule of one another. It's 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 quite and and given the clumsy sort of disposition of Marengo as a battle, it's 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 sort of sporadic. It's not in unison. It's not timely. Um, and a lot of these battles will be like this, just for the sake of it's worth mentioning. Can I both support and slightly push back against that? On the one sure. hand, yes, you're completely correct that the armies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger due to mass conscription armies. But what I find remarkable at Mount Marengo, even compared to Hohenlinden and all the other battles we're going to discuss, is how a how tiny an affair it was. We're talking about uh, less than 60,000 men combined. When we come to something like Vagram, we're talking about 300,000 mm. men. Yes. So the battles are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And even part of this mm. overall war of the Second Coalition, not only is Marengo bungled, but it's not even the decisive battle in the war. So why am I picking this? Because Marengo was the decisive political victory Napoleon needed in order to continue the existence of the consulate. He was essentially assumed power on the basis that he was a military strongman who would secure the Republic in arms against all of Europe. And he was able to prove this incredibly tentatively at Marengo. That could have gone either way. And as a result of this, the Austrians began retreating to Venetia, which was their main uh, strategic foothold left in Italy, now that Milan had once again switched sides and the Cisalpine Republic would be restored before being re transformed all of the, the Italian of, um, Republic. Northwest of Italy, essentially, right? Yes. However, However, this, like I said, isn't the major battle. Instead, the major battle of the campaign is in Bavaria, east of Munich, at the Battle of Hohenlinden, where Jean Moreau is able to ambush the main Austrian army under the Archduke John, and he is able to envelop it, and he's able to destroy it quite decisively. And compared to Marengo, the French army here has 55,000 men, the Austrians have slightly more, so we're talking about an engagement twice the size of Marengo that pushes the Austrians out of the war and forces them to sue for peace the Treaty of Bloomville. But also, it's the number of famous Napoleonic marshals, such as uh, Ney, who are fighting under Moreau, and of course, one, Mar one uh, General Grouchy, who will later be Marshal Grouchy. I bring up Grouchy, of course, because uh, Grouchy, of course, is almost uh, infamous as being the anti Desai in terms of <laughs> not marching to the sound of the guns yeah. and allowing the Prussians to intercept and crush Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, which is very similar in temperament to the Battle of Marengo. And mm. as a result of this, in terms of why I bring up Hohen Linden, it's important to understand that this is all part of Napoleon's political strategy, not just his military strategy. So on the one hand, Marengo is enough for him to stay in power, and he officiates lots of national celebrations around Marengo. There's a column erected in Paris to celebrate Marengo. Um, Marengo is essentially, you know, incorporated into the French Republic as the I mean, he names of, he names his horse Marengo. Marengo. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> and, so and a street in Paris is named after the battle as well, with a, exactly. with a 
like an obelisk as well to commemorate it. So this is why we brought up the propaganda campaign earlier, because it's absolutely essential in terms of memorializing Marengo, how it ostensibly happened as opposed to how it really happened, which was an incredibly bungled affair that could have gone either way. And ultimately it was due to the individual disposition of the armies and Napoleon's tenacity and Malas's foolhardiness and hubris that ensured that the Austrians should have won that battle, but nevertheless, it turned into a French victory. And the great victory is at Hohenlinden. Now bringing us back to the question of um, the creation of the empire, Napoleon is establishing his power based on military fiat, and yet through Hohenlinden, there has just been created another major military figure who could possibly oppose Napoleon through his, again, not even arguably, it was the greater victory at Hohenlinden, which has brought peace. Um, so, of course, the next three years, Napoleon begins consolidating his campaign in terms of putting this in the grand strategy of Napoleon. From 1800 until 1802, his first years as first consul of France, he does seem to be pursuing the traditional sort of aims of the French Republic, which was securing the original borders of Gallican France here and also trying to achieve a glorious peace through all the coalition powers and recognition of this. At Lunville, he is able to get imperial recognition, recognition of the continental powers of France's new preeminence with these new borders. Russia is forced out and Emperor Paul seems to actually be pursuing an anti-British strategy. There's even a suggestion of a Cossack invasion of India through Persia, which has been touted by Paul. <laughs> um, that would have been a thing to see, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and remarkably, again, for Napoleon, in 1802, he is actually able to make peace with Britain for the only time throughout the whole duration of the Napoleonic Wars with the Treaty of Amiens. So from this point on, what is Napoleon's strategy? Now he has ostensibly achieved peace in Europe. Well, he focuses not only on consolidating France's new borders, but he adopts, again, talking about Egypt, he adopts a colonial policy. So he reintroduces slavery, which had been abolished by the later yeah. Republic, and tries to conquer Haiti, which had been in revolt since the 1790s. Does not and, go well. And it does not go well, and the French are defeated there, and they lose Haiti and uh, San Domingo forever. And based on that strategy, Napoleon again, as part of a Spanish contrivance, which I mentioned in a previous lecture, which is behind a paywall, so it doesn't really matter. But suffice to say, France was given back Louisiana, which had been temporarily occupied by the Spanish. And rather than try to hold on to Louisiana, the Haitian experience convinced Napoleon to abandon his colonial aspirations and sell Louisiana to the Americans, um, rather than risk losing it again to the British or whatever, any other power, now that France couldn't feasibly project yeah. her power The famed Louisiana Purchase, yeah. Yes, the famed Louisiana Purchase. Um, so now Napoleon is refocusing back on continental affairs. Essentially, after 1802, 1803, France has more or less given up pursuing in anything outside of the realms of the continent, and all of Napoleon's strategic thinking becomes continental. Now he's been defeated in Egypt, and he's been defeated in the Caribbean, and he's basically accepted the loss of Louisiana. If anything, you can say that the Treaty of Amiens more or less recognized France, French preeminence on the continent and British maritime dominance. But this doesn't last very long, and there are various provocations on both sides. I think one of the most interesting provocations is Napoleon's annexation of Piedmont, which is something which is barely talked about. But again, ostensibly, Napoleon annexed Piedmont because the king of Sardinia, who was also the uh, ruler of Piedmont had retreated to uh, Sardinia and ostensibly because the British were preserving him in power there uh, there was this idea that the British were going to back a anti-Napoleon coup in Piedmont which was just adjacent to France's newly acquired territories and would split her from her Italian territories so in order to again preemptively prevent that from happening Napoleon simply annexed Piedmont into the Republic so he could directly administer it and supposedly snuff out any pro Savoyard sort of patriotism in that region and at the same time the British are not sticking to their agreements either there was an agreement to evacuate Malta um, and the British never did so by 1802 and 1803 it's very clear that neither side are interested in a long peace rather this is a cold war which very quickly goes hot when the British resume conflict with France in 1803 and I think it's important to understand that you know from 
1803 from to 1806, there is a chance at a negotiated settlement with the British, but this quickly dissipates after 1806 and 1807, when Napoleon increasingly, we talked about this reorientation from a peace settlement with Britain and the abandonment of a grand colonial strategy, how Napoleon becomes more and more observed in his new um, continental strategy. Anyway, that's my point. Uh, just quickly on the Piedmont uh, annexation as well. It's um, it's worth mentioning too, from sort of a, a military and uh, and uh, logistical standpoint as well, that the the French uh, had always seen it as something of, of an impediment at this time, obviously, something of an impediment of having to march an army across the Alps. Marching uh, across the Alps is usually a hazardous and a complicated thing, and even in good weather, it is still. Um, a difficult undertaking to do. You know, it's just the topography. The Alps are are, are, are an obviously large physical boundary ge geographically between southern France and northern Italy. And so the annexation of Piedmont permits the French to billet an army or the, yes, the Italian but army I'm in gonna, Italy, gonna, but, in, but Italy to, in fact. But I'm going to, again, push back against that slightly because I think it's indicative of the worst element of Napoleon, which is Napoleon continuously believing that things would be better administered directly by him rather than any intermediary, uh, which oh. creates this which creates this logic because... I wouldn't disagree with you on that point. I was speaking because, purely from a deployment and logistics yes, standpoint. Yes, but specifically regarding that, between 1800 and 1802, there was a thing called the Subalpine Republic. The Subalpine Republic had French currency, French administrators, and the French army occupying it. And mm -hmm. the Piedmontese troops that were there were actually incorporated into the French army garrisons there before the French annexed it. So the whole French annexation of Piedmont was almost entirely punitive and directly aimed against the British and their protection of the Savoyard King in Sardinia. That's why it was such a seen as such an arbitrary provocation compared yes, to, and, and again, also compared to the idea that France seemingly had established her new borders, her new Gallican borders. And the annexation of Piedmont begins this process of the arbitrary expansion of these borders. And again, more developments in Napoleon's strategy beyond France, as, as I talked about at the beginning, towards this new Carolingian facsimile. So I think this is a good time to talk about the creation of the empire because both Columba and Panama have brought up this idea of what was the ideology behind it? Why did Napoleon's rule as first consul almost necessitate the creation of a monarchical system of government? Well. On the one hand, like I said, Napoleon wanted to depart from the idea of his rule being purely military. In order to do this, he needed to eliminate his main military rival, Jean Moreau. Um, Jean Moreau had, was not only um, a military rival to Napoleon, he was also a political adversary to Napoleon. And around Jean Moreau, all of the people, for example, royalists in particular, Bourbon partisans, began to flock to him and consider him as a preferable alternative to Napoleon, and even someone who may have facilitated the restoration of the monarchy under Louis XVIII. And Napoleon, however, didn't have any evidence to pin any sort of conspiracy or treason on Jean Moreau. So we see all of these various assassinations attempts directed at Napoleon. Um, Napoleon had infiltrated various Jacobin clubs, he'd infiltrated the monarchist movements throughout France. So as we see the increasing frequency of all of these assassination attempts, uh, uh, Joseph Fouché is going around locking up all these various again, supposed conspirators and enemies of Napoleon. Essentially, he's eliminating the more radical proponents of Jacobinism and the monarchy, i.e. people who would actually want to see the restoration of the Bourbons or people who would want to see the restoration of the pre-1799 Republic. And instead, what we're seeing in France is this permissive attitude towards pseudo-monarchists, pseudo-Jacobins. Um, and, you know, borderline sort of boring Republicans of all stripes becoming, you can say, amenable to this idea of a new system of government centered on Napoleon, which would transform the Republic into a dynastic system of rule, i.e. a constitutional monarchy with Napoleon as its emperor, as emperor of the French. So by, and of course, with these assassination attempts by 1804, um, Moreau is, again, he's not killed, he's forced into exile because of his supposed um, 
links organization uh, links with these organizations responsible for these repeated assassination attempts on Napoleon. So Napoleon quickly amasses power after 1802 with the Treaty of Amiens. He creates himself as the first consul for life. And in 1804, by another plebiscite, he is confirmed as the emperor of the French. At the same time, he has also eliminated a the son of the Duke of Condé, a major um, Bourbon and um, opponent of Napoleon, uh, to win over the support of the moderate Jacobins who were left for the creation of this new political system. And essentially, on the one hand, it enshrines Napoleon's rule. It allows him to pursue a dynastic policy, but it also allows for the aggrandizement of France and Napoleon to begin establishing and cementing his government based on him, based on his family, um, in a way that wouldn't necessarily necessitate rule by the military or another military coup. However, in order to trap this new monarchical system in a Republican veneer, we see all of these historical allusions to Caesar. This is Caesar, Augustus Caesar, creating the Princeps. I he at uh, the Princeps. He is the emperor of the Romans. He is the emperor of the French. In the same way that Louis the Sixteenth was supposed to be the citizen king, um, he is not the ruler of the empire as his own personal domain. Simply, he is the highest representative and the defender of those people and that domain, which continually increases. So by 1804. Um, also, it's important to understand that he's also brought the Catholic Church on site. In 1801, there is the Concordat, which is which facilitates the res the rapprochement between the Papal States under Pius VII and Napoleon. Also, the Pope despises what's going on in Germany with the massive transfer of ecclesiastical possessions in 1803 with the secularization of church land, all of the loss of this territory and begin over to secular princes. So all of a sudden, Napoleon actually looks like a plausible defender of the church. So all of these elements, moderate Jacobins, moderate Republicans, moderate monarchists and the church convene to support Napoleon's new acquisition of power as Emperor of the French. Again, on one hand, pseudo-Republican. On the other, Napoleon is consciously styling himself as a Carolingian emperor, as a restorer of the crown of Charlemagne. There's even a Charlemagne crown replica, which is used in the formal coronation ceremony. Napoleon, on the one hand, at his coronation, declares that I will be the defender of the French constitution and the French people. And on the other hand, he's getting his reign blessed by the Pope. So where does his authority come from. He's crowning himself, swearing on the constitution and getting his <laughs> legitimacy confirmed by the Pope. So it's not exactly clear where this new system of government ultimately rests its authority on. Is it popular sovereignty? Is it military fiat, Napoleon himself making himself the emperor? Or is it by divine right of kings with the Pope blessing the ceremony. All of these things are possible and I don't think anything is particularly clear to show how complicated and contradictory this new imperial settlement is for France. But even well, allusions to the Republic are used consistently up until about 1808 when Napoleon begins to make the state explicitly an empire as opposed to a Republic. Sorry, that's my spiel over. Hello. Well, lost sorry, it. sorry, sorry, guys. I had to take a phone call. Um, <laughs> sorry. I mean, yeah, we're here. Um, just not sure where you want to go next after that. Yeah, you, uh, you, 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 you do have a habit of basically flooring the topic up to a point. I mean, did, I, did I miss the, Did I miss one of the AM soliloquies? You did, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, so no. it was it was quite 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 a magnificent one. Um, oh dear. Well, well, what I was trying no, to lead no, in with that is, what I was trying to lead in with that, whilst we've created this complex and somewhat contradictory system of imperial government, how is the reaction throughout Europe to this? What is the reaction throughout Europe to this? The Swedish and the British are already at war with Napoleon by 1804. And all of a sudden, having already done so much to dis to damage the Holy Roman Empire, dismember its territory, facilitate a vast process of reform known as the mediatizations and the secularization of church land in Germany, now all of a sudden, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire is faced with a, another emperor in the form of Napoleon. Yeah. So in direct imitation, he tries to rescue his own dwindling imperial authority by making himself the emperor of Austria. Russia at the same time is, again, very much alarmed by Napoleon's new sort of continental ambitions and is receiving money 
from the British. Up until now, the British have been offering money and support to Austria and Russia, but it's only in 1804 and 1805 mm -hmm. where Britain is able to organize a new coalition. And again, Austria in particular has more than enough reasons to go to war with France after these consistent provocations. In particular, um, it is, I, I mentioned earlier, the assassination of the son of uh, the Duke of Condé, enlightened despot is, uh, again, given his name, the Duc de Angen. Um, his assassination in particular gave this, again, it seems somewhat contradictory, doesn't it? On the one hand, Napoleon is making himself the emperor of the French. On the other, he is killing the ancient aristocracy of Europe. So he would almost be a Jacobin and the emperor of the French simultaneously, inaugurating a new series of bloodletting for all the uh, established yeah. European royals. So all of these factors, and of course, Britain's own desire to unmake Napoleon facilitates the creation of this new coalition, which gives us the historical circumstances for Ulm and late Austerlitz. Well, you know how Napoleon... uh, Britain, Britain meddling on the continent, who could imagine that? Surely not. Well, in fairness to Britain, Napoleon understood this, and to prevent the coalition being formed, he had a massive military camp set up in Boulogne. Um, and it was only dependent on General uh, on Admiral Villeneuve and the Spanish being able to actually get their fleets out of the Mediterranean and into the North Sea so they could uh, transport the invasion of flotilla across into England. And there, you know, of course, he's establishing the Légion d'Honneur and uh, creating all his various marshals at the same time. Oh, so a lot of... Uh... So this is where we see the creation of the Marshal of the Empire, by the way. I believe, is it 17? Um, marshals are originally created from among his various generals. Now he's achieved the position of emperor. He's going to create Marshals of the Empire to go with yeah. it. Establish there's, this, much... um, there's a sort of grand ceremony, is there not, with the Marshals, where they're all given their, um, their batons. The batons. Yes, yeah. exactly. So a lot's going on in the camp in Boulogne, but the invasion of Britain never happens. So instead, Britain is able to divert attention away from this invasion by facilitating the formation of this coalition of these powers who have more than enough reasons to already attack Napoleon. There, so is, Napo um, there, there, there is, I think we should mention also uh, a plan which Napoleon, I think, quite seriously considered, which was to try and use dirigibles um or kind of proposed uh basically early heavier than air no uh, lighter than air craft to try and cross the channel yes and um, hot air balloons as well hot air balloon plan yeah which which didn't didn't uh take off one 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 one, one might say. <laughs> uh, there was also but, a plan um, to build a channel tunnel as well <laughs> yes um which was which was something that is that i didn't realize this until quite recently is something that has been proposed uh throughout history a great many times um it was it was it was quite it was on the lips of many victorians uh, this idea that you could tunnel under the channel which was I, I which i believe was rejected in person by king edward the seventh because he said why the hell would you want to to, to build a crossing between <laughs> between the, Britain yeah. and the continent you know why <laughs> yeah. on earth would you do that um but um so this this point about before we get on to, uh, to austerlitz the, the point about the perfidious british and their manipulation of things on the continent so the ang the angloid one, menace one one thing that staggers me is the sheer amount of spare cash britain seems to have to just throw around for basically 20 years i mean e e e even more the ju just just endless endless money um and i'm aware that britain's um empire did 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 Give it quite a, a quite a powerful financial stock, but still, do, um, just AM. Do you have any idea where exactly this obscene well, there's amount well, of amount of hard cash actually? Well, on came? the well, on the one hand, yes, there is um, a certain banking family known as the Rothschilds <laughs> who are supporting yeah. this. But again, more tangibly, um, the Dutch in oh, at, the no. at the culmination of the um, uh, Fleurus campaign, the campaign in Flanders. Um, before Napoleon was actually in power, uh, the Dutch were chased out of the Netherlands and there was the Batavian Republic was proclaimed on the old Dutch territory. Britain entered into a position of being the protector 
of the Dutch Empire, and with it was able essentially to receive yeah. a Dutch financing in exile from all those um, former Dutch financiers who wanted Napoleon to be ousted and for their territory mm. to be restored. And this is why Napoleon treated the Dutch so harshly and continually began to incorporate the Netherlands as aggressively as he could into the French Empire so he could try and clamp down on these payments. But from... he couldn't, couldn't get the bankers. The bankers slipped out. The <laughs> yes. But also it's important to note that after the you know, the seemingly sort of fatal blow of the American War of the Revolution. From 1783 until 1805, the British are expanding aggressively strength into, Indi strength, yeah. into India. Um, after establishing the uh, Bengal province, after you know Clive conquers it during the Seven Years' War, uh, the British are in Uttar Pradesh. They are surrounding Delhi. Uh, they have just won a war against Mysore. They've won a war against the Marathas, several wars against the Marathas. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they are essentially the dominant power, the hegemon. They, I mean, the official word is paramountcy had the paramount of yes. the British. And this is another reason why Napoleon wanted to attack Egypt and believed attacking Egypt would be so detrimental to Britain's plans for any reason to escalate the war so you could possibly form an alliance with the Sultan of Mysore or well, yes. with the Peshwab of the uh, yeah. Maratha Confederacy. This is, this, this is the really weird thing about the Napoleonic campaign in the Middle East is this constant idea that somehow he's going to win in the Middle East, then, then link up with with some indian prince or well again i think he probably had some um some alexandrian ideas you know sort of yeah. striking out east especially back then when his career was still um his trajectory was still well, slightly closer to though. home after the um uh, egyptian and syria campaign where france was technically at war with the ottomans uh, very soon after uh, around about sort of after 1806 uh, napoleon begins making overtures towards a ottoman alliance and persia was already allied technically with yeah. the french as well so yes I mean, this napoleon... is also um i mean when you consider um that you know he's fighting the russians as well the ottoman connection is more obvious well, it's slightly sort of too early for that, but um, for the, for this time at least, these are all sort of deliberately sort of anti-British um, measures, which of course have the act of preempting um, Britain into taking these extreme moves. But it's also important to note that despite all of this money and despite the growth of British, the British Empire, Britain is still economically hard up, and it's still having to borrow vast amounts of money in order to facilitate yeah. this uh, continuous series of wars. And of course, the fact that seven coalitions had to be formed in order to defeat napoleon well and, and truly <laughs> um it does leave britain in a precarious financial situation up until around the 1840s um so you know britain does pay a cost for it but nevertheless comes out on top um, i mean what, what one point that i would make with regards to the british spending is if you taught up you know all of the british spending throughout the napoleonic wars it comes to you know millions of pounds it is an astronomical sum but I, I can't imagine that it would have been much more than the cost of, say, keeping something like the Grande Armée equipped for 15 years or whatever, you know, over a decade. I mean, that's going to cost, that's going to run into the millions as well. Napoleon's sort of continental dominance yes. in the military the, system is not cheap, you know. Napoleon's and if the continental. And if the, and if the sorry. British, sorry, if the British can make that money go a long way and not have to deploy their own troops and bleed, then, you know, is, is it unwise? I mean, you know. No, it's not unwise. I, so, I mean, it's no. it's the old saying that the British Army is only a projectile to be fired off by the British Navy. So long as the <laughs> British are able to maintain maritime supremacy, yeah. they don't have to have such a vast army as the Grand Armée. And Napoleon can only sustain the size and indeed the supply situation of the Grand Armée by foraging and pillaging as if he were no better than Genghis Khan. And of course, after a while, this does have a major detrimental effect on the European economy. economies. Combine that with the continental system, which we'll get to after Austerlitz. Um, but here, now we're, we're finally here. Napoleon has decided, now that the Austrians and the Russians are at war with him, and he's facing a new continental struggle, and it seems that the invasion flotilla will not come. He will not gain access through the channel. Instead, he rushes to intercept the Austrians before they can link up with the Russians. So, Marcus, very briefly, before we get to Austerlitz, about sort of less than five minutes, hopefully, could you sum up the Ulm campaign and getting us to Austerlitz? So Ulm is is actually quite an interesting little precursor to um to Austerlitz, whereby uh, obviously with the onset of the War of the Third Coalition, um, and 
I believe at this point, well, no, but I know Bavaria is on the um, the uh, is in the sort of the midst of this sort of campaign in order to get to Austria, sort of more or less the Napoleon has to move his forces. So, sorry, I'll, sorry, I'll quickly summarize this. After 1803, Napoleon was able to win a lot of allies in Germany by supporting the secularization of church land. Uh, a lot of these secularizations were given to later Napoleonic allies, and indeed through Talleyrand's direct intercession, future Napoleonic ally, allies were given the position of electorate. So for example, ba Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria were all given electorate. Well, sorry, Bavaria already had an electorate, but you know what I mean. All of these new powers were given prestige and power and land as a result of Napoleon's direct intervention. And so by 1805, Bavaria had essentially activated its ancient hostility towards the Habsburgs and sided with the French. Yes. So um so the the basically the preparation that the that the or, the, or rather the Grand Napoleonic plan was to sort of make its way into into the Austrian heartland and in order to do so it had to cross a, um, well, firstly the the Donau or the the Danube, and then sort of subsidiary rivers such as the Isar and uh, and these um, sort of cities that sort of sit on the southern portion of Bavaria and sort of heading into um, into Austria, and uh, and, and um, the uh, the Austrian general Mack was uh, was basically deployed at this particular juncture, and what some um, and I guess what is indicative again of this sort of Napoleonic attitude that we've all sort of touched on earlier on in this video is uh is this sort of this obsession of napoleon for for tempo for speed for for aggression for movement and um and what it sort of amounts to has been this sort of triple pronged sort of forced march um and it's a little bit complicated because the the french army does sort of technically violate prussian territory it actually uh, i think around either augsburg or regensburg somewhere around that it it does cross over Bavarian territory, uh, sorry, Prussian territory, technically speaking. But um, the Austrians, rather than responding to it and and Mac falling back to protect his force from being outflanked, Mac is extremely passive, and Mac sits um, sort of in this guarding position where he was sort of on the southern uh, sort of periphery of the of the Black Forest, and and uh, and simply um, Napoleon's marshals are able to outflank to surround mac and to force him into battle at at ulm and um and there's i mean the battle of ulm itself i wouldn't exactly call it um it's not even a battle is it's, it? not really. it's not really it's not really it's not really a battle in some more there's a, a capitulation essentially it's um yeah. it's, i mean um, it, 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 it's a remarkable sort of strategic achievement from napoleon and there's lots of sort of um because of course mm. the mac is waiting for the the reinforcements from um the russians but they're still mm. you know hundreds like a hundred miles away if not more um yeah of course and the, and the austrian and the emperor hasn't sent any reinforcements north to help mac out either no there's actually lots of um funny ideas about just mm. why the russians were so far behind and why mac thought they were so much closer and one idea that i remember hearing which i thought was quite interesting was the idea that um at this time the russians still had a different calendar from everyone else yeah that's the <laughs> whole so, julian gregorian yeah. calendar thing yeah, yeah. This, this is mentioned in uh war and peace this um this kind of blundering russian army trying to get to the battle on time and failing um there's a humorous bit near the start where i don't know if this is if there's any this, this is true but um the commander of the army wants to make an inspection and the orders are unclear and half the army changes into full dress uniform and half the army is still in their their combat kit or, or their marching kit and so there's this whole sort of comedic scene where entire regiments are stood in the middle of a road trying to get changed into their uniforms and there's another <laughs> there's another there's a whole division of of cavalry trying to come down the road behind them and they're blocked and it's uh, just just complete slow grinding kind of that's good chaos just to for the I mean, I, army that wasn't there i guess um again another thing that you always have to note with something like the ulm campaign is just um how wonderfully um meticulous napoleon's sort of preparations were and how um he he organized in such a way that the his enemies couldn't exactly predict what he was going to do i mean you know when he was mm. when he was raising this sort of um this reserve force right i'm pretty sure he 
he raised it in in Dijon, and it was under the impression that it was going to be, you know, for a totally different purpose, or was again like a reserve force. And then, of course, you have the um, all of the troops up on the um, the camps that are supposedly prepared to invade Britain. And what does he do? He just strikes camp and has them turn and march. Um, and so, you know, he's always sort of, um, as you guys have said, uh, keeping the initiative, right? And and mm. compared to compared to someone like Napoleon, Mac just looks like this, um, you know bumbling fool which i suppose he was um mm. yeah so so all Al is a masterpiece though i mean you know he seizes you know he takes like thirty thousand prisoners seizes you know a vast amount of cannon and with nary a shot fired mm. i think it's one of his um one of <laughs> napoleon's most impressive feats i mean all myself ne'er a shot fired kind of true but allow, allow me to sort of ex explain this sort of a little bit is that leading up to the capitulation of Ulm, which is probably better than the word battle, um, is that with uh, with the actual plan, there's a, um, I'm trying to think of, of the actual order of battle per se, but um, uh, I think Lan, Ne, Sult lead their core sort of on this wide wheeling sort of far west of, uh, sorry, far east of, of Mac's position. Like I said, actually tra technically transgressing and Bernadotte's corpse actually transgresses prussian territory and wheels right around but um it, it's it, in order to hem mac in i mean uh murat's cavalry corps and uh, lan's uh, fifth corps actually engage at a, at a sort of relatively small battle of uh, Ver, Ver, vertingen pardon me and um and it's after this battle of vertingen that actually mac does attempt to cross uh, cross the danube but then he's uh, actually checked at um a small uh, again another small battle at Gunsberg by um by Ney's fourth corps which is actually sort of Ney is the sort of uh, uh, much closer than say Bernadotte's corps which is far along the line and with these one is a one is a battle to sort of hem in Mac and the other battle stops him from breaking out and once um sort of the trap is, is set and and um I think sort of by the 11th or 12th Napoleon's sort of plan has more or less worked and um and Saul's corps, the uh, corps actually reaches Landsberg, and um, and he's marching essentially towards Tyrol, which is Austria proper, which then essentially cuts off Max's retreat. And it's this astonishing speed of this this marching. Um, uh, you know, you got to think uh, Saul uh, on the on the twenty second of September is on this so called Ela line, which is sort of anchored around the town of Ulm, and uh, and yet by the eleventh of of um, of October, Mac finds himself surrounded. So this occurs in a matter of three weeks. And yeah, considering I mean, that I all this marching was by foot, it was an astonishing rate of speed in which it occurred. It's incredible. I mean, there's some stories of um, I think Davu, um, is it Davu? Um, he marched his men something like 70, um, 70 miles in 48 mm. hours, which is um, you know, it's it's incredible. I mean, again, you know, through the annals of history. I can only think of again something like Caesar's legions marching that kind of speed. It's a, it's an incredible yeah. speed when you consider the equipment and the baggage as well. Yeah. Um, marvelous, mm. marvelous. Well, I think yeah, only Genghis Khan has some sort of decisively Trump there. <laughs> but anyway, well, yeah, um, the whole army's on horses. But, but, but anyway, we have but, to. Be, but, but, we have but if we consider to, no, we, um, we do. All I all I want to say just on like on that comparison is that when we're talking about armies that have infantry, to move at this kind of pace as an infantry force is actually astonishing. It's all the, Abs the only point I want to make. Absolutely. And essentially, I mean, I believe it's at least one Napoleonic quote where I have defeated the Austrians simply by marching. Um, he goes into Vienna. Um, Very true. He's, yes, he receives the key to the city. He is welcomed, essentially. And he sets up his own government there in the Schonbrunn. He would do this twice, actually, after the, um, the War of the Fifth Coalition, during the War of the Fifth Coalition. And here, whilst in Vienna, the remnants of the Austrian army under the emperor himself, Francis, are combining with the forces of Alexander and Kutuzov. And thereafter, Napoleon makes the decision where essentially he has to go out um, in order to prevent the two emperors cutting off his supply lines between Vienna and Paris. And here we have the most decisive, and you could say the most famous victory of Napoleon, which is the victory at Austerlitz. Now, would someone like to very briefly sort of summarize the battle, and then we can talk about its significance? Um, well, um, Austerlitz is... Uh any fan of military history and the Napoleonic Wars has to love this battle because it's really a demonstration of a um, a bold plan. Um, it's up there with Can I for 
bold, offensive maneuvers, I think. Bold, and everything went perfectly. It was perfectly executed, and there are so many factors that could have gone wrong in the battle. Um, you know, effectively, the way Napoleon's plan for this battle is that you can see in the picture here, or the map here, that uh, on the right, that his right flank is intentionally left weakened. Uh, the Russians, or coalition forces, I should say, um, occupy a very strong position on top of the Prats and Heights. You can see the topography on the map. Um, so that's a very strong position. Napoleon's plan basically is to lure the Russians into attacking the weak right flank, uh, which will be then reinforced by Marshal Davout coming in from the bottom there. Um, and this plan is obviously contingent on him actually arriving on time, which we just had talk talked about with the uh, 72 mile march in two days. Um, and then once the, uh, once the Russians are lured into attacking uh, on Napoleon's right, he's gonna attack the center um, with this entire force and take the Prats and Heights, which of course splits the the uh, coalition forces into two, effectively. Um, and it, yeah, it's a very bold maneuver, contingent on lots of factors working. Um, basically but, because, you know, the thing is, coordinating maneuvers like this at a battle of this scale, um, you can't just call people up on the radio, right? This is one of the things yeah. that makes I think it's hard for modern modern viewers to sort of understand just how difficult it would be to move that many men but yeah, just to good. just to add a tiny yeah. bit of luck on this there was a mist yeah. lying over there the valley during mist. this time and then you see the assembly of grenadiers marching out of the mist towards the top of the pretzel and Kutuzov and all the generals including the emperor are still there assembling and all of a sudden hear the French infantry right yeah. in front of them with and they with have... with a triple ration of whiskey so with the <laughs> with the advance on the pretzel the, the Russian high command is basically scattered and they begin retreating and again what is left of the actual core army is being enveloped as the French take over the Pratson and the rest of the army has been drawn down into the slaughter. But it should be mentioned, however, it wasn't just that the Russians occupied the Pratson. Napoleon let them occupy yes. the Pratson. Is, he arrived is... earlier and um, allowed Russia mm -hmm. to assume the nominal high ground only to lure Russia down from that high ground, retake it, and then encircle the army and destroy it. This is the it. real, this is the linchpin of it, because you can look at pictures and you, you, you can visit there and you, you can take tours of, of the field and such, and you can see that basically those heights, um, any kind of the, the most simplistic strategic mind, the, 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 the most basic intelligence would say, okay, well, whoever commands that position is going to win because they completely dominate the area around them. And for Napoleon to basically look at this and go, well, we're going to have to do exactly the opposite of what we're expected to do and, and, and leave them to the enemy. I, I can't decide whether there's more kind of risky brilliance in that or more kind of shocking um kind of kind of pig-headedness in the allies not realizing that something was up essentially you know what what yeah. why is why is he left us this incredible commanding you know this the, the, what yeah. what why are we here and why is he there there were there doesn't seem to have been any kind of suspicion or or calculation on, on well the, um yeah. I, 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 just, I, I think there was some because it, um Kutuzov in, the, in particular Kutuzov, yeah, <laughs> yeah Kutuzov, Kutuzov said no 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 this is a this is a bad plan yeah. well Kut but, but... Kutuzov didn't want to advance uh once the armies were in place I believe he basically said don't do it it's full of mist we can't see what the, what the French are up to it's a trap don't 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 go yeah. um but I then I, say, I, um the yeah, allied commanders have over overruled him I believe yeah well, the emperor was... himself the emperor yeah. wanted yeah. wanted the glory of being able to claim that he had personally defeated napoleon in battle and yeah. of course the more humiliating thing is that after the battle napoleon said that i was essentially conducting the battle as if i were directing the enemy myself <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah which he effectively was i think um another thing that's very important to note about this battle because it it illustrates something about napoleon something that's said quite often about him is um he relies on his marshals and this is said in a way that um it, you know, it's often said in a way that sort of denigrates Napoleon or, or or detracts from his um his brilliance, and in a sense it does. But you must consider as well that um this is a man who intimately knows the capabilities of his of his marshals and knows 
their breaking point. And in this battle, as you've said, uh, I think Charlie said it, he deliberately leaves his right wing around the town of Sokolnitz. He leaves it weak uh, to lure the Russians Glaringly in. Glaringly so, weak. You know? Yes. And so who does he put there? Well, he puts Davu. And he puts, and Davu's only like 35. And, and Davu mans it. And I think Davu sends his cousin, whose name escapes me, um, to rush into the town with only about 3,500 men. And they take it. And they stand there for hours holding it against onslaught after onslaught um you know it's 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 an incredible display from um uh, from of, of sort of bravery and grit from the men on the right wing and and i think um it takes a lot of uh um guts from napoleon to let that happen and to not sort of um you know throw the reserves in in a panic for instance but again so, it shows yeah. you know not only does it um again in terms of you talked about napoleon relying on his marshals well i'm sorry but if you're commanding eighty thousand men the ability to delegate and know the capabilities of not yeah. only your high-ranking officers but the capabilities of your men is absolutely essential and yeah. again indicative of you know a brilliant battle commander so napoleon was able to ensure that those men did you know suffer vast casualties i think you know seven thousand of them were wounded and virtually all the casualties in the battle I, I would just like to say, um, in in the town of Sokolnitz, um, eleven of the twelve com um, French commanders were either killed or wounded in Sokolnitz. It was a hot place to be. And nevertheless, despite that, Napoleon was almost able to capture the entire Austrian army, the remnants, so much so that the emperor actually came onto the battlefield and made peace with Napoleon there and then. And it's there after this that we have the Battle of Pressburg. You know, the Russians had been defeated. But the army hadn't been captured. The Tsar hadn't been captured. The Russians were able to sort of linger on. And that will be a recurring theme in the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> yes. Linger on and retreat. But the Austrians were ultimately defeated. And Napoleon was able to gift his allies various possessions. So, for example, you mentioned uh, the essential Tyrol. Well, the Tyrol being an integral part of Austria. Well, it was actually awarded to Bavaria as a result of their alliance with Napoleon after this. But the Treaty of Pressburg and the aftermath essentially made the position of the Holy Roman Empire completely untenable. Of the states that um, weren't so loyal to the emperor, all the others were combined into the new Confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon issued an ultimatum to the emperor to abolish the empire, to essentially abdicate the throne. So ostensibly they would elect Napoleon as the new Holy Roman Emperor. And rather than do this, Francis II decided to abdicate and dissolve the empire based on his own personal fiat. So Napoleon was able to begin the expansion of the empire, not only into Italy, and not only to the left bank of the Rhine, but he was expanding the border into um, Germany itself, into the former territories of Charlemagne. And just briefly bring up this uh, earlier segment, which I had earlier. Well, By crossing to, uh, crossing Tyrol gives him a bridgehead across the Danube as well, in which to threaten Austria thereafter. Well, yes, exactly. That's precisely why. Not, and again, not mm. only that, controlling the Brenner Pass, controlling that vital mm. sort of mountain passage where you can transport troops between southern Germany and Italy, which is under the control of Eugène de Barnet. As a result of this peace treaty, Venetia is exactly. also awarded to um, Italy to augment this. Essentially, all of this mm. is designed to better cement French control and military access between their control over northern Italy and southern mm. Germany. Germany. And of course, as a result yes. of this, the coalition begins to collapse in the rest of Italy, and virtually all of mainland Italy is under French control by the end of 1806. But yeah, just I mean, on I this think, topic... Um, I was just going to throw in quickly that I think by the end of um, this battle, um, the Austrians had lost something like um, 2 million people in terms of the people that they ruled, you know, from the territories that they lost. So, yes, quite serious. Well, I think it's more just the psychological blow of losing Tyrol, which is one of the core sort of Austrian territories, and losing it to Bavaria, who had betrayed you and joined in with the French as well. It's just humiliation after humiliation that the Austrians are having to suffer. And of course, compared to the loss of Tyrol, the actual loss of the Holy Roman Empire is the greatest humiliation of all. Mm. And having to cede the nominal sort of headship of Germany from the emperor to Napoleon as the protector of the Confederation of the Rhine is, again, the greatest insult imaginable. And the fact that Napoleon was effectively able to conquer um, Germany by winning the smaller states of Germany to his side and allowing states like Bavaria to willingly supply troops to him. and form Doesn't he also have to recognize Napoleon as king of Italy, or am I mistaken? 
He has to recognize Napoleon as Emperor of the French and King of Italy, among yeah. other things. And of course, Ulm. Napoleon is crowned with the Iron Crown of Lombardy, right? Yes, Very this happens symbolic. before the yeah. um, the Ulm campaign in Austerlitz. But nevertheless, on top of all of this, not only does he have to admit the loss of these territories, he has to recognize um, Napoleon's elevation. And I just want to just briefly read this. By the early 19th century, there appeared to be a logic of Lotharingia. It became Napoleon's inner empire. Lothar, as the eldest son of Charlemagne, received the richest prize ever done. The provinces centered on the tr great trade axes of the Rhine, the Meuse, the Rhone, the Saone, together with the Valley of the Po. The conquests of the 1790s, Napoleon's included, had already brought this isthmus folly under France. But time, even so short a space of time as Napoleon's adventure allowed him, proved to be this natural heart of the empire. The Atlantic Revolution may have reorientated the commercial wealth of Europe, but one result of the Anglo-French wars was to reinforce the importance of this alluvial core of a non-maritime Europe. However fragmented politically the lands of the impossible domain, if extended slightly westwards to include northeastern France, this represented the most settled, relatively advanced part of Europe throughout the early modern period. Revolutionary Napoleonic aggression finally brought it together under a single political hegemony, if not quite under one ruler, forming the economic raison d'etre of the later continental system, even if the impact of the blockade deprived it of, deprived it of its natural coast coastal components. This was the natural center of gravity of the Napoleonic imperial enterprise, much more so than Napoleon's original political springboard of old France. So I think it's just crucial to understand in terms of grand strategy that this territory, northern Italy, southern Germany, northern France, is now the economic and military core of Napoleon's empire now. And this is going to become the center from which all of his later campaigns are going to be launched into northern Germany, into Austria, and of course, ultimately into Russia. Yes. Um, can I just ask very quickly, um, this, this Napoleonic seizing of Tyrol, is, is, is this the origin of the Italian claim on Tyrol from the it's Austrians? Well, it's very complicated. In in 1809, there all of the Tyrol is originally given to Bavaria, all of it, north and okay. south. And after 1809, there is a major revolt in Tyrol, which I briefly covered on the lecture on when was it, Saturday. And as a result of that revolt, the Bavarians were not able to put down the Tyrolians on their own, using their own forces, and had to rely on forces sent by Eugene de Barnet, who was the Viceroy of Italy. As a result of this, and what Napoleon believed the lackluster um, effect of the Bavarian administration of putting down this revolt, um, Tyrol was partitioned. The north of Tyrol remained with Bavaria, but the south of Tyrol, the modern day Trentino, which is essentially the modern borders of Italy in the Tyrol, were given to Eugene de Barnet. So, yes, that is the origin of that territory being associated with Italy. Okay. Just to... I know. I, I know it's a very hot, hot uh, button issue with Italians and Austrians. But well, yes, yeah, so it was oh, given. Oh, also, sorry, go I am. Sorry, just very briefly, it was given back to Austria after the fall of Napoleon yes. and the mm -hmm. compensation of territories in Bavaria, where Bavaria lost Tyrol, but it was awarded Franconia instead. And both North and South remained with Austria up until it was partly occupied by the Italians in the First World War and then awarded well, yes. to Italy after because the First World War. You have, you have all those many years of uh, Italian, I suppose you could call it revanchism, though I don't know if that would really be accurate. It's, it yeah. is yeah. sort of the word. Yeah, mm. yeah. Just, just, a, uh, just to answer Panem's question as well. It's one of those parts of the world too, where you just have a clashing is not the right word, but what becomes the what is the sort of frontier of two diff, different yes. groups or, or, or ethnos essentially, and they sort of and merge of in this middle ground, and then there's yeah. mingling. So, like in the in the in the what they call the uh, the Bolzan or the Alta Adige, you have this conflict, this sort of mingling of germanic people and northern italians who are obviously more germanically oriented anyway than what southern italians are obviously but it's sort of like another situation a bit like the sudetenland where sort of sudeti germans and czechs intermingle a bit like um uh you know say savoy where ethnic italians and ethnic french intermingle there's just a another example of that border region or even say um a bit like uh, you know the, the so-called polish corridor you sort of have poles and germans it's that same mm -hmm. example of these sort of two ethnic groups where they're the um the meeting line is there's just sort of intermingling on both sides of that line it just it always gets bloody <laughs> yeah. creating, Again, it's creating think, ethnic horrors beyond our comprehension. i think i think the problem is thinking of this in terms of ethnicity 
um, because of course this didn't wasn't even really a factor during the Napoleonic period. It only sort of belatedly became a factor for Germans in 1813, but it never became an issue for Italians who remained loyal to Napoleon all the way up until 1814. I think again, it's more the idea that people in Trent, say for example, were loyal to the emperor, whereas people south were loyal to the Venetian Republic. So again, it's just these particular loyalties, these particular allegiances to the various Italian states who owed different statuses depending on the emperor if you were a savoy or tuscany you were technically an imperial fief whereas if you were venice you were sovereign outright <laughs> um so again just don't necessarily think of this yet in terms of nationalisms because this sort of kingdom of italy it wasn't intended to be the creation of an italian nation state it was supposed to be the restoration of a part of the old lombard kingdom to help augment napoleon's authority indeed when you see the creation of these sister republics there isn't the italian republic there is the cisalpine there is the roman the parthenopean republic and of course napoleon would gladly annex more and more italian territory it didn't really make sense in terms of a logic of ethnicity but anyway Moving on. <laughs> does, does he not also, um, I don't know if this has been mentioned, but Napoleon makes um, Bavaria and Württemberg kingdoms. Right? Yes. Well, well, again, that's compensation for the fact that the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist. Um, being electors effectively makes them kings because it more or less puts them on par with Bohemia. And of yeah. course, Prussian, Prussia has already sort of uh, achieved a kingdom by alliance and then by military fiat under yeah. Frederick II. As a result of this, Württemberg and Bavaria are made kingdoms. And there's essentially a clamor from among the various German states to have their you know titles acknowledged. Yeah. You know, various dukes become grand dukes, such as that. I think Baden. this is something that, um, you know, Napoleon's quite good at, and he's and he, and he does it quite a lot. I mean, there's there's a, there's an anecdote that um when the um um the Elector of Württemberg asked for you know to be um, to be elevated to a kingdom, Napoleon said something along the lines of, "Is that all?" You know, because it it, it costs him nothing. You know, I mean, it's, it 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 means nothing to him in terms of material resources. It's just a name. Uh, well, that's just one aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, but again, it sort of shows the postmodernism, doesn't it, of Napoleon? Yeah, he thinks so nothing cynical, yeah. of elevating a elector to a king or a duke to a grand duke. It's simply a matter well, of I power mean, politics this, and bribery. This is, bribery. This is summed up for me by the fact that um, Bernadotte, Marshal Bernadotte, who is, I think, the son of a provincial notary or an artisan or something and uh, ends up the king of sweden you know well, it, well in, <laughs> fairness, in fairness to bernadotte um he was actually um awarded that title by the swedish nobility he wasn't imposed on the swedes um, as a king i mean bernadotte if anything i mean i know that sounds ridiculous but he gained the kingdom of sweden meritoriously and in opposition to napoleon rather than like morat who was it given still naples rather strange, isn't it? Well, yes, i mean, I mean you You've got like uh, I think it was Marshal Ney being made like Duke of Moscow or something like. <laughs> well, yes, very and Davu, strange titles. Yeah. Davu being created uh, Duke of Oyerstedt. I, I can't remember yeah. who was Duke of Marengo now, whether it would be Massena or Lan. Um, but but anyway, various titles. Or Napoleon were, making his brother King of Spain for God's sake. I mean, well, just, well again, just talking yeah. about that before we become to Joseph becoming King of Spain. Joseph was actually first made the King of Naples. That's right, but yeah. as a result of this creation of these new states in Germany, um, from roughly three hundred states in Germany, all of a sudden there are now will ultimately be 36 members of the confederation of the rhine and the largest one created what that will be created out of prussian territory is actually awarded to jerome bonaparte um one of napoleon's most sort of useless and feckless relatives and of course the netherlands the batavian republic is abolished and created as the kingdom of holland and that's given to louis um another relative of um napoleon and he's married <laughs> to hortense de bernay who is the daughter of uh, josephine and louis kind of goes a bit native doesn't he? oh yes he does he goes native <laughs> yeah. and then loses his kingdom as a result of it but anyway on to uh, Jena and Oerstedt uh, before we completely run out of time um, Prussia hasn't really been mentioned in the stream because Prussia has been out of the war with France in 1795 um, again completely in contrast to the sort of Frederican military archetype of Prussia Prussia was more than content to allow Napoleon and the French Revolution to go around annexing territories liberally while Prussia was able to sit back and gain territories in other, through other means so for Throughout the 1790s, Prussia was expanding at the expense of Poland as a result of the partitions in 1792 and 1795. When Napoleon annexed the left bank of the Rhine, the Prussians were like, yeah, that's fine, so long as we're compensated with territory within the rest of the Holy Roman Empire, which is what happens between 1801 and 1803. And by 1805, there is this idea that Hanover, which is being, you know, occupied temporarily by the Prussians, is now going to be simply annexed 
by Prussia as well, now that Britain is, you know, at war. And of course, Hanover is the uh, personal possession of King George III. So, you know, Prussia has done actually very well out of staying out of the conflict. It hasn't suffered military defeat after military defeat. And they're still wary, aren't they? I mean, when they, they, they say, you know, we'll come in to provide a mediation or something along those lines. And then I think it becomes armed mediation. So, yeah, they're sort of trying to claw them in. But of course, Marcus has already sort of mentioned that at one point, the French have already violated Prussian um, Prussian territory of Prussian neutrality. And after this, the Prussians have sort of had enough with Napoleon's double dealing, um, because, of course, Napoleon never sort of negotiates in good faith. He only ever negotiates what's good for France and is more than willing to um, betray an agreement once the material situation of the French improves. And, of course, the, the thing that sort of really um, snaps the Prussians in opposition is the fact that Napoleon is double dealing with the British. On the one hand, now that uh, Pitt is dead um, and you have the government of all talents, and I believe it's Lord Grenville, uh, who is pursuing a pro-peace policy with the French and trying to negotiate a settlement. Napoleon is promising handover both to the Prussians and the British at the same time. Um, The Prussians are also horrified by the fact that the Austrians have been defeated so quickly. They're also horrified about the fact that the entire southern and western frontier is now dominated by French client states. So they have to contrive a war however they need to do so with Russian support. When the Russians indicate that they will back the Prussians, the Prussians make the stupid mistake not of declaring war on Napoleon, but on declaring war on Napoleon prematurely, without the Russians having fully mobilized and being able to support their armies. And of course, always um, not anticipating the speed with which Napoleon is able to strike and mobilize his armies and crush the Prussian army before the Russians are able to join them. And there's a later quote, you know, when uh, I believe it's at Tilsit, uh, when he's talking to Queen Louise, who is effectively the ruler of Prussia. Again, Prussia has a series of weak kings after Frederick II. You have Frederick Wilhelm II and III. And Frederick the Wilhelm III is very much sort of dominated by his wife, Queen Louise. It's even through Queen Louise that we have the creation of the Iron Cross, um, mm. not um, a Prussian king. And of course, because well, Lu- Louise is not a fan of Napoleon, right? No, she really she's not. She's the like yeah. She's leader of the war party and her faction in court win out and are responsible for the declaration of war. And Napoleon, you know, is incredibly blasé about this. You know, how can the Prussians possibly threaten me alone um, without the Russians there to support? And as a result of a major sort of swift in- intervention, both into Saxony and into the just the area west of um, Brandenburg, um, sorry, the west area west of Brandenburg and uh, Thuringia and near Hanover, the French are able to intercept the Prussian armies, both Prussian armies, at the battles of Jena and Oerstedt. And they're often mistakenly combined into one battle, jena Oerstedt. And the reason for this is that Napoleon, even though he would create Davu as the Duke of Oerstedt, he didn't want Davu to take full credit for the battle. Because whilst Napoleon was engaged with von Hohenlohe, uh, the main Prussian army under the Duke of Brunswick was facing Davu and outnumbered Davu something like three to one, almost three to one. And Davu was able to defeat the main Prussian army single-handedly while Napoleon was engaged with the other army. But anyway, does anyone want to quickly go over the uh, the battles of Jena and Oerstedt after my very, very brief summary? Um, I mean, Jena, as far as I know, was a pretty um, textbook sort of um, um, victory. There wasn't a lot of sort of flair. I think um, Napoleon sent um, Lan with, I think, uh, and Ney with about 25,000 men up to the... Um, the sort of plateau the, um, in the middle of the field in the center. He sent them up forward um, and deployed them there early. And then I think he brought up um, um, Sue, uh, Marshal Sue on the right, and they swung around the right, um, captured this, um, this small town um, to the north of the battlefield, and then, ex- and then you know, swung, swung around to the left, and then you had... Um, I can't remember who was on Napoleon's left, but essentially, yeah, they they they, they outnumbered um, they outnumbered their opponents, and they just they just crushed them. I mean, I I can't I can't really think of any exceptional uh, exceptional moments in the Battle of Vienna. Although perhaps I'm I'm mistaken. You guys could uh, you guys could fill me in. I see all the glory at Auerstadt here personally. What yeah, what what is what. Oh, oh, sorry, Charlie. I just wanted to say, in regards to Yenna specifically, is that what what Yenna is indicative of is an ability of the French to rapidly mass, which 
again, we've talked, we've mentioned this more than once about sort of Napoleon's method of waging war. But, um, you know, and initially they were able to bring some, some 40, 45,000 men to the battle initially. But the build up uh, hits 55,000 and beyond, um, where the Prussians just simply don't react to French mobilization and, and French strength quick enough. Um, uh, no, that, that that's a good point. I don't know if we've talked about that because that's a sort of key part of Napoleonic success, isn't it? That he can um, absolutely because of, the, because of the core system. Mm. I mean, each core is essentially a, a, a self sufficient army, and so they can yeah. be marched totally separately, and then mm. yeah, they can come together and 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 um and centralize and but, mass but be, and but, yeah. And because of their proximity, they're able to march to each other's assistance really quite easily, whether it's portions of a core or separate core. In, that are in pro proximity, and they're able to send detachments. So, I mean, I mean, the Prussians have you know thirty eight thousand up against the French, and there's I think fifteen thousand men um, in in Weimar, which isn't that far away from where these battles take place. But they just don't move. They're not ordered anywhere. And but you know, and by the by the end of, of the day, you know, at Vienna, ten thousand men are killed and wounded, and fifteen thousand men are captured because the Prussians simply don't react to the yeah. the massing of the French and then yeah. the launching of their assault. And two it's, other, it's, sorry, two Charlie, other, um, I interrupted you. So yeah, well, the core system is really key to Napoleon's success um, because uh, it, it enables well for one reason it enables the armies to march you know in parallel along multiple roads as opposed to in one large road. And we see the speed factor at play in this battle because of course Napoleon sets up that initial early position we talked about, and both sides are receiving or expecting to receive reinforcements uh, during the battle. Uh, and of course, Napoleon's army masses first because he he always does that. And he ends up crushing the, mm. the Prussians. And of course, the core system itself is really what allows Davu um, to hold out against the vastly superior force in Arsted. Um, and I think we should talk about that battle a little bit since I think it's really yeah, the more I, impressive part. I, I, would just, I, I, I agree with you, Charlie, by the way. I would just I would just quickly note um, again with regard to the core system and why they can move um, so much more quickly. Of course, if you have um, less men marching down one particular road, and most of these roads would be dirt roads, the road itself is going to be far less churned up than if you have all of the troops there, and so they can move more quickly. And it also makes um, um, the the burden on the land around the marching men easier. You know, it's easier to forage for food. They're not all going the same route. They're going four different routes. And so, yes, it's easier to to pick up food and maintain supplies as well. Um, so it has a lot a lot of benefits. The core system, and that's why I don't think um, I think I think you know, Yena is a a great example of the the virtues of the Napoleonic system, and not so much um battle tactics. So Auerstedt? Um, yeah, Charlie, do you want to go on about Auerstedt? And I'll yeah, so tackle any comments uh, too? Or? Davu is supposed to participate in this battle that Napoleon has set up at Yena. Um, but uh, he actually encounters a much larger force than is expected. I mean, in some sense, um, mistakes are made here uh, by the French in terms of where they think the opposing force is. But I think that can be forgiven uh, in most cases as it's difficult to actually pinpoint where the enemy army actually is until you engage it. But really uh, Davu is, is engaging the main enemy force. And, you know, if, if he hadn't been able to, again, this, this is a case of morale being so important because under another commander, probably even any other marshal other than Davu, uh, who was possibly Napoleon's best marshal, the uh, iron marshal, right? French, yeah, exactly. The French would have been, completely routed and overrun and that entire core uh would have been uh captured and killed um and he, and he already has the reputation from austerlitz right of holding that right exactly and, it's yeah. it's davu uh plays a critical role in both these battles and yena would have really turned into a disaster um if davu um suffered a the massive defeat that he should have at our stead but he managed to um assemble his forces in a very long thin line um in order to uh defend uh, from outflanking maneuvers by the opposing force, and just like at Jena, I mean the the Prussians simply did not react quickly enough. They did not react decisively uh, to use their uh, initial advantage to any effect. And you know they, by all accounts, they really ought to have completely destroyed Davu. 
Um, but in both of these cases, um, it was simply a case of um, the Napoleonic forces either outmaneuvering um, or acting more quickly uh, than the opponent. Mm. Uh, there is um, there is one thing that I would bring up that I'd forgot to mention with regards to Yena is um, it is actually still taught today, I believe, in you know schools like West Point and Sandringham as a textbook example of um, not so much a brilliant victory, but how to follow up on a victory. Because Mura, with the cavalry, um, pursued um, the enemy ruthlessly. He pursued them for something like, I think, 10 miles all the way to Weimar. And then they stopped there and, you know, captured thousands, thousands of men, killed thousands. And so, and, and this is something that's um, absolutely key in warfare. I think, um, you know, it was one of the fondest principles of Stonewall Jackson as well over in the United States is, you know, once, you know, the battle isn't just won um, when the enemy are routed, you need to follow them and stay on them as long as mm. you can and make it a crushing victory you, you want to scatter them so that they can't um they're totally disorganized and that this is a textbook example of that a um, murat pursues them ruthlessly with the cavalry yeah that's mm. a good point that's one thing that distinguishes this battle from austerlitz where uh, at yana the prussians are decisively routed and pursued um yeah. which wasn't the case previously and that's what really uh seals this victory yeah, and, uh, it, it should be noted as well that the uh, famous uh, kind of legendary modern Prussian army with all its many uh, innovations, um, I believe, was basically kickstarted at this because mm. a council of defeated commanders came together and said, you know, how did how how have we fallen from the army of F Frederick? To, to to this to you this. know how are we how are we now completely defeated with, with nothing left so 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 they institute a system mm. of reforms and i i believe many of those forms were actually more or less complete by the end of the napoleonic wars um they're instituted mm. quite quite quickly they learned, yes, uh, they're, they're, yeah, they're instituted from a period of about 1807 until 1813 when yes. prussia is mm. able to switch sides join in with the russians and ultimately the austrians along with many other of napoleon's former allies who switch sides but yes that's a topic I for another time I, I believe it's those reforms that then carry on all the way up to the basically up, up to the first world war um, exactly and it's worth it's worth mentioning on uh, that on that note uh had the, the three major generals who were responsible for that are uh, neisenau scharnhorst and uh Clausewitz, who yeah. all partake in these in these battles here you're quite right um um can i just yeah. can i just know um a little anecdote about our state as well which i thought was quite comic when i heard it and it was um as soon as devu um knew how dire the situation was that he was facing the main force he sent a, a writer to Napoleon, and the anecdote goes that um, he he came to Napoleon, and Napoleon had just um, just won, and he's sort of flushed with victory, and he thinks he's defeated the main force, and the writer um, um, explains the situation to Napoleon, and Napoleon laughs in disbelief and says um, um, something like, um, "I believe your marshal is seeing double, sir." <laughs> I quite mm. like that one, and I believe also um, mm. that he didn't permit. Um, the battalions involved in the victory at Auerstedt to sew the name of Auerstedt onto their flags because he felt a little bit sort of threatened, <laughs> I suppose, by Davout's victory. So, mm. yeah, it, it really can't be emphasized enough um, how badly this could have gone because, yeah, Napoleon wasn't even fighting the main um, Prussian force. Mm. Davout ends up accidentally fighting it out of position and um, encircling it. Mm. <laughs> Incredible. It, you know, it, it, I don't know if he yeah. encircles it, but he at least routes them. And I mean, mm -hmm. Davout had no business routing that army. I mean, by all, if you th this map we're looking at doesn't really um, tell the story, I think, in a good way because it, it it's it's sort of hard to see. It, it doesn't unless you know how to read the symbols. Actually, I, I don't know how to read them correctly, but you can't really tell how badly Davout is outnumbered here. Um, it's sort of well, I got some numbers, Charlie. I can quantify it if you'd like me to. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers of the size of the corps, but I think it's like 25,000 men under Davu and then twice as that under uh, the Yeah, Prussians. so if you look at the relative strength of the two forces of the both battles, uh, the although the French start at 48,000 and manage to deploy 55,000, the theoretical strength, strength at the end of Vienna is 96,000 that are massed and uh, present on the battlefield when the Prussians eventually break. Um, 
whereas the Prussian numbers are, uh, uh, are like I said, initially 38,000, although they do manage to assemble a strength of 55,000, um, the French suffer five to 6,000 casualties at Yenna, whereas the Prussians lose over half their army. Their casualties are about twenty six to 27,000, which goes to show that they were just more or less overrun and, and eviscerated, um, you know, to suffer 50% casualties in what was a bit of a haphazard battle is is quite disastrous. But I do agree with you, Charlie, and so far that the great accomplishment is actually um, uh, at, at, at Auerstedt and, and Davout's defence. And what's impressive about it is that it does emphasise the importance of even if you're outnumbered and and you're and as a as a general you're you're encountering a numerically numerically superior force is that you is 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 as a commander's prerogative to ensure that morale is intact deployments are carried out that one's troops are as well positioned as they can be which thankfully Davout does but what actually works to his advantage is that um under um I'm trying to think the Prussian uh, commanders I think it was Mellendorf and uh, Klackro uh, uh, um Although the 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 sort of individual fights, the the sort of unit engage the unit by unit engagements with Deval's Davout's forces are quite bloody and savage. The Prussians don't actually attack in unison. The attacks are, are sort of disjointed and sporadic, and and units are sort of fed in piecemeal rather than attacking in a unified way. So Davout's actually able to direct reinforcements at the right time. He's able to hold the line. He's able to. Um, even as, as his own physical presence, be where he needs to be at a given point in time. And then once the pr uh, Prussian attacks lose steam, uh, Davout is able to go into the offensive. And like Columbo was saying, um, you know, the, the cavalry is able to be sort of dispatched and chase after all these broken units. And, and the point that you've both made is that when an enemy is broken on the run, the ability to, to send after them mobile forces that can chase them down and harry them and prevent them from digging in, prevent them from rallying, prevent them from establishing a defensive position is such a fundamental part of tactics, which, like you say, is still taught today in modern military academies. Okay. We have, sorry, we have to move on, I'm afraid. Um, if it's possible, I'm just going to try and summarize what the effects of this battle are. So the Prussian army, as we knew it, the inheritance of Frederick the Great is utterly annihilated as a result of this. They can only offer the Russians tentative backing in future battles. The Russians take on the heavy responsibility for defeating Napoleon throughout the duration of the War of the Fourth Coalition. Napoleon enters into Berlin and he proclaims the creation of a new continental system. Now, why this is significant, we've had the yes. Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Trafalgar has a lot destroyed the Spanish and the French fleets or for the most part. And we no we longer should not, have... um We should note just quickly that I don't think that that destruction at Trafalgar would have happened if it wasn't for Napoleon because Napoleon ordered Villeneuve, the Admiral, to engage. He was frustrated with Villeneuve well, for running around. Wasn't, it wasn't 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 it slightly more, more complicated because um i remember reading somewhere that um napoleon wanted to fire villeneuve he wanted yes to he wanted to replace him. villeneuve and yes. so villeneuve sailed his fleet out of port knowing that in a day or so the order to stand down would arrive so basically he was <laughs> getting getting out of yes. port before his yes uh, i mean it was premature and it, it, it yeah. doesn't matter but the point is um the spanish fleet and the french fleet for the most part are destroyed so they can't facilitate in any invasion of britain so whilst we see triumph on the continent in terms of the overall maritime picture, if we're seeing this as a Punic War between Rome and Carthage and Britain as Carthage, this is a complete disaster because France can never directly threaten um, Britain again. And now that um, Prussia has been kicked out of the war um, and Hanover is no longer in the um, in the possible sort of a place to be offered back to the British, um, the British essentially peace negotiations by 1807, 1806 have collapsed. And here we have the creation of the continental system. The continental system is a reaction to the British blockade, but it's more than just a reaction to the British blockade in the sense that the French want to establish a new system of economic warfare directed at the British under which every single continental possession would essentially refuse to trade 
with Britain, um, essentially block their ports off from access to the British to the Royal illegal, Navy. It was illegal to import any British goods. Yeah. Yes, and by extension, any maritime goods from the British Empire. And as a result of this system, it didn't, I mean, in, in practice, it would have meant that virtually all goods outside of the continent would have been denied because it was almost impossible to, um, <laughs> because all the goods were essentially being deported, even the American goods, say, for example, Indian goods, all sort of goods were being imported through the uh, British control of the maritime trade. So this essentially meant that the continent was completely locked out of trading with the rest of the world. However, the British blockade, which had been imposed on the rest of Europe, was far more effective. And all this led to was a huge amount of discontent and suffering on the continent and resentment directed at Napoleon, while the British operated a very effective smuggling operation, which yeah. got around the rest and, of the... Um, and, and of course, where, where are the British smuggling? They're smuggling to Russia and Spain. Right. And Portugal in particular. Which yes, we'll, which and so, we'll and so when you consider Napoleon's later forays into those into those countries, then you know. Yes, the continental system is essential in terms of understanding the now the grand strategy of the Napoleonic Empire, because in order to defeat the British using this, you could say possibly flawed uh, template of economic warfare, it requires every single major power on the continent to cease trading with Britain. And perhaps again, the first result of this is when we look at after the conquest of Prussia, and we extend this to a country like Denmark. Denmark wasn't on the side of Napoleon in terms of a technical ally, but Denmark was, again, favorable to Napoleon because Napoleon was at war with the Swedes and the Danish and the Swedes had a long lasting enmity towards each other. As a result of the possibility, just the possibility that Denmark would enter into the continental system and give its navy to Napoleon, the British bombarded the port of Copenhagen and destroyed the Danish fleet yeah. before the Danish could join in the continental system. And without a declaration of war. Without a declaration well. of war. So the is out again. <laughs> I mean, but again, but again no, but the, this is something that's very very important because i mean the french the french could have continued building ships forever but the problem is if you if you're building ships and you can't send them out into the water the second they're sent out on an operation they're they're sunk by the british what that means is that you cannot develop a core of competent seamen you know you 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 have no way of training them you know you can't train sailors on the land you know unless yes, you're you the essentially Romans, have, that is. Yes, but, you, 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 know. you, you essentially have just wooden boats that are just sitting there yeah um, and you have taking... you have men who who don't know how to operate during a naval battle or during a storm you know you have and the significant thing when you're destroying yeah. say for example the danish fleet you are actually destroying a navy not just a um, a fleet of boats effectively yes. and yeah. any and again with the spanish fleet again this is why napoleon begins to become so much more aggressive towards these various powers is because after the loss of the naval assets, they've essentially become useless to him in his mind. So he begins trying to, again, assert direct centralizing control to better, for example, control the smuggling and um, to act against the smuggling operations uh, being conducted by Britain. But again, this continental system is going to be essential in terms of understanding the Napoleonic grand strategy going forward, as I said, but as for what happens to Prussia, Western Prussia is occupied, Brandenburg, Silesia, etc. Um, and Napoleon directs his army to attack Sweden, who is still at war with France, and their various provinces, Mecklenburg, um, Pomerania, and also into um, go into Poland, which had recently been, as I mentioned, been occupied by the Prussians. And there Napoleon is received as a liberator, and he establishes a pro-French um, collaborator state in Poland called the Duchy of Warsaw, whilst also, I mean, in terms of the few uh, diplomatic victories that Napoleon is actually able to uh, win during this time. One is being able to detach Prussia's Saxon allies, which isn't very difficult because Saxony has always been sort of historically opposed to Prussia, um, but also getting the Poles on side as well. So out of Prussia, um, Napoleon has gained two new allies in the form of Saxony and the form of Poland. And from the Polish territory, he begins to attack the remnants of the Prussian army. The king has now fled from Berlin. He's going to Königsberg near the Russian border. And the Russian army is now fully mobilized. And um, the uh, Russian army is under the control of one uh, Levin August von Benigsen who tries to attack Napoleon and lift the various sieges, I believe, of Danzig, um, understanding that 
the French are actually faster than the Russians uh, and, and are at a point of intercepting and possibly cutting off the Russians um, from access with Königsberg and the rest of the army, um, Bennigsen is able to conduct a very effective retreat. And it's here where Napoleon attacks the Prussian army at the Battle of Ilau. And just to very briefly summarize before I allow everyone else to um, interject, the Battle of Ilau is a very costly stalemate, an effective defeat, a defeat for Napoleon. Um, so, he so, sent... Sorry, sorry, just to quickly jump in for a second. You mentioned there that um, the reason he could conduct the retreat is because he um, seized the French plans, right, or discovered the French plans. Well, I think it's actually the other way. I think it's the other way around, actually. I, I can't quite remember whether it's um, the French sort of discovering Bennigsen's plan and then Bennigsen being able to operate based on that assumption, I can't quite remember. But um, yes, the the assumption is that if the Russians pursued their campaign further west towards Danzig, that they would have been cut off by the French who were coming yeah, around them. Yeah. And in order to, pre uh, to prevent that, Bennigsen conducts a, an effective retreat towards um, Königsberg to prevent being cut off by the French. And it is here that the French attack um, Bennigsen at Ilau, and rather than the French being victorious, they're roughly evenly matched, I think roughly around 75,000 men on each side. Um, Napoleon sends Murat, for example, in a glorious cavalry charge um, to virtually no effect, costing you know, a huge amount of men. And when the Prussians finally sort of arrive to assist um, the Russian army, um, the Russian army is spared. They're able to conduct a retreat from the territory. So Napoleon has technically won the battle in the sense that the Russians are no longer there on the field. However, both sides have lost. I mean, I, mean, I think Napoleon could have lost anywhere around 25,000 men. Yeah, it was battle. just, it was a horrific, bloody slog in, in sort of swirling snow. Yes, yeah, so it was one of the, the yeah. bloodiest battles in all of history up to that point, one of the largest mm. battles in the Napoleonic period. And significantly, Napoleon felt so, again, wounded after this battle, which, again, it wasn't technically a defeat, but what it did was ensure that the war would carry on for another four months. And in the meantime, Napoleon was so uncertain that he would be able to decisively defeat both the Prussians and the Russians, that in order to prevent the Prussians, again, building up their strength and assisting the, rem the, rem the remainder of the Russian army, me under Bennigsen, and also to stop um, uh, sieging the various Prussian fortresses throughout East Prussia and West Prussia, Napoleon was even prepared to offer uh, a, a separate peace with Prussia, whereby they would just be given all of their territory back to them. That was how um, uh, sceptical Napoleon felt mm. in February of 1807, 1807 after the Battle of Ilau about France's chances. It's worth mentioning just two things, uh, a couple of quick points. One, um, when uh, Apostolic was saying that had uh, Benigsen not retreated from attempting to assist at Danzig, they would have been surrounded. It essentially could have been a rerun of all. So Benigsen was, you might say, wiser to these envelop ma these mass rapid envelopments that Napoleon had a knack of undertaking than, say, Mac did. And he responded accordingly and, and managed to extricate the Russian army out of Pr uh, West Prussia and keep a fighting force in the field in regards to elal it, it, i think the best way this can be described is that it's a it's a tactical napoleonic victory in that he takes the field but a strategic defeat in that so far again as apostolic said it's not a definitive a definitive end to the war napoleon's actually unsure as to the uh, well, you how... can't even describe it as a battle really i mean it's more like a bloody melee um, yeah, it is. Two, it's it's, two it's sides, a slog fest, truly. The two sides have at one another. Napoleon's yeah. aim is to destroy the Russian army. He doesn't mm. destroy the Russian army. The Russian army mm. is able to retreat in good order, having inflicted roughly equal numbers of casualties on, on both sides. So, mm. if anything, again, Napoleon gained nothing. Um, from Except the battle, field, but other, what was that worth? Field and a loss yeah. of a huge number of men in the process, and of exactly. course, a huge, you know, damage to his prestige and the invincibility mm -hmm. of the many, many, many historians have speculated as to why Napoleon didn't really seem to show much tactical um, in, ingen, ingenuity at all. He, like mm. as you said, it was a slugging match. He just, he just sent wave after wave of infantry frontally against prepared Russian defenses and mm. uh and emplacements that's a good, and, that's and, a good and, point and, panama because it's worth mentioning that the russians have started digging defenses in these battles because of that exact reason it's a good yes. point um mm. yeah, which so is in napoleon's movements and of course the french army was quite badly suffering by that point as well and mm. i believe there are also issues with the fact that 
the army had been enormously beefed up with reinforcements from Germany, Poland, um, lots of e Eastern European countries. There were Spanish contingents as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this led to quite a variance in the quality control and command ability over these troops. Yeah. Um, I think there were also there were also some Mamluks, if I recall correctly. Yes, I believe the Mamluks. Those are the uh, that's the Imperial Guard contingent. So together yeah. with the the Young Guard and the Old Guard, you have the Imperial Mamluk cavalry, which will later be employed in Spain. I think I think uh, I think it was at Austerlitz where uh, Mustafa, one of the leaders of the Mamluks, said, "If I had found um, if I had killed the Archduke Constantine, I would have brought I would have brought you my I would have brought you his head." And Napoleon just turned around and said, "Shut up, you barbarian!" Which I think was <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic was anecdote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the effect of this battle is that there is a huge pause in the Napoleonic campaign, and there is ambiguity as to whether Napoleon is going to win a decisive victory. And yet he does win a decisive victory against the same commander, um, Bennigsen, at the Battle of Friedland. How do you think Napoleon was able to take such a disastrous assault at Elau and transition into a decisive victory at Friedland? Well, it's really because the, the Russians made embarrassing blunders at Friedland, um, frankly. Uh, they just put themselves in a very dangerous position in order to attack one of uh, Napoleon's corps and ended up fighting a pitched battle on the wrong side of the river. I mean, it's it's really the Russians' fault for placing themselves in uh, completely needless danger, um, and they effectively just gave victor to Napoleon. It also, it's worth mentioning just just pre uh, preceding the Battle of Friedland is a sm much sm well a smaller battle at Heilsberg where. The Russians uh, under Bennigsen actually commanded a very strong position um, in the in the context of a strong fort with extensive earthworks, defensive positions, you know, uh, uh, dug in artillery and whatnot. And uh, Lon and uh, Murat are able to dislodge uh, the Russians. It's an inconclusive outcome, but uh, for the loss of fifteen hundred killed and ten thousand wounded, the um, the Russians suffer um, uh, about fifty percent more casualties and are somewhat dislodged. And it's the uh, and it's the battle at Heilsberg that actually throws off Bennigsen and sort of makes him. Um, although it's worth mentioning that at Friedland, half the reason he makes a few mistakes is because he's actually ill during the course of the battle. But like uh, Charlie just said, he's actually on the wrong side or the, the bulk of his forces are on, on the wrong side of the river. He can't extricate his forces. And and the decisive battle that Napoleon was sort of hoping for at Elau, he gets at Friedland. He, the Russians uh, are caught napping on the wrong side of, of, um, of the river and can be attacked and defeated in detail. And the effect of Friedland is, despite Elau, which has basically been undone by Friedland, it is effectively the culmination of all of the great sort of campaigns, the great battles of Napoleon's career. And after Friedland at Tilsit, we effectively reach a zenith of Napoleon, where Napoleon has, for all intents and purposes, conquered the better part of continental Europe. The only sort of power which is sort of left to oppose Napoleon is Portugal. Um, even Spain has to be remembered as still technically an ally of France at this point, albeit is a uh, an ally which is increasingly sceptical of Napoleon, and for good reason. After Tilsit, in comparison with his earlier sort of grace towards Prussia, having survived and endured the remainder of the alliance with Russia, Prussia is treated very, very badly as a result of this peace. So much so that Talleyrand actually switches over to um, console uh, Queen Louise and the uh, the Prussian court. And as a result, Napoleon bitterly keeps Talleyrand out of the proceedings regarding Prussia. Effectively, Prussia loses half of its territory, half of its population. A huge amount of um, its German territory is awarded, wealthy German territory, is awarded to Saxony. And the rest of it in Westphalia and Hanover is given to Jerome Bonaparte as the new kingdom of Westphalia, while the vast chunk of the Polish uh, partition 
um, in Posen and Warsaw is given to the new Duchy of Warsaw. The only sort of consolation Napoleon gives Prussia is the connection between East Prussia and Pomerania in West Prussia. So even though Prussia is probably probably as reduced as it could be, it remains a continuous territory, albeit small and bereft of all of its Western provinces. It still has its core in Brandenburg, Pomerania, Prussia and Silesia. But nevertheless, um, Prussia of all the powers will not only suffer this humiliation, but his army will be reduced from something like 300,000 men to 40,000 men as well. So any aspect of the Prussians are going to remain a great military power under Napoleon's continental dominance is going to be completely dissuaged. dissuaged. And as a result of this, you mentioned with uh, Scharnhorst and Eisenhower and Clausewitz, we see a almost secret attempt by the Prussians to reform their administration in spite of Napoleon under these horrific circumstances which have been imposed post Tilsit. And this is one of the reasons why Talleyrand begins to break with Napoleon, but perhaps the decisive moment where Talleyrand breaks with um, Napoleon is over his treatment of Spain. Um, I, I know you wanted to talk about this Panama hat. Sadly, there isn't um, enough time really to go into Spain. So I'll that's, very- That's no trouble. We can, be, so we, we very, can always do it another day. Yeah, yes, the, very... cl the clock has struck midnight. I need to go and you have to turn into vampires. Yeah. Oh dear, you're, yeah. you're, you're on to go your metamorphosis. Scotch so transformation go... rituals. Away, away with you, Columba. It's been lovely to have you on. Are we? <laughs> All right, are goodbye, gents. It's, 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 it's been a pleasure, okay? Good night. Good night, ladder. Night, Ciao. Night, Ciao. Um, but I think Spain probably deserves its own stream. Um, well, I've done, I've done a lecture on Spain. You've done Spain. But, uh, well, there you are. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I haven't had a discussion on the Peninsula but, War. But, but just again to... Uh, to the Peninsula War is a, is a heck of a discussion in its own right, I'll oh, yes. say that much. Yes, absolutely. And maybe we'll do a discussion on the Peninsula War. But just for the pertinent facts in terms of Napoleon, Napoleon on a grand strategy, I've already mentioned that the great Spanish fleet. I mean, even though the Spanish army wasn't particularly illustrious throughout the 18th century, Charles III had ensured that Spain had a great maritime presence connecting it and ensuring that the Spanish empire remained a viable and economically vital entity whilst the French were losing their empire and whilst the Britain had, lo Britain had lost the 13 colonies to, um, uh, to, to the American Revolution. So Spain, ostensibly again by the beginning of the 19th century was still a great European power. Nevertheless, it had been under the service of an incredibly corrupt administration dominated by the Queen and de Godoy, uh, the Valido of Spain, the favorite, who had essentially allowed the system of government in Spain to be co completely sort of riven with corruption. Um, and by the time that um, Napoleon was now seriously contemplating the implementation of his um, continental system to defeat Britain, he now looked on Spain as a liability without its fleet. He had already taken away possessions which had been gifted to Spain in Italy and instead decided, well, I'll, 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 piece, I'll, I'll try and form some sort of a fog off in um, a partition of Poland. I'll give them uh, Porto. I'll give. I'll give. I'll give to Godoy the Kingdom of the Algarves. Um, <laughs> but everything else will be lost to Spain because I really don't care. They're just there to administer the Iberian Peninsula as my minions. Um, and this uh, campaign is organised under Junot to quickly take over Portugal. Uh, take control of the royal family, the treasury, and more importantly, the navy. Juno arrives in Portugal, he occupies the bulk of it, but the navy, the royal family, and the treasury escape to Brazil. And it's after this point that we see Napoleon undergo perhaps one of his greatest acts of treachery throughout the entire Napoleonic period. Even though the Portuguese had been defeated, and they had been defeated with Spanish assistance on the promise of Spanish, um, uh, Spanish partition of Portuguese territory, after the conquest in the winter of 1807-1808, Napoleon still sends more and more and more men into Spain, and they begin to occupy various garrisons. They begin to occupy garrisons in Catalonia, in Valencia, in Navarre, um, in Valladolid, around um, Madrid itself. Saragossa as well. Saragossa, and all of these, mm. all of these major fortresses are still occupied by French troops. To such, you know, confusion among the Spanish that commanders, you know, some of them just let the French in, some of them fire on the French as potential occupiers. And of course, de Godoy is so useless and corrupt, he doesn't respond effectively. So, and of course, during this time, there is a rising, there is a mutiny in Spain against de Godoy and the king, King Charles IV. He is removed and all of a sudden, Spain is now in the midst of a succession crisis while effectively being occupied by the French army. Um, the escalation of the mutiny sort of reaches a pitch, a fever pitch in the on the 2nd of May, uh, 1808. 
the Dos de Mai um, uprising, uh, where the Mamluks are used to uh, crush um, the Spanish mutineers and the, the popular rebellion there. And while this is all um, taking place, uh, the heir to the throne, who will later be Ferdinand VII of Spain, and uh, King Charles IV are traveling in their carriages to Bayonne on the Fr Franco-Spanish border ostensibly so that Napoleon can mediate the succession dispute and choose who is going to be the King of Spain. Instead, when they arrive there, the King of Spain and the would-be King of Spain are informed that they must abdicate and I'm going to give the throne of Spain to my brother Joseph. Um, they are interned in Napoleon's, uh, in Talleyrand's chateau and the Spanish administration is handed over to a bunch of um, collaborate, uh, collabor uh, collaborationist uh, notables from the Royal Council. They give authority to Joseph, and it seems like a fait accompli. Albeit a month later, there is a massive uprising. The Spanish are uh, victorious at the Battle of Balian, and very soon after, Joseph is chased out of Madrid, and Napoleon has to see to affairs in Madrid personally and temporarily try and arrest the situation from being a complete rout of the French army. So by 1808, 1809, the French maintain a vast garrison in Spain, but they're now facing off against a protracted guerrilla war. And later, this will involve a major intervention by the British, which will only escalate towards complete French defeat in 1813. But in terms of how this sort of enters into grand strategy, obviously, in hindsight, we can say this is a great mistake. But I think um, I just want to quickly go over and take a break from this talk about battles to talk about Talleyrand. Talleyrand had been uh, one of the main, the central players in the French Revolution. From the beginning, uh, he had been responsible for essentially the clergy's plans to seize control over church territory and uh, church possessions and give it over to the revolution, which leads to the new currency, the assignat, which leads to hyperinflation. He then becomes the, uh, the principal sort of foreign minister of the directory and of the consulate, and of course later the empire. And he is one of the principal figures in terms of the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. And up until this point, he has been loyal to Napoleon. In fact, it's almost impossible to see how Napoleon could have come to power without the support of Talleyrand. I have um, a couple of pages here from Talleyrand's memoirs, which really talk about his um, uh, switch, his about face. And this begins with the harsh treatment of the Prussians at Tilsit. During all the time I had charge of the management of foreign affairs, so after Tilsit it should be mentioned that Talleyrand technically gives up the position of being foreign minister, but he remains Grand Chamberlain of the Empire and is a major sort of courtier of Napoleon, even though he is not technically the foreign minister anymore. I serve Napoleon with fidelity and zeal, and of course, if anyone wants to interject, please do so. As to the Emperor, he adhered for a long time to those views, which I considered it a duty to suggest him. Those views were based upon two considerations. To establish for France monarchical institutions which should secure the prerogatives of the crown and the authority of the sovereign by keeping them within just limits. To spare Europe in order that the powers might pardon France her achievements and glory. Essentially the idea that France can only expand so far and its army can only reach a certain peak of glory before the coalitions become inexorably opposed to France, which is of course what happens. In fact, there's an earlier quotation from Talleyrand from around 1802 with the Treaty of Amiens, where Talleyrand talks about this is the, the height of France. We can't expand any further without eliciting more coalition support, which of course is very soon what happens after Napoleon annexes Piedmont. In 1807, Napoleon had already for a long time passed. It must be owned, kept away from the path on which I had done my best to keep him. But I had been unable until this, until the occasion which now presented itself, to give up nominal direction of foreign affairs. It was not so easy as one might suppose to re uh, resign a post, the duties of which brought its occupant in daily contact with him. Hardly returned from Tilsit, Napoleon devoted all of his attention to the executions of a design on Spain. The intrigue of this undertaking is so involved that I have thought it necessary to explain it separately. I must only say here that the emperor, clinging to the belief that I approved of this project, chose precisely the estate of Valence, my estate, to become the prison of Ferdinand VII, his brother and their uncle. But neither these princes nor the public were deceived by this. He succeeded no more in making people believe that in this I was his accomplice than he did in the conquest of Spain. When the Emperor Alexander and he had separated at Tilsit, they promised to see each other again soon. This was a promise Napoleon had no desire to keep, but at least unless the state of affairs made it necessary. 
But when General Junot had been driven from Portugal by the English, when General Dupont was forced to capitulate at Belen, and when a general insurrection in Spain gave prospects of a resistance which might be of long duration, he began to fear that Austria might profit by these circumstances and felt the need of making more sure of Russia's intentions. He then grew anxious to see Emperor Alexander once more and invited him to an interview to take place at her foot. Although already very cold with me, he wished me to accompany him. He was persuaded that I might prove useful to him, and that sufficed him. The numerous and piquant incidences, incidents of, it, of the interview form an episode by themselves. I have thought it advisable to make Napoleon a separate chapter of them. The intention of Napoleon, however, must find a place here. His purpose was to induce the Emperor Alexander to make a special alliance with him against Austria, that which he had concluded at Tilsit, though General was particularly directed against England. If he had succeeded at their foot, he would, under some pretext easily invented, have sought a quarrel with Austria, and after a few military successes, he would have tried to do with it as he had done with Prussia. So for context, we're talking about the Treaty of Tilsit, which had divided Prussian territory. Prussia had lost half of it, and now with the subsequent conventions, Prussia had lost the ability to wield an army effective enough to actually oppose Napoleon, while Emperor Alexander had been effectively induced into forming an alliance with Napoleon and joining the continental system. There were also um, other sort of peripheral ideas that Russia and France and Austria would possibly partition the Ottoman Empire amongst themselves. And we see something like the restoration of the Greek plan, Marcus, which we discussed in an earlier episode. To complete cooperation of Russia would have thoroughly enabled him to reach his goal. Having a very small opinion of the genius and will of Emperor Alexander, Napoleon hoped to succeed. His intention was to intimidate the Tsar at first, and then to arouse both his vanity and his ambition, and indeed it was to be feared that on these three points the Emperor of Russia might prove only too accessible. By the star of Austria, who had always been persistently misjudged, should inspire the Emperor of Austria with confidence and not cause the Emperor, Emperor of Alexander to lose that he placed in me. I have seen, in him, I have seen him several times now in private at Tilsit. I saw him nearly every day at our foot. Our conversations were at first of a general turn concerning the common interests existing between the great powers of Europe, the conditions on which the ties, which is important to preserve between them, were to be broken the equilibrium of Europe in general, the possible consequences of its destruction. Then gradually our conversation turned more particularly to the states whose existence was necessary for this equilibrium, especially Austria. These conversations put the emperor in such a state of mind that the coaxing, the persuasion and the threats of Napoleon were a dead loss. And that before quitting Erfurt, the emperor Alexander wrote in his own hand to the emperor of Austria to reassure, reassure him with regard to the fears which Erfurt interview had caused him. It was the last service I was able to render Europe as long as Napoleon continued to reign, and this service, in my opinion, I was also rendering to himself personally. And he then goes on, when we talk about this, we talked about um, uh, the campaign in Spain. During the campaign in Spain, there is a brief moment where it looks as if um, Napoleon may have died, and of course Napoleon doesn't have an heir. There has been a contrivance to um, create an heir by Hortense and his younger brother Louis, um, but at this point I believe Louis Napoleon was only one and he would die very soon afterwards of diphtheria. So arousing this possible um, succession crisis following the death of Napoleon in Spain, both Fouché and Talleyrand negotiate for a possible um, succession, possibly involving Murat or Joseph Bonaparte or another such figure uh, who would have been effective at holding on to power. Nevertheless, after hearing about this, Talleyrand is accused of treason, and this leads to the famous dressing down where Napoleon arrays the Grand Chamberlain before all of his marshals and says, I will break you like a glass. You are shit in a stilk socking. And one of my favorite sort of quotes from Talleyrand, it is a pity that such a great man has been so badly brought up. And this, of course, leads into his general disdain, that of Talleyrand, towards Napoleon's potential treatment of Austria in the eventual war of the Fifth Coalition. While determining to no longer take part in anything done by Napoleon, I remain sufficiently acquainted with current affairs to be able to judge well, uh, well of the general situation to calculate what must be the date and veritable nature of the catastrophe which appeared inevitable, and to seek means of warding off from France the evils this must produce. All my antecedents, all my former relations with the influential men of the different courts assured me to facilitate from being informed of all that took place. 
but I must at the same time give to my manner of living an air of indifference and of inaction, which shall not offer the least ground for continual suspicions of Napoleon. I had the proof that on one already one ran risks by no longer serving him, for on different occasions he showed great animosity toward me, and several times publicly gave way to violent temper. This did not annoy me, for fear has never entered my nature, and I might even say that the hatred he manifested against me was more harmful to him than to me. If I were not anticipating an order of time, I would say that this hatred maintained, but ma ma maintained me in my independence and decided me to refuse the portfolio of foreign affairs, which he offered me again with much persistence. But at that time this offer was made to me, I already regarded in his fine role as finished, for he no longer seemed to apply himself to anything but destroying the good he had done. There was no longer any possible transaction for him with the interest of Europe. He had outraged at once, and at the same time, kings and nations. Whatever need people in France felt of deluding themselves, they were forced to recognize in the continental blockade, in the natural though dis, um, dissimulated irritation of the deeply wounded foreign cabinets, in the sufferings of industry bound by the prohibitive system, the impossibility for a state of things which offered no guarantee of tranquility for the future to endure. Each victory, even that of Wagram, even was only an obstacle which more uh, which to, more to the strengthening of the emperor on the one hand the archduchess he had obtained was only a sacrifice made by austria due to the bound of due to the bounds of necessity so here what talleyrand is effectively saying is that every victory was simply prolonging the inevitable all of Europe was effectively suffering from Napoleon's continental system and that every move that Napoleon made in order to buttress his own authority was now coming at the expense and indeed the resentment of all of his so-called allies and client states and that any made or sort of proactive measures, say for example taken by Metternich, uh, Francis II and the Austrian court to marry Napoleon to Mary Louise was if anything just a measure to gain time to allow for some sort of temporary restitution of prestige and authority and of course this is of course what happens with austria where austria is able to maintain an army as a result of these measures but these are only temporary measures of appeasement while all the nations of europe are organizing and preparing their resistance and of course he doesn't mention prussia here but he's very much concerned that had austria been dealt with like prussia had that Austria would become far more hostile to French designs. And of course, the reaction will be far greater. So if anything, I think Talleyrand here is indicating and anticipating what will happen, that as soon as the military situation against France turns the other way, all of the allies that France has normally created will begin to oppose her. And this is obviously what happens when we talk about uh, Aspen, Essling, and Wagram, where we will leave our conversation. But I understand that I've talked for a long time. So does anyone have anything to say on anything that I brought up regarding Talleyrand? Um, other than to suffice to say that I think Talleyrand makes a, a good, an, an interesting and indeed a factual observation that uh, Given the status of Great Britain as the sort of leading maritime merchant power of the of the era, that uh, economic times would have been trying for these, uh, I suppose in inverted commas, allies that Napoleon has established across the continent, either by uh, some degree of cooperation or, in the case of say Prussia, just absolute force. You could you could put Austria in the same category. And uh, and that Napoleon eventually put himself in a position where he needed to continue his meteoric rise and ensure continued success because the moment the the uh, I'm trying to think of how to say this um, you know his stranglehold on power would be shaken and would be um, compromised as did happen historically with a combination of the Peninsula Campaign. And the invasion of Russia of 1812, um, there would be plenty of people, both uh, elites in their respective countries and populations writ large, who were growing discontented with the situation. And uh, you might say the fertile ground was being established for the discontent against Napoleon to come to fruition, as it historically did. I think Talleyrand, in that respect, was uh, right on the money. Well, I think um, a lot of people, you know, quite rightly say 
that Talleyrand was, you know, an incredibly corrupt figure. And he was, of course, receiving bribes, not only from the British, but um, also the Russians. But it should tell you quite a lot that it is at the height of his power, just after Tilsit, that Talleyrand decides that he can no longer serve as foreign minister, rather than when things begin to turn very badly for Napoleon, when so many of his allies begin to jump ship. And in this way, I think, despite you know, Talleyrand's you know, disgusting moral character and the fact that he is willing to collaborate with foreign powers for his own benefit, it does, again, demonstrate a perspicacity which is lacking in almost any other figure who has close proximity to Napoleon and remains loyal to him throughout this entire period because he's even able to see the fall of Napoleon before Spain and even during the planning of the Spanish expedition, the treachery and the locking away of the royal family using Talleyrand's own um, chateau as if to add insult to injury for Talleyrand's opposition to it. Again, I think it demonstrates the pettiness of Napoleon that, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you offer consolation to the Queen of Prussia, so I'll shut you out of the negotiations, negotiations, negotiations at Tilsit. Sorry, I'm stuttering quite a lot. Yeah, I, and I, uh, you oppose yeah. the preparations for my brother being placed on the throne of Spain, so you will host the Spanish royal family in exile. No, I, I totally agree, and it's a pity that uh, a well-educated man as Napoleon was that he might have actually learnt from, although arguably perhaps Caesar was too much the other way where he's sort of too trusting and too um too forthcoming uh in 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 such a respect whereas napoleon had a knack for this kind of pettiness which he demonstrated in spades with talleyrand you know as you say if if talleyrand was consoling the queen of prussia i mean does it really matter if he does it but napoleon would ha being napoleon took umbrage with it didn't he well of course i mean i mentioned the dramatic dressing down which is one of the most sort of uh infamous moments in Napoleonic history where he does, you know, uh, call uh, Talleyrand um, shit, in a silk, uh, shit, shit in a silk stocking in front of um, stocking in front of the, the entire sort of assembly of the Napoleonic court and uh, Talleyrand just sort of stands there dignified, taking the insult, then uh, offering a subtle criticism of him as he sort of leads. Um, mm -hmm. but, but again, I, a, I'm less interested. A witticism, one might say. Yes, I'm less interested, though, in, um, again, Napoleon's anger and temperament more so than his judgment. And in both cases, uh, Talleyrand is able to perceive that Napoleon is lacking both in his temperament and in his judgment in terms of his inability to genuinely win over allies. And this is a consistent theme and failing in the grand strategy of the Napoleonic Empire, where Napoleon does not have allies. He has vassals and none was, you know, we talk about Prussia and we talk about Austria, but Spain of all of France's allies, Spain willingly joined in with France from 1796 onwards. Spain suffered through, you know, defeat after defeat and the confiscation of any potential gains and the loss of her navy and eventually the loss of her overseas empire. And what does she gain for this? She gained the occupation of her territory and a protracted civil war slash independence conflict against the French. So if anything, it is the worst example of Napoleonic treachery. And of course, Talleyrand also talks about this quite extensively. I would Napoleon's agree. love of deceit as a political tool. And of course, knowing this, you know, deceit as a political tool only goes so far. But once everyone knows that you employ to I mean, he did the same with Prussia, um, mm. playing both sides, playing Britain and playing Prussia for the same territory. But um, a deceit only goes so far and eventually people will turn against you, which, of course, is what happens with Napoleon. And the first Quite. nation to really turn against Napoleon very soon after, even before 1812, but it's actually seldom mentioned, but it's very significant in terms of the overall decline of Napoleon, which is after Napoleon directs his personal attention to Spain. He comes back and having, of course, having to leave vital sort of troops in Germany, in Spain as garrison troops, um, all of a sudden the French position in Germany looks tenuous for the first time in four years since the creation of the new Napoleonic order in Germany post Austerlitz. And Austria is hoping for a general uprising of the German nation against Austria. If anything, it's supposed to be a patriotic uprising. And there are overtures made to both the Tsar of Russia, essentially the diplomatic triumph of the Austrians during this time, and again, through the implicit backing of Talleyrand, is that Russia despite being an ally of Napoleon, remains neutral in this conflict, while the Austrians failed to win the Prussians on side as well. And I think, again, perhaps with Prussia, that was the correct move because it was a premature attack in hindsight. Nevertheless, the Austrians have been preparing an army of, gosh, around 600,000 men. I mean, essentially, it's the largest army that Austria had ever been able to assemble during this entire time. And this is the fourth 
war that they've been involved with now with Napoleon. Um, and this is again supported by British money and levying a vast number of, you know, a vast multinational army of Czechs, Poles, Serbians, Slovakians, Germans, Croatians, Hungarians, Romanians, etc., um, into a new army. And despite you can say the ragtag nature of this army, um, it is able to put up a decent fight against Napoleon. Of course, upon the declaration of war, Napoleon, with his, you know, you can say, uh, quintessential, you know, t talents and um, uh, brilliant sort of uh, strategic ability, is able to mobilize what is left of the French army outside of Spain very effectively to meet the Austrian armies as they invade Bavaria once more. Nevertheless, a few months later, after several minor victories against the Austrians, Napoleon and Jean Lan meet um, their defeat at the Battle of Aspern Essling. Um, does anyone want to go over Aspern Essling? Well, Aspern was uh, a significant disaster for Napoleon. I mean, much like uh, Eilau, one of the problems Napoleon is facing is um, in these battles where um, it's either uh, more or less even or a not even necessarily decisive defeat, but a defeat. Um, you know, the casualty figures um, at Aspern are actually pretty close on both sides. But the problem is that the French can't afford to suffer the casualties um, over and over and over again when they're facing up against all of Europe. So, I mean, Aspirin's kind of funny considering the last battle we just talked about because Napoleon more or less ends up in the same position as the Russians did where he has um, his back to a river and most of his forces are not even um, across the river. Um, one thing the, um, the, the uh, Austrians actually do here is, you know, Napoleon builds um, pontoon bridges across the... Uh, the Danube as you do to cross them and of course as we've talked about this is a dangerous maneuver and the Austrians actually uh, employ this uh, cool strategy here where they, they basically send uh, big uh, structures junk basically to float down the river logs whatever and these things end up bumping into the bridges and destroy them which slows down uh, Napoleon and prevents him from actually getting his whole army across the river, which is a huge problem because um, I think he either has one or two cores here across the river, um, and the he's facing the entire Austrian army, uh, so he's massively outnumbered, and as you can see, he's entirely just bottled up here um, against the Danube with most of his forces completely out of position. So it's a pretty significant defeat. Um, you know, it's it's I wouldn't necessarily call it decisive in that uh, it certainly didn't finish off Napoleon as of course he basically came back to the same spot and defeated the Austrians at uh, Wagram but um, Aspern I, I suppose could be Aspern is one of those significant battles where uh, it really ground down the French army uh, much like Eilau. Um the French you know this isn't the Grand Armée of 1805 or even um, the French army of earlier you know they're they're losing their veterans and they're more and more relying on recruits uh, much of the army at this point is also in spain um you know this disaster here really occurs because uh napoleon as as talleyrand pointed out napoleon failed to establish any real allies at all um and that's really what caused this to happen because now he's being um, at a grand strategic level, he's being outflanked in the east by what should be uh, an ally, but <laughs> your ally doesn't build up an army against you for four years, right, um, and then attack you. Um, so, yeah, that's what I have to say on Aspern. Well, thank you, Charlemagne. I think, Mark, Marcus, I just want to ask, you know, sure. of course, Jean Lan um, dies during this battle. This um, is the end of the arc. Yes, it's the end of the arc. Do you want to uh, finish the arc for us? I don't know. I, I, I think you'd more poetically um, sum up Lan than I would. But I just wanted to say that just to buttress what Charlie was saying is that for, for anyone who's followed Napoleon's career, you'd know that as an artillerist himself and basically the, the man who conceptually in, in sort of a modern warfare context really harnessed the notion of firepower and with the, I suppose, along with the creation of the Grand Army, creates a grand armée rather creates a grand battery of, of artillery that he uses in battles that he uses it to devastating effect at many of the battles we've talked about 
However, this is the first time in contesting with the Austrians where, uh, where Napoleon has found himself at an artillery deficiency. In the Battle of, the battle of uh, Aspern Essling, uh, the Austrians fire 53,000 rounds compared to the 24, uh, 24,300 rounds fired by the French. And this is uh, somewhat of a, sh a shock to Napoleon. And it brings about, I think, the old adage that, um, and I, I think this might have been something that Napoleon said himself, that if you defeat an enemy too often, you teach them all your tricks. And it appears that the Austrians had done exactly that with the harnessing of artillery. It also didn't help as well that the the uh, the French are attempting to uh, cross from Labau Island and force a bridgehead, you know, into into Esling and to gain a foothold onto the opposite bank, which makes deployment and usage usage of artillery difficult. But it's still nonetheless an important thing to consider. Um, it, by all means, if you want to proceed about Marshal Lon. Oh no, just Lon. just just a, just a quick anecdote because of course, um, Lan again possibly with Bertie and Davout uh, was one of the most significant of all of Napoleon's marshals and um, again you talk about the emphasis on artillery well just before Lan was uh, hit by a ricochet of a cannonball um, right next to him uh, General Pouzet was decapitated by a cannonball and of course um, Lan was wounded by um, the ricochet of the cannibal hitting his legs. Um, whilst the French were engaged in this uh, retreat across pontoon bridges uh, to try and save the rest of the army, Lan, in the middle of the marshes, uh, was having his uh, leg amputated. He was carried over and he died in agony after eight days, after which Napoleon again tried to make him into, um, or again succeeded, didn't really have to make him into a grand sort of patriotic hero of the Napoleonic Empire, um, giving him a f full sort of funeral, uh, burying him in a, a Les Envilides, and then ultimately the Pantheon as a hero of the empire. Um, and here I think, you know, Land's death is really symbolic of what both of you have been talking about, which is the decline in the quality of the Grand Armée, such as it is, the transition from an elite of course there is still an elite corps there are still the old guard there are still the old regiments most of the marshals are still alive nevertheless land's death is emblematic of the declining stock of the french army and if anything the inability of you know effective commanders after land to actually properly oppose napoleon and of course him getting rid of talleyrand is emblematic of this the fact that napoleon is not allowing any real disputation within his camp. I mean, on the one hand, yes, he will claim that um, a undivided command is essential to win wars, but not when the commander is going slightly insane, <laughs> as in the case with Napoleon. Um, and I think, of course, he is able to remedy the situation. Um, and he's able to win back um, the initiative against the Austrians after a six-week recuperation, very similar to Elau, which is why I wanted to bring up Elau, Friedland versus Aspan Essling and Wagram, because they are very similar. Um, and of course, it's interesting that the, the plains of uh, Wagram near Marchfeld are also where the, the foundation of the Habsburg monarchy was actually laid with the defeat of um, Ottokar of Bohemia by uh, Rudolf of Austria. And here we are uh, confirming the Austrian defeat. But even Wagram, from my, again, limited understanding of military history, is not an impressive battle. The French outnumber the Austrians. The French are on adv advantageous ground. And the French, again, simply bludgeon the Austrians into submission. It's a huge battle. You know, we start off at Marengo with 60,000 men, and we leave at Wagram with gosh, 300,000 men on both sides. The French have around 170,000 men. Um, the Austrians have around 130,000 men. And at the end of the day, as far as I can tell, it is simply a matter that the Austrians suffer marginally more casualties and lose the will to fight compared to the French, who suffer a horrific number of casualties. I think over the, uh, the two days of the battle, something like... 70,000 casualties or something horrific like that? Um, yeah, for both, the... Both oh, sorry, go, Charlie. Yeah, the, the, the French suffered uh, enormous casualties in both battles. Um, they suffered more in uh, Asper Nestling and fewer than the Austrians did at, at Wagram. And, you know, despite Wagram being the victory, as we've been harping on, the French simply can't take these uh, hits over and over again. And of course, Wagram is... The Austrians basically just decide to pull out of Wagram to keep their army intact. So although Napoleon chases the Austrians um, out at Wagram, 
he doesn't actually destroy their army uh, in detail as in some other battles. It's not a rout. Um, it's just a, it's an orderly retreat for the most part. And yet Vagram's not particularly impressive um, at any tactical level. Um, it is essentially just a slugging match. I, I suppose there is there is one interesting moment at Vagram that's particularly uh, bold of Napoleon, um, where he is uh, his forces are basically getting outflanked. Um, there's a village near Ospern. You can kind of see if you look at the, I guess, lower left or the if you look at the right part of uh, the Austrian army army in Vagram. They basically try to start taking um, uh, the territory behind the French and cut them off. Uh, from the Danube, and instead of deploying his reserves, um, which is what one might normally do in that situation, Napoleon actually orders a, um, a deployment of uh, one of the units in the battlefield to basically march across the battlefield and go deal with that problem so that he could save his reserve for a decisive attack, which um, does actually end up happening. He makes a decisive attack, but it is at huge cost. Um, so Bagram is is technically a victory for Napoleon, um, but uh, it does call at an enormous cost that can't really be sustained, especially given uh, what we know is coming in Russia. Isn't it um, rather poetic that the battle strategy is beginning to imitate the actual grand strategy of the empire, becoming less inspired, more dependent on simply having more men than the opposing force, and simply bludging them, bludging them over a, a long slogging match? Um, and again, this seems to be sort of, you could say the decline of Napoleon and Napoleon's sort of um, greatness as a general only begins to show back, in my opinion, when we reach 1813 and 1814, right before the abdication. But here at the height of Napoleon's power, um, it seems that Napoleon is losing his knack for tactical brilliance and is relying again on the huge number of men and, of course, the casualties that come with it. And, of course, as you mentioned, Charlemagne, these losses ultimately are unsustainable. And Napoleon is having to increasingly rely on making sure that the levies from France are getting younger and younger and younger, more and more conscripts. And when we see the um, the eventual the eventual invasion of 1812, um, which again is you can say the the worst possible extension of what we're talking about, which is Napoleon's casual betrayal of alliances, inability to make diplomacy, believing that force becomes essentially the solution for all problems, the fact that deceit over time becomes a less and less effective weapon against your enemies. All of this, in my mind, makes it inevitable that the 1812 campaign should, as we see with the lesser disasters of Ilau and the greater disaster of Aspen Essling, that as Talleyrand predicted, France under Napoleon is going to suffer greater and greater disasters as the necessity of the continental system kicks in and France needs to continue centralizing. For example, after this battle in 1809, what happens? Napoleon begins to, he annexes the papal, he annexes the papal states, he annexes Catalonia, he imprisons the Pope, he annexes Oldenburg, he annexes Hamburg, he annexes Lubeck, a Lubeck. I mean, he annexes Illyria, he annexes Croatia. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> there is no sort of, there's no trajectory. There's no sort of correlation. I mean, by annexing Illyria in particular, Napoleon is deliberately signaling his hostile intent against Austria. And by annexing Oldenburg, he's not only pissing off the Germans, but again, he's doing so to make up for the shortcomings in his own continental system. It's uh, just for the sake of the, the discussion, because um, we did, uh, hang on, did I mention? Did I mention the casu casualties of... Um, of uh, Aspern Essling, I think I did. Um, did yeah, just the, yes. So, so Vagram was uh, the the French managed to deploy just short of one hundred and seventy two thousand men, um, and somewhere in the order of six hundred guns. The Austrians one hundred thirty six thousand with uh, around four hundred guns, and the French losses were thirty five thousand and twenty one guns, versus the Austrian losses of thirty eight thousand eight hundred with twenty guns. And I just wish to reiterate a point that you, you, you've just been making that, and it's a pattern that I think becomes um, evident with, with the Battle of Eilau in East Prussia. And this, although although Napoleon does uh, exercise a, a, you know, some brilliant uh, strategy to end that war at, um, at, uh, at the battle, battles of Heilsberg and uh, Friedland, 
and Napoleon himself does lead some quite astonishing campaigns in the Peninsula War, although the strategy around the Peninsula War itself is flawed. There is this creeping tendency of complacency and of, of Napoleon just not having this tactical suppleness and imagination and this sort of, we, we spoke about this propensity for this kind of, uh, you know, you could call it like a rudimentary notion of Blitzkrieg or, or um, you know, this sort of caesarean sort of, knack for aggression and movement and and um and and uh you know tactical uh, aptitude and and this really does come to fruition obviously the next dream will probably hit borodino i assume which is probably the the utmost example of this where he just throws bodies into 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 battle and it's not using uh, you know, sophisticated tactics, the the quality of the Grand Army as it sustains casualties, as it loses officers, because let's face it, the backbone of an army is its officers. Uh, it, it is less capable of, of undertaking sophisticated maneuver and implementing uh, battle tactics in the same, with the same coherence and the same discipline. It's, it's, all these things are coming to the fore and Vagram along with Borodino are probably the two most, um, are uh, the two largest example and most obvious examples of this trend. Thank you, Marcus. Just one one point before I ask both Charlemagne and Panama for their final thoughts. Um, Palpatine <laughs> is mentioning in the chat that, um, of course, in the annexation of Oldenburg, it was a deliberate slight against the Romanov dynasty because, of course, the Tsar's older sister uh, was in Oldenburg. And, of course, this has been a part of the reason why the Russian, the Romanovs that actually gravitated towards Napoleon was gaining more territory for the German side of the Romanov dynasty. And, you know, he's following the exact same path of mistakes. He confiscates um, Spanish Bourbon territory in the Kingdom of Etruria and then invades Spain. He confiscates Romanov ally territory in Germany and then invades Russia. He's just alienating, insulting, and repeating the same mistakes over and over again. He meets with disaster in Spain and even worse disaster in Russia. But anyway, um, Charlemagne, Panama, thank you. You've been very patient. What are your final thoughts on the grand strategy of the Napoleonic Empire? Um, well, on one last thing on Wagner in particular, we shouldn't, of course, leave out uh, Marshal Davout's role once again in this battle um, in a flanking maneuver. Uh, Davu tends to play um, a pretty significant role in all of these major battles. Um, so uh, what's going on at Wagram is, uh, you know, uh, basically on the right flank. Uh, well, in the north, the, the Austrians are actually deployed uh, on this plateau. Um, um, and the town of or city of Wagram is uh, on top of that plateau. And it's kind of interesting to compare this to Austerlitz because, you um, the enemy force is sort of in a similar position, but instead of uh, some, you know, clever maneuver to get them out of position, um, he just has Davu um, attack them head on directly. And I think it's on the third day that he actually, Davu managed to actually turn the Austrian flank in the north. And of course, unlike at Austerlitz, Napoleon actually allows himself to be outflanked in this battle, which almost ends in a disaster. But as I pointed out, he managed to do a, a clever mid-combat redeployment in order to prevent that from happening. Um, but sort of these these mistakes he's making, and Wagram, Wagram's just a very uninspired battle. There's there's almost... It, he really just wins the battle because the French army is still, at this point, superior because the coalition forces have not managed to actually um, fully adapt to the modern style of warfare that Napoleon has deployed. And they haven't managed to actually operate as a coherent co coalition uh, as they managed to do at Leipzig, which, of course, we can get to at, at some other time. So in terms of grand strategy, um, you know, Napoleon's failure, failure isn't really at a military level. It's at a failure to actually build any real alliance. All of his uh, power in Europe is based purely on coercion. And to the extent that he... Uh, does uh, build alliances, it's, as we mentioned, all, all done in bad faith and deceitfully. Um, you know, the very idea that France has the uh, right to sort of deploy this continental system extending all the way to Russia to determine who's allowed to trade with Great Britain uh, short, sort of shows you where his mind is. I mean, the whole reason for the invasion of Russia uh, is that Russia is violating the continental system. The idea that, you know, France has the the right, really Napoleon has the right to determine who Russia is, is trading with is sort of showing you how uh, 
Napoleon sort of got uh, taken up by this this grand vision rather than any semblance of real strategy at a political level. Um, as a political strategist, um, he ultimately ended up being dismal because he he failed to actually perform. He failed to actually really. Um, do any politics, um, which requires you to actually create friends. And of course, at the end, um, he had no friends left whatsoever. Thank you, Charlemagne. Panama? Um, I'd have to agree pretty much with everything that Charles said. Um, I think in general, um, the Napoleonic strategy, I mean, Napoleon was an extremely able man. He was also an extremely fortuitous man. Um, but I think it comes down to this kind of eternal rule about trying to conquer Europe is that you, you get forced into this sort of strange situation where you have to keep expanding, but there is always a limit essentially. So you can, you can, you can take, you can only take so much before essentially it all begins to slip, um, and outside forces will prevail. Um, I, I think as well as as Charlie said that there are certainly battles, some victories, some losses where Napoleon, um, for, for whatever reason, just isn't on form. He isn't his usual sort of younger self, I suppose. Although tying it to his to his age is is inaccurate because he did also have his moments when he was older as well. But th there are just times like this when he, he's content to kind of slug it out i suppose and just doesn't seem to be there in the same, the same way that he's there at a battle like austerlitz for example um and i think that um we i know that we kind of said this is a separate thing and we haven't touched on it touched on it as such but i think that um every, everybody likes to make a big thing out of russia being napoleon's downfall i personally think it was spain um going into spain pulling the kind of coup in spain with all the with all the french troops kind of strung out all over the country i there are moments like that where no matter how much i read um and i have read a lot on it that i can't quite grasp what was going through his mind at the time or what his perception of the situation was or what his perception of his own of his own popularity or his own ability was um i i think that He's a very complicated character like that because there are times when it really seems like he's he's very self aware and aware of his own drawbacks and his own his own abilities, and at other times he just seems to completely get everything wrong. I I, I think essentially I could I could I could sum it up by saying as, as I did at the start that Napoleon was extremely capable and very lucky, but he was at the end of the day he he was only a man, you know. <laughs> well, I think um, so far just... I could take it. I mean, I mean, Talleyrand would agree with you, but there's, there's one point I, I want to mention in terms of, again, Napoleon's fundamental lack of vision. He couldn't find a way to defeat the British, and yet he wasn't prepared to actually negotiate with the British in a way that France wouldn't have that glorious victory to finally see the end of Perfidious Albion. And to my mind, the obvious way to defeat the British would have been to actually, as you know, everyone has been saying, to ingratiate the major continental powers in to the Napoleonic system. And, you know, at Tilsit, for example, it was mentioned that, you know, possibly the French alliance could see um, the French looking the other way as the Russians occupied the Straits. Well, as compensation for Austria having been so humiliated in Germany, Napoleon could have, say, for example, actively facilitated the Austrian conquest of a huge amount of the Balkans as compensation of becoming a great Balkan empire. At the same time, the actual Greek provinces and part of Bulgaria, Anatolia, the Caucasus, and even Persia could have been awarded to Russia. Having actual willing allies who have tangible benefits as a result of their, again, allegiance to Napoleon, Napoleon could have then put pressure on India in the same way with Portugal. Um, Spain was willing to join Napoleon against Portugal in return for a partition of Portugal. Instead, he betrayed Spain and decided to occupy it, believing it would be better administered by his brother. So 
Napoleon had plenty of opportunities post-1807 to actually create an equitable system for his European allies, which would have deprived Britain of the only way it could have possibly sustained the conflict, which is relying on major continental powers to break the land power of Napoleon, essentially using Britain as an auxiliary, which is ultimately what happened in the end. And Napoleon instead failed to do that and was simply focused on submission rather than collaboration in terms of defeating the British. And of course, it's been demonstrated with um, Paul's treatment of Britain, that there was enough Anglo, there was enough hostility towards Britain among all of these powers, with the exception possibly of Portugal, that Napoleon could have feasibly engineered a diplomatic revolution to isolate Britain diplomatically. And that diplomatic isolation would have been far more damaging to Britain than any economic blockade. I, I would agree with most of that. Um, yes, I if, I may, if I may just back up Panama or Buttress's point just on, on this issue, I kind of agree. Um, and not to not to go on a tangent, I just want to make one sort of historical comparison. It's like when people focus on something, but something else happens a, a distance from that event at, the, at a similar time, which is actually a more debilitating um setback and i kind of agree in that had napoleon well a not alienated what would otherwise have been a willing ally which spain was and because on the other end of the continent although it was sort of a satellite and a puppet state poland was an enthusiastic partner of france as well and let's even assume that well, and then let's just, just to clarify that, there is only one reason as to why Poland was an enthusiastic supporter of France. Because, um, well, yes, partly because of the Polish leadership and the, the affinity which, you know, the French soldiers had after the partitions of Poland. But France was the only guarantee that Poland had since all of mm. its neighbours were openly hostile to it. That's, Correct, yes. To my mind, the only reason as to why Poland mm. gravitated towards the French. It was simply the hostility towards Austria Russia of and course. Poland that kept it loyal and of course knowing that in the absence of French power it would lose its independence which of course it in, did. Indeed and the deluge was in living memory of, of Poles as well I mean the the, del, the, the didn't the final partition happen at the end of the um, 1700s anyway? The final partition happened one year before Napoleon's Italian campaign. Exactly so it was well within living memory for these people. Um, the point I was going to make from a military standpoint is that have instead of having this vast military resource and all these troops quite widely and thinly dispersed across the Iberian Peninsula, which in which over time they were sort of picked off between guerrillas, between Wellington's campaign through you know with his, with his Portuguese allies and later Spanish rebels joining the cause and uh, and wearing down the the French army in Spain and, and essentially giving the British a route to invade France from the south. Um, there would otherwise have been sufficient reserves of the Grand Armée in Central Europe that even if Napoleon had suffered his Russian setback of 1812, there would have been sufficient resources to have probably stemmed a Russian invasion. Absolutely, which, but just, just sorry, which Marcus, did not I, exist. I just need to emphasise one point and bring it Poland. Well, of course, what does Poland represent? Again, Napoleon created one ally, and in so doing, he established a sword wielded against three potential allies: Prussia. Russia and Austria, because Poland had gains on all of them. So he gained one small ally and alienated three. <laughs> this is what I mean yes. by, the, the, again, the completely sort of uh, self-destructive yes. uh, policies of Napoleon. Uh, although, because, I you know, I, although I dare say, in comparison to the Russians and possi possibly to a lesser, lesser extent, the, uh, the, the Austrians, the Prussians were very much allies in name only. The Prussians sooner or later would have attempted to have wriggled from under Napoleon's boot, given this state of the Treaty of Tilsit. The Prussians would not have suffered that for long. But again, in my but, mind. But look at Poland. You know, why did Napoleon opt for a Polish alliance mm. compared to all of the others? Because I'm sorry, but the Prussian, the Austrian, and the Russian mm. alliance, as we've all talked, are just a phantom alliance kept in place yes. by Napoleon's repeated victories. The reason right. why Napoleon favored the Polish alliance is because the Polish was settled for being a client when the other mm -hmm. states weren't. And again, yes. that should again demonstrate the limitations of Napoleon's strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. He could only yeah, deal totally. with clients, he couldn't collaborate with allies. Anyway, on that note, I really need to get mm. to the Super Chats, if that's if that's all right. But thank you, everyone, for your contributions. May, may, may I make just one last point? I did, did actually overlook one small thing. I'll literally take two minutes. 
Yeah, if, if not, yeah. let's say, yeah. is that uh, we mentioned um, Alstedt and uh, and Yena before, and, and something that well, I'm reminded from something in the chat. So thank you. And yes, uh, Bernadotte, it's it's hard to know whether he ignored the order or did march to the guns or left Deval on his own, but he was very close to being court martialed. And whether again, it's one of these instances of Napoleon. Um, uh, you know, being something of a taskmaster or being a bit arrogant, I don't know. But yes, f for the person who mentioned the chat, yes, indeed, we did overlook that. We forgot to mention it, but yes, uh, Deval's performance was exceptional despite the fact that Bernadotte left him isolated. Very good point. Super chats. Absolutely. Okay, there was a, a, a super chat from the previous episode, but I'll read it anyway from Mombasa Timmy. There seemed to be a flurry of super chats coming right at the end after I actually left. Um, for 350 New Zealand dollars, thank you very much, Mombasa Timmy. Uh, could the directory have avoided dictatorship? No. The directory was hopelessly divided, and even the directors supported Napoleon. It should be mentioned. Two of them actively supported Napoleon, and one basically stood aside and did nothing. So the directory was like, yes, okay. Okay, that's become a dictatorship. Um, Pelinor White Strake for four pounds and forty nine pence. Thank you very much. All the best, AM. Too busy with the baby to be here, and despite Bonaparte's horrible liberal faults, vive l'empereur. Yes, I always find that funny whenever, for example, watching um, uh, any sort of Napoleonic adaptation, in particular the Battle of Waterloo, and constantly hearing over and over again, vive l'empereur, vive l'empereur. I don't know for some reason it always cracks me up. Um, it seems I don't know particularly ridiculous. I prefer vive le roi. Uh, John Gordon for uh, five dollars says nothing. Thank you very much. Um, enlightened despot for. 10 Canadian dollars. Imagine Napoleon retiring to grow da grow cab cabbages in Dalmatia. No, I can't somehow imagine that. Well, I mean, he, he, he had the equivalent when he was sent to Elba. Was it El yes, Elba. And of course, they made him the emperor of Elba. So he, from the minute he arrived, kind of started reforming uh, the political system and the land and he, 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 he couldn't he, really help himself. Commission buildings, a theater. Yeah, it's, yes. it's, 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 it's like when you give a dad a uh, model railway or something, you know, yeah. they've got, got to play with it. They dial it up to 11, you know, just. <laughs> also, I know we don't really have time for this, but AM, something that's always puzzled me is why did the Allies, when they had Napoleon essentially open to, to any terms, did they make him emperor of a small island? Like the, it, it, it seems like a very strange fate for a man who just a few years earlier was wreaking havoc across Europe. Because yeah. he had been technically accepted and recognized by the European powers as a monarch, as a head of state. His okay. removal of power was a necessity due to his open and consistent hostility towards everyone around him. However, he had been technically recognized as an emperor by the Pope, and he had also married into the Habsburg family as well. So, so they it was about the precedent of killing emperors. Um... No, they weren't going to do what Napoleon did. So um, they gave a crumb to Napoleon in giving him the imperial title, but over an insulting possession like Elba, yeah, which so again yeah, was strategically it was part of the French Empire empire technically before and it was close enough also to corsica but it wasn't part of france where louis the 16th would actually louis the 18th would actually have to give napoleon territory so it was you know seen as equitable by everyone involved i mean it is it, it is quite incredible that after all that he still gets away with having basically an entire privately ruled island you know to retire in, in well even in, before in that like um, even before that when the coalition was clearly going to defeat Napoleon once and for all, they offered him the opportunity to um, rule France and just have France return to its original borders. And he refused well, better that. Than that. Better than that, Charlemagne. Um, in late 2013, after Leipzig, Metternich was able to convince the powers to award Napoleon with the enlarged boundaries of 1802. So France would have been left Belgium and the left bank of the Rhine. And I think all of us can understand that if France actually held on to those territories into the 19th century, France would have been in a far better state to deal with the nascent threat of Prussia and Germany. If anything, I can't see a solution where Germany would have actually unified with France holding those territories and all of the, uh, the coal and industrial resources that come, for example, with the occupation of Belgium. So no, Napoleon was given that option in 2013 to remain emperor of an enlarged France, and instead he wanted everything and lost everything. The other thing to consider with Elba is 
the fact that it still has a relatively dangerously close proximity to France, I mean, if they're going to give him a nice sunny island in the Mediterranean, you think the Ionian Islands, you know, like Zakynthos or Corfu might have been better? At least if he jumped on a boat, well, someone I would mean, have heard about it, it leading up to it, leading up to the event. It has to be within their actual ability to do it. Um, they 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 didn't they didn't have sort of all the territory in the world to choose from. I don't, I don't know if perhaps they did possess well, the Ionian Islands, though. Yes, they did possess the Ionian Islands, but no, Napoleon, they would have never given Napoleon the Ionian <laughs> Islands because Britain wanted them uh, to cement its control in the Mediterranean. But oh, there's the, the, there is there is a dynastic reason as to why they chose Elba, because when Carlo Bonaparte became Charles Bonaparte and was accepted as a noble in the French system, his title was Noble Patrician of Tuscany. So they believed that giving oh, course, Napoleon yes. Elba, which was part of Tuscany, would be some actual dynastic claim, which he actually was owed, <laughs> as opposed to France. So yes, it, was, yes, it, 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 it was a serious dynastic consideration and a joke mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh -huh. okay. Anyway, that makes sense. Sorry. I didn't know about that, but there you go. That makes sense now. Uh, Machiavelli sucks to go for five dollars. Uh, the weasel Rothschilds in England lied and said Napoleon won't uh, want to buy uh, things cheap. Um, sorry, I can't quite understand that. The weasel. This is, the, this, this is a reference to um, the, uh, Baron Rothschild um, received news before basically anybody else did that Napoleon had been defeated at Waterloo. And what he immediately did was he sent out news that Wellington had been utterly vanquished. And what this did was cause an, an enormous uh, panic and confusion because there were now mass selling of the stock so, exchanges. So it completely crashed, the, in, in particular, the British stock exchange and the yeah. British trade markets basically went into a complete collapse based on this information, which allowed Rothschild to make certain advantageous gains. Um, wow. based on the back of this false crash. Um, yes. He, he was able to snap up several of his rivals and several things he wanted. And also, of course, when some, when the whole when the whole thing comes comes crashing down like that, he was able to basically maintain a little sort of an, an, an island of, 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 of stability within his own uh, within his own holdings. Um, mm. And uh, essentially, yes, he, he created uh, an, an, an artificial crash off the back of the news of uh, Napoleon's mm. uh, loss, essentially. Because wow. he had riders that were that were spectating what the Battle of Waterloo, and it said that they rode just roughshod um, to the coast and brought the news to him before official word made way to well, him. Well, maybe they were actually relaying Napoleon's own dispatches, which already claimed that he won the battle. <laughs> anyway, th thank you for that, um, Panama. I didn't know that. Um, the Enlightened Despot for 10 Canadian dollars. <laughs> interesting, re interesting revisionist book called The Wars Against Napoleon. Whatever you think of the thesis, no question British bucks sustained the multiple co multiple coalitions and eventually crushed the Napoleonic experiment. Well, I don't exactly believe that. Of course, in terms of the actual viability of the coalitions, yes. But I think Napoleon's repeated mistakes and the po and the hatred, um, which uh, it, the constant land grabs incited against Napoleon was more than enough to incite an eventual overthrow of the Napoleonic system, even if it was more sporadic and was less organized as a fully funded British backed coalition would have been. I think it would have been more popular. And for example, a genuine patriotic uprising in Germany, as almost what happened in 2013, combined with the Battle of Nations. Um, so I don't think it's simply a matter of uh, British money. I do believe that Napoleon made horrific errors in judgment, as we've been detailing. Um, Judge Caligula Bushman for five euros. Uh, congrats finishing this momentous series. Haven't quite finished yet. Uh, now, according to the panel, was Bonaparte a revolutionary, liberal, reactionary, former or conservative? Uh, he was a liberal pretending to be a Carolingian LARPer is what he was. Um, he didn't believe any of this. <laughs> uh, the only thing he sort of believed in was his own um, precedent, his own sort of mission, his own star. And it was the idea of providence and Napoleon more than any pretense of allusion to the enlightenment or um, to popular sovereignty or to divine right of kings that, that sustained Napoleonic ambition. And he, of course, almost primitively believed in the idea that through 
might makes right. I have won the argument through my strategic brilliance and my brains, and I continue to win. Therefore, providence has set me above ordinary men. Um, as And of course, he was a liberal in terms that he was facilitating the ideas of the Enlightenment. I mean, people don't seem to understand how fundamentally revolutionary uh, his judicial reforms were, and the liberalization of many sort of European customs through the exportation of the Napoleonic Code and the impos imposition of a uniform Napoleonic Code. Um, and, and again, he would again claim that this had some precedent with the Roman law of Justinian, but again, no, it was fundamentally revolutionary in its character. That and the fact that he couldn't seriously abide by a serious, a serious government which is ruled by dynasty or fiefdoms or feudalism than any way that would characterize being a reactionary. Rather, he positioned his brothers there for his uh, relatives there for strategic utility and when they failed him he would continue this process of centralizing and centralizing and centralizing france expanding the managerial state and this vast bureaucracy under him personally uh, following his direct orders by essentially written fiat so no a liberal autocrat who fancied himself an enlightened despot lastly lastly just to, to, to buttress that point to the extent where revolutionary france in fact reorganizes and adopts a new calendar adopts a new notion of seasons, um, has its own array of months and reorders that, you know, the, the essentially days and weeks and, and what constitutes fairness, the calendar in, in year. In fairness, Napoleon did undo the revolutionary calendar in 1806. He did. But what I'm, what, the point I was trying to make was that, he, you know, Napoleon is, a, is on top atop this vehicle and exists in the context of this time. And not many people know about the revolutionary calendar. So I just wanted to add that because it, it's a completely fundamental reordering of 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 how humans exist in the, in in time as well. Like the revolution was that comprehensive. It, that can't be underestimated. Well, just to emphasize, the reason he got rid of the revolutionary calendar wasn't because he was ideologically opposed to it because Napoleon was a formal Jacobin. It simply didn't work. Um, yes, the, quite. The, the decade and the attempt to create a 10 day week simply didn't work. And people were still celebrating mass on Sunday anyway. So it simply <laughs> yeah. made sense yeah. to go back to the old calendar yeah. because people weren't observing apart it was from pragmatic, right? die hard revolutionaries. This is again, uh, what does Carlyle mm -hmm. refer to? The, Napoleon is a man of semblance, not of substance. Anyway, <laughs> um, enlightened despot for 20 Canadian dollars. Thank you. Uh, why is so much success in 1796 to 1800? The quality of men of the line and leaders still lean and mean. Napoleon erred in dispersing forces too early, but saved by Desai, who marched to the sound of the guns versus Grouchy. Well, obviously that's a Waterloo reference. Well, there wasn't so much. I mean, everyone seems to under fail to understand that there had already been a huge amount of success from the revolutionary armies in before 1796. Uh, with uh, Desmarais and Jourdan and Moreau and uh, Lazare Carnot, the French had been able to achieve what Louis XIV and Louis XV had failed to achieve, which was the expansion of France up until the Rhine. Napoleon, um, Louis XIV was the first person to seriously attempt this. Uh, he achieved it in Strasbourg. He failed to reach Cologne. Um, he failed to annex the uh, the Austrian Netherlands, but the French were able to achieve it before Napoleon even arrived. Napoleon's success lies in the fact that he was able to take a dismal front as a diversionary attack, attack in the War of the First Coalition and turn it into a main field of war where no one was anticipating this. And of course, Napoleon was supported by great men such as uh, Lan and Bertier. Um, um, but again, that's not to say that France had a monopoly on talent either, as will be seen, especially by um, 1813. Sadly, this isn't for this discussion. Prussia, Russia, and Austria all had great generals. Austria had uh, the Archduke Charles. Uh, Prussia had Clausewitz, and uh, Russia had uh, Bagration. So um, no, it's not simply a man that all of the quality men clustered around that time. Indeed, the revolution had killed off a great number of quality men in 1793 and 1794. Anyway, um, the madness. Sorry, I'm answering these as speedily as I can. Uh, the mad mercenary for five Australian dollars. Napoleon would not have been as successful without Bertier. For all the skills, there was also discipline, staff work, and logistics that set up a victory. Absolutely. And I think we've covered I that think we point. I agree with that. Also, yeah. hello, Mad Merck. Hello, Mad Merck. 
Uh, Travis uh, Wiener for $20. Thank you very much. Uh, what are the real politic mistakes that the Bonapartists made? Interesting in comparing these mistakes to today, the gay being the coalition crushing all parts of threatening strongman leadership. I know this is not your perspective. Well, I fundamentally agree with you. In fact, I was thinking about um, writing a possible article and comparing the Napoleonic uh, continental system to NATO strategy in dealing with Russia, because I believe there are a lot of interesting parallels. But like I said, Napoleon's fundamental mistake lay in the fact that he was unable to make willing clients or willing allies who went along with his campaign. Rather, he made more and more enemies and he was prepared to betray his allies for increasingly nebulous and ridiculous reasons, which ended up being self-defeating. Perhaps the only ally who was actually, you know, willing to join and had some effective clout was Bavaria and perhaps Saxony, though Saxony would be destroyed in the 1813 campaign and Bavaria would willingly switch sides and oppose Napoleon in 1813. The only effective client that Napoleon was able to really establish was Northern Italy. But again, Northern Italy had been under sort of Habsburg rule for, for a large amount of time. So people were pretty much ambivalent to whether it was French domination or Habsburg domination at the same time. And of course, we talked about this idea that Napoleon's focus wasn't in France. It was in Northern Italy, Western France, Belgium and uh, Southern Germany at the same time. So that's where the Napoleonic system was strongest. Um, and that's where Napoleon could rely on support. But beyond that periphery, even within France, such as in Aquitaine, Bordeaux, the Vendée, Toulouse, uh, the Poland system was very weak. Uh, history of fuel. Oh, yes, I remember. Sorry, you sent a super chat for two dollars, but um, didn't send a question. Uh, at the time, north of the Po, but south of the Alps, were there more German or more Italian speakers? Well, in terms of the Tyrol region, I assume as a whole, which is what you're referring to, um, the Tyrol, the north and the south, roughly, I mean, it's difficult to say because I don't have the exact population figures. North Tyrol is entirely German speaking, whereas South Tyrol is around 60% Italian, 40% German. Um, and of course, it caused a huge amount of controversy after the First World War, when the entirety of South Tyrol was awarded to Italy with a large number of Germans. And this, of course, became a moderate sticking issue between uh, the National Socialists and the Italian fascists. Uh, not so much for Hitler, but definitely for his entourage. Right. Let's try and get back. Uh, just at, just for for because he said north of the Po. Um, so I think it's better to say that between the Po and the Alps is almost exclusively Italian, and then just north of the Alps is a blend of Italian and German. Then when you get to uh, the northern part of Ty Tyrol, it becomes predominantly German. Is probably the easiest way to explain that. Fair enough. Sorry, I was I was just assuming that his super chat was referencing the Tyrol. Um, Faith Knight for fifty dollars. Well, thank you very much, Faith Knight. That's very generous of you. Uh, wanted to view the stream live, but had other obligations this evening. You've assembled an all-star cast, and I can't wait to watch the stream in its entirety. Well, thank you very much, Faith Knight. It's very much yes, appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, Polish ambassador for 25 Zloty. Would it be fair to say that Napoleon's right to rule was similar to that of Stalin? Revolutionaries elected them or were elected by them to get purged. Well, Stalin was ruling under a communist system and he technically sort of wielded power de facto rather than officially like Napoleon. Napoleon established a personal system of rule, whereas Stalin never assumed the direct powers. I mean, there was a possibility during World War II that Napoleon, uh, that Stalin would have been given the title of Generalissimo, uh, essentially ahead of that of a uh, Marshal of the Soviet Union, but he never actually accepted that title, even though it was created for him. And he yes. remained um, General Secretary of the Soviet Union and then Chairman of the Council of Ministers. He was often not even the head of government, let alone head of state of the Soviet Union. So he always operated within the veneer of a communist system dominated by um, uh, democratic centralism is the principle by which you have a central committee which makes all decisions. Once the decision is made, all party members agree with it. But of course, when Stalin dominated the committee, it didn't really matter if he held the technical position of head of state or head of government or not, uh, because he'd already purged all opposition as the radical centrist he claimed to be. <laughs> um, so no, Napoleon wielded personal power. Um, Stalin wielded de facto power. Um, John it's Gordon... Also, uh... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but there's there's quite a lot of interesting writing about comparing the French and Russian revolutions. Um, and um, there's a, I think it was in a piece by um, the late uh, 
controversial figure, uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, who who believes that essentially the main reason for Trotsky's uh, exile uh, outside of him losing the personal contest with Stalin was that the there was a great fear of Bonapartism after the yes. revolution, and yes. everybody everybody looked at Trotsky as the as the number one, uh, basically this sort of Napoleonic type who would come and kind of take take over the revolution uh, for his own ends. And of course, he was he was also the one that wanted to expand into Europe um, and th throughout the world as well. He he was the he was the sort of top man for the the, the expansionist uh, world revolution um, faction. Um, so I think that's that's why essentially. John Gordon for twenty dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, did France ever face any worker labor shortages from their conscription, uh, mixed with mass casualties? Uh, how was France's agricultural sector during this period? Were there any vet innovations to keep up their army's demand? I'm afraid, John Gordon, in terms of a comprehensive assessment of that, um, economic history really isn't my forte, I'm afraid. However, I do know that mass conscription did get more extreme. So, for example, it started off with being um, all 18-year-olds must serve. Then Napoleon increased. Essentially, you have the system of annual lists where every year once you know a, a certain group of uh, french uh, youth had reached a certain age uh, they would be incorporated into the levy en masse and in order to keep providing levies for the french army and napoleon simply requisitioned the supply of the next year's conscripts and then the next year's conscripts yeah. so de facto the conscripts kept getting younger and younger and younger but i mean it doesn't even matter i mean obviously the the conscription did cause a um uh, hunger in france in uh, 1813 and um 1814 but combine that with the fact that france isn't receiving you know any sort of real impulse from from britain britain is the british blockade is doing far more damage than the french continental system ever did i mean if anything Thing. It's probably best, I think, Marcus, to compare the continental system with um, the U-boat campaign versus the British blockade in the First World War. Um, one was, Interesting take. One was much more effective than the mm. other. Nevertheless, mm. uh, the U-boat campaign was supposed to have this... Uh, was supposed to win the war by uh, starving Britain out. And of course, in reality, the Germans were starving while the British comparatively were rather well off. I think maybe that's an mm. interesting comparison to make. I um, I, I have some answer. Um, this is not particularly in depth because I've, I've, I've only s skimmed the topic, but to, to my understanding, the effect of the wars and the conscription on France tended to be depending on the region um, because basically the effects of the war and the... Um, the way in which bureaucracy and conscription panned out meant that some areas were hit harder than others. Like, for example, areas that had seen great fighting during the revolution, such as the Vendée um, or wherever the Chouannerie took place, um, tended be because because the 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 original uprisings, particularly in the Vendée. I believe were actually triggered over con over conscription into the revolutionary army, um, and uh, there was there was generally a slightly less, um, shall we say, harshly enforced conscription policy in such an area, which was already dealing with issues because of the infernal columns and the the, the, the destruction of of the of the of the revolution. Um, so, the effect of on agriculture and such wasn't quite as bad. As we would see with with future wars, um, just because the although the conscription was unprecedented for its time, I believe um, it wasn't it wasn't quite that severe that it caused. Uh, I, I don't believe it caused any kind of any kind of really hard uh, famines or or things like that. Or I, I I think that that there were always ways to try and balance the labor shortage um and of course you have to look at the time frame as well it wasn't the the levé en masse and the really huge grand armées were were not were not in were not active for the entire period um they were only active at certain times and the the the, the conscription uh napoleon had plans for extreme conscription after he lost in russia and was being pushed hard by the Allies, but that never really materialised. 
I mean, um, at one point, it, it looked as if the French in 1793, 20 years before, could have organized 800,000 men, but this was a paper army. In yes, reality, exactly. the French could never really organize more than about 400,000 men. And yes, often they would exactly. only use 200,000 men effectively. Yes. Um, and and al al also, of course, because just because you can you can conscript 200,000 men doesn't mean you can clothe them. It doesn't mean you can feed them. It doesn't mean you can give them weapons. Um, there was always other constraints. So theoretically, even if one year you had a reserve of 500,000 men, the reality is most of those men are ne never going to see um, service. An army, can, an army can only be an army if it can be trained and outfitted, led and fed and equipped. Yes. Well, again, a huge, a huge factor of the levy on mass is that it wasn't intended just as a mass conscription. It was, it was essentially an army devoted to the cause of the war. So it wasn't all for, you know, lining up and becoming soldiers. The levy on mass was a conscription into war industries as well, um, which should also help to answer your question. So if anything, it was about centralizing the means of production and creating a war industry, as well as creating a vast army that could deal with what was then the entirety of Europe bearing down on France in 1793 but to um, but to address that but to address chat someone just said yes maybe we can have a chat to uncle radlib maybe it'd be an interesting conversation at an interesting crossover we could do one day because economics is his sphere i mean it's just interesting just building on what panama said about the show annery well of course you know as i've already already alluded to napoleon's strength was in northern france belgium northern Italy, southern Germany. It wasn't in the former region of Aquitaine and the Vendée. Effectively, everything south of the Loire was almost like the wild west of the Napoleonic Empire. Yeah. And of course, he tried to incorporate Catalonia as well. And of course, that went incredibly badly and was fiercely resisted, as of course, with all of the decisions Napoleon made in Spain. So yes, I mean, you can look at somewhere like Württemberg, or Bavaria, or Northern Italy, Milan, and they were far more enthusiastic and willing to provide levees compared to areas of France itself. So it's a mixed picture depending on what region you're looking at and how um, effective the central government was and the Napoleonic system of prefects were in terms of overseeing the individual departments. Because the departments created the illusion that France had a uniform centralized system of administration when reality was barely in place by the time of um, uh, the Napoleonic era. Anyway, um, Polish ambassador for 25 Slotty. I mean, it's the issue with the revolutions, no precedent or precedent. You never know if an act is still an innovative progress or a cross-dressing purge. Um, <laughs> yes, I suppose, and that's how I would summarize the, uh, the code Napoleon. Um, it very much violated the idea of the ancient liberty or, you know, since hallowed antiquity, we have hold these truths to be self-evident. It was very much, no, I, Napoleon and Cambaceres sitting around at a table deciding the entire legal system for the continent <laughs> based on their own volition and ideas. And those ideas that have been cooped up by the Jacobins um, in the the height of the Great Purge that were often incorporated by Napoleon without any revision, um, especially regarding divorce and primogeniture. Um, Polish ambassador, again, for 10 Zloty, thank you. Uh, we need to deserve an episode on the Battle of um, uh, Samo Sierra. Uh, yes, and that'll have to wait for a future Peninsula War stream, which may or may not happen. Uh, but thank you, Polish ambassador. Uh, Romeo, hate, Romeo hates shrimp for $5, thank you. Um, when they say Macron is Napoleon-like, they mean it in the sense that he marries a mistress that can't give him children. <laughs> well, in fairness, I think um, uh, Mrs. Macron is a bit older than uh, Josephine was when uh, Napoleon met her. I think, Certainly. is she, what, 25 years, 30 years older than him? Something ridiculous like that. Yes. Um, also, of course, Napoleon did have children, whereas I don't think Macron has any. Uh... No, and, and I mean, Josephine, in fairness to Josephine, um, she wasn't so old that she couldn't bear Napoleon children. It's more or less assumed that uh, she had essentially had a, you know, a major sort of constitutional failing when she was imprisoned for a year by the revolutionaries um, and she was actually very frail and ill so much so that she couldn't actually physically bear children after her imprisonment in fairness to Josephine it wasn't that she was too old I mean how old was she when she met Napoleon 36 um, so conceivably they could have had children indeed she did have children uh, Eugene and uh, Hortense Napoleon the second of course or that was the what was that by 
Napoleon the Second was by Mary Louise. By Mary Austria. Louise, yeah, okay. I was wondering with that. Right, that's it for the super chats. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone have anything to say before we leave, Marcus? Other than to say that I've quite enjoyed this. Um, Napoleon is an intriguing character, and a bit like Panama, I too went through a through a teenage phase of uh, uh, you know rather looking up to Napoleon and Mario. He's still an interesting man, nonetheless, and his military exploits are quite wondrous character, and a fascinating character, certainly. But as I think you become more of an adult and you grow up, you start to appreciate more and more Napoleon's failings. And in some ways, you can admire the brilliance, but you also uh, consider his 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 human failings and the fact that he did oversee a great deal of uh, death and suffering, often needlessly, as a foreboding of what ought to be avoided. Um, but still a, a fascinating time period nonetheless, and I'm glad that we're here. So, yes, yeah, so I guess hopefully there's more to come. I guess we'll see. But thank you, AM. A pleasure as always. And this has been a cracking panel. I've really, um, really enjoyed having the five of us on tonight. It's been magnificent. So thank you, Charlie and Panama, for joining us as well. Thank you very much, Marcus. Nothing to show? Nothing to show. Charlie, me? Yes, it was fun to uh, nerd out about some uh, battles. It's always fun to talk about battles especially Napoleonic era. Um, yeah, I think there's very little to admire uh, in Napoleon other than his brilliance as a military commander. Um, I agree with the conception earlier that he's a Jacobin monarch, um, as contradictory as that sounds. And uh, yeah, it was fun. So subscribe to my substack, charlemagne.substack.com. And uh, that's all I've got for now. Thank you very much, Charlemagne. And Panama Hat. Um, yes, I g g greatly enjoyed this. I'm all for uh, these sorts of history streams, especially ones that run to this length. Um, I'm always in favor of, 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 uh, of, of longer streams. Um, Napoleon is just a fascinating topic, no matter which which way you, you, you come at him. And uh, I look forward to any of those potential streams on uh, on, on, on the Peninsula War. Um, that would be that would be fun. Well, um, fantastic. I, I can't really shit it because we we aren't we haven't even got got a sort of date fixed yet or planned, but Turnip and I um, would like to do a series on the Spanish Civil War, but one that actually starts uh, with the Bourbon Restoration in I believe seventy eight or seventy nine, um, when uh, is it Alfonso the Twelfth comes to the throne. Um, I, I believe so. After the First Republic, I think. Yes, you, it's. Yes. I'm going to be very nerdy about this. It's Alfonso yes, the Twelfth in 1874. 1874. Sorry. Yes. Uh, and I, I believe this. Sorry, this is completely off topic. But you, you also dispute Alfonso the Thirteenth being called Alfonso the Thirteenth, don't you? Uh, I, I think I vaguely dispute him based on the fact that by the, the legitimist conception of uh, the Carlist <laughs> conception of monarchy, Alfonso the Twelfth was never really king. So Alfonso the Thirteenth would have eventually yeah. inherited as Alfonso the Twelfth in the nineteen thirties. But that's me being uh, a bit of a legitimist autist there. So yes. don't worry but, about uh, that. But it's essentially, yes, we want to do a, uh, a series of streams l leading up to the Spanish Civil War to actually give it the proper depth and explanation that I think it needs as an important historical event to people like us. Um, and and where where we stand in the in the world, so streams on the Peninsula War would actually be very helpful because they would give even more context as to why Spain uh, en ended up like it did um, in that period. Um, so yes, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely, and I look forward to that when it happens. Um, as for what what's next on this channel, next week there will be another stream. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how ambitious I'm going to be, but I would like to incorporate Leipzig, um, the Battle of All Nations in some part, and talk about the Prussian reforms and the Metternichian system. So I'll try and synthesize something. There'll be a lecture out next, this Friday, on the undoing of the French Revolution and the creation of the Concert of Europe system and how that actually quickly unravels from 1812 until 1822. And that'll be the last episode of Nations of Charlemagne. So do everyone tune in for that. Otherwise, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you everyone who sent a super chat. And thank you to my wonderful guests who made the stream possible. And of course, Columba, who made it for most of the stream but of course he has to undergo his uh, strange sort of uh, change after midnight we'll find out later what that he's, is he's, he's sure. scottish metamorphosis yes. <laughs> yeah. 
anyway, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Good night. Au revoir. Au revoir.